Welcome everyone to day one at Salgerush, a small, small suburb of Porto. In this save, we're starting from the very bottom and trying to get to the very top. Right, I have done a video previously on the backstory of this save. It's just there, so take a look at that. But the goals of the save, in a heartbeat, is this. So we're starting low, low in the Portuguese leagues. We're going to rise through the leagues. We are going to sell players when clauses are hit, like Enzo Fernandes got sold to Chelsea. Think of that sort of vibe. We're going to replace these players with youth team players or scouted players, and these scouted players will have a big influence on South America. We're going to have a good look around there. The long-term goal is to become bigger than local rivals. Porto and the big goal, the possibly unachievable goal, is to have a net transfer profit of £1 billion by the end of the save. Now that's going to be tough and it'll take a few years. So this is SC Salgueros and this is day one on the job. So this first episode is all about day one at the job, at your club as well, so you can play along with whatever you're doing. So what do we do? Where do we go? How do we negotiate all this? So first things first, let's see what's expected of us. So if we go to the league table, so this level of Portugal is split into four leagues, 14 teams in each, very, very tough. Now we're expected, if we go to season preview, to be in the upper echelons. There's eighth place, so you think eighth out of all those teams competing. We are one of the better teams. Now the first win is our finance situation. We are actually in profit, 139,000. But if we take a look over at the transfer budgets, we're actually spending too much on wages already. That could lead to trouble. Next up, I have a look at my staffing. Now we can see I've got seven in the coaching staff, which is pretty good. I've actually got too many coaches, but hopefully the board will not recognize that and we can just slyly go on. No set piece coach, which could be a problem. We need to get ourselves some analysts. If you look at the team comparison and coaching for the league, we're actually not bad. We're the highest in a couple of areas there, so I'm pretty happy with that. Recruitment team, we're going to have to get ourselves a chief scout. It's going to be super important, but at this level, not as much, although we are the best in our little area. Medical team, it's a shambles. We need to bulk that up. Now it's time for the probably the most important thing is to assess our squad. Now it's a good size. I'm not going to go through all the players, but what I will show you is what I do on day one, especially at this level. It's all about attributes and what type of player I'm going to get. And this is how I go about it. Okay, so if I'm taking charge of the team, the first thing I'm going to look at is attribute levels for key attributes. And if I'm in the top division, so you'll think of your Premier League or in this case in Portugal, Liga Nos, I want my key attributes on my key players to be somewhere between 16 and 20. One level below that, I'm looking between areas of 13 to 15. Down again, this time I'm going to be a bit more realistic. I'm looking for key attributes in the 11 to 14 range. Now to the fourth tier. It drops again, 10 to 13. That's what we're looking for here. And the final one would be non-league teams are lower down. So fifth level downwards, lower league. Attribute levels of nine plus is a bit of a bonus at this level because they're pretty poor. So for us in our journey, our tier, we're going to look for that fourth level of 10 to 13 for the key attribute ranges for our squad. Now, when it comes to the squad, I will add that I'm not going to make any transfers for the first season for two reasons. The first reason is I want to keep it realistic and give the boys at the club a chance. We are at a lower level and they seem like they're a good team. Predictions are high, so let's stick with them. But because we're playing the real world format of the game, we have transfers pending coming in. If you look down here, I've got a good set of players here, maybe up to 10, 11 players on their way in in a month or so's time. So they're going to be my transfers. I'm not going to make any. But I will say, if you're doing a save from day one, it's up to you what you do, whether you bring players in or out. But when I'm doing a lower level team and rising to the top, I like to take the first season, unless I've got no players, then I'll bring someone in. But if it's the first season, I like to stick with the squad. And then by January, see if we need to bring anybody in. So now knowing we're working in that 10 to 13 range for our key attributes, for our key players and positions, I now can't assess my squad and we'll probably do it using the filters. I like to work back to front, specifically from defenders upwards. Now if we look at the centre backs, I don't actually have a lot, but we'll start there. So using one of my custom views for centre backs, I've got all the key attributes for centre backs. And remember that 10 to 13 range. Now this is all the players selected, so we'll take all the players that don't count out of the equation by going over to filter, dropping that down, deselecting all positions and just selecting defenders. And you can see we don't have a lot of centre backs currently at the club. I say currently because don't forget, we do have players coming in and look by the looks of this, I've got five players, defenders coming in. Now at this level, I like to break that down even further to just three or four key attributes for the centre backs. And they are the following. Positioning, concentration and decisions. That's what I'm looking for for my centre-backs from this level. So hopefully getting those in that 10 to 13 range will hold us in good stead. So early signs here that Pex is obviously the standout centre-back and has a great name as well. 
Now, if you look at these attributes across the board, pretty consistent in that 10 to 13 range. Some of them even exceeding that, such as the marking and the strength, really good. But he's also lacking a little bit in some areas too. If you look at his concentration, it's on the borderline, isn't it? He's six foot four though, at this level, he looks a decent option. However, the backup to that, Correa here, definitely is not a centre back to me. Looks more like a full back, something like that. So hopefully the new players who come in will rise up. So I'm gonna do that technique for all positions. So think wing backs, central midfielders, strikers, the lot. I'll show you a couple now. I won't go through all of them, but we will get to some standout players that are gonna be vital for this first season. For example, I do plan to use some aggressive wing backs. If we take Correa out of it, I'm not sure he's gonna be good enough for us. If we look at Tentugal and Pedro Vieira here, they're looking pretty promising. Looking pretty promising. Definitely in that range and exceeding it in a lot of it as well. As a footnote, these are the key attributes I'm looking for. Four standouts for my full or wing backs. Decision is going to be lacking a bit because these guys look like they're more determined to go forward. So that could be an area of concern. But the rest of it, I'm pretty happy with them. Do that with all roles and positions. You can see here we've got workhorses in midfield. So your defensive midfielders, the more creative players, and wingers and strikers. So now I've got a good idea of what I've got to work with and I had tactics in mind, but there's been a few curveballs brought up by one or two of the players. Let me show you. Ladies and gents, this is Diego Valente, uh, 38 year old, and he is the standout player because his attributes across the board are just better than everybody else's. Obviously being 38, his physicals are starting to lack. But the curveball it's thrown me is I was dead set on playing a 4-4-2. If you look like someone like him, I need to get him in the team somewhere. Alongside him, we've got some pretty solid players, including Rodrigo Lima, who looks like he'll be a mainstay in central midfield. Good all-round attributes. Really like the look of the wing-back in Jao Tentugal. He looks like a good all-rounder. In fact, his favourite role is complete wing-back. Pedro Vieira also wants to play there, but he can also play on the other side, which brings in the option of an inverted wing-back, even at this level. And I expect goals from Jean-Pierre Zapata. Not even good enough to have a face in the game look, but if I look at his key attributes for goal-scoring strikers, his overall attributes might not look anything special, but the key ones are definitely there. So we've got a good size squad. It needs a bit more leveling out with regards to centre-backs, but as I look through the squad, we'll get to know them all as the save progresses. What about this lad? Chocolate is his set name. I need to know more. So the tactic time, I was going to create a 4-4-2. I was going to go pretty basic and have a pretty flexible 4-4-2, which could move roles around. The curveball has been our 38-year-old general. Where am I going to get him in the team? So if I was going to go basic and start from a clean slate at 4-4-2, he likes to play on the left-hand side. In fact, let's put him in the team. There he is, Valente, Diego Valente. Remember, he's got to be key. His attributes are ridiculous. He's got flair of 14. His passing's good. His crossing is out of this world for this level at 15. I need to use him. But he's not an out-and-out -out winger, is he? Because he's got no acceleration and no pace. He's definitely a playmaker. So in this formation, what do we do with him? Do I go a bit asymmetric, push him up and let him be an advanced playmaker in there? Or the fact that he's 38... Do we start this way, and when he tires, bring on one of the younger pacey lads to play more like a traditional winger? Up front, I'm well set. There's a good option for two up front. If we look at Victor Andrade here, he's a big boy. He's six foot three, so we've got a target man if needed, with decent heading, jumping reach, and strength. Same goes for Nilo, a 30 year old Brazilian. Again, big guy, not the great in the air though, so you have to be a different type of player. But what I don't like is he's off the ball and his composure. But remember, we're in the real world, so we've got all these players to come now. I've had a quick scan through, and there is some definite players who will go straight in the team. Let me show you them. This is Mateus Brito. He's a centre-back or midfielder about to join, and I just can't help the feeling. I can't shake the feeling that he could be a very good libero at this level. Dare I play a libero at this level? Duarte is going to come in at left-back. He's a natural left-footer. He's got a good forward abilities, he could combine really well with our playmaker. He could do the winger work while our playmaker just floats around. And I'm really delighted about this one. Remember what we talked about South America? Well, Marcos Caballero is on his way in. Striker, good acceleration, great pace, natural fitness, finishing, composure, off the ball, technique. He starts. The option one, which we're going to test in friendlies, is here. Now you'll notice I've got Valente, our playmaker, our 38 year old ring general as a wide midfielder on attack. Why have I used that? Because it's basically a blank template. I can add in absolutely everything here to make him into like whatever position I want him to be. And I've basically given him free rights to be our main creative hub in the team. We're going to see if that works. 
Plan B, if it doesn't quite work with him, we're going to shift him up front to give him a bit of a free roll up there. We'll have a traditional winger on one side, and we will use Mr. Pedro Vieira in here as an inverted wing back to jump into that pivot, which will release our central midfielder to bomb on. That's plan B. Now, I've done a bit of work on the set pieces, not as much as I'd like to. We'll kind of grow into that as the save goes on, but we've got some basic routines rocking. For now, what I think I'll do is play a few friendlies and wait for this raft of players to come in, and then we'll know what we're working with for this season and see how the friendlies are looking like. The final thing we need to talk about is the facilities. We're in a small suburb of Porto, and the capacity is an all-seater, but it's only 1,100. So we're going to have to work with that for a while. The training facilities are average. The youth facilities are below average. Need to work on that because we might need players from that, especially early days. Average academy coaching and basic youth recruitment. Pre-season was pretty solid and the team started to link up well, getting used to the new system that we put in place. So with one more friendly to go, the team are banging goals in left, right and centre, but we're conceding a few as well. We're not quite there, but we're getting there. At the minute, I've got three versions of a 4-4-2. The last one is the most crazy, most experimental, if you like, with that libero. That's only in extreme circumstances. The ones we're going to go with are probably the basic ones to try and get us out of these leagues. These are the leagues. We'll try and get to grips with the rules of each league when we get there. Presuming it's some sort of big, mad playoff. How are we going to go? These boys are the ones... They're going to lead the charge. Okay, how about a mid-season update? Needless to say, that man has been vital, just like we thought he would have been. Let me take you to the first game of the season. One of the first kicks, 36 minutes gone. That gave us a lovely 3-0 away win on our first game of the season. Game two, second game of the season, first home game. He did it again. Twice. I love him. There he is. He's 39 now. He's had a birthday, so he's even older. But this season, he's got 15 appearances, five assists, four goals. And I think all of those have been from free kicks. He's a marvel at this level. Tactic-wise, we settled on that 4-4-2, didn't we? But we've been all over the place. I've used so many alternate versions of the 4-4-2. It's crazy. Things have gone really well in the league. We're now on a little run as well of about eight games undefeated. After 15 matches, we find ourselves top of the league. It's been a right battle, though, playing in comprehensive highlights to make the adjustments. Now, alongside Valente, Abel Joshua here has been key. In fact, he's the only guy that I've managed to get onto a contract past this season. He's got another three-year deal because I think he's going to be a sellable asset. And he's bagged five assists from central midfield. So the tactic that's got us on this eight-match unbeaten streak has led to us attacking like this. So you've got the two defenders, two pivot, and we've got five across the front. I love it. It's working really nicely. If I show you the tactic, you'll wonder how it's been happening. So take that away, and that is the tactic there. It's a version of a 4-4-2, but we've got we've still got our man Valente over there. He's got to do whatever he wants in this setup. But the shadow striker comes in, and the deep line forward drops back. And you will notice that the central midfielder on attack is right behind the shadow striker. Now, in all versions of FM, you might think that these two would end up getting in each other's way. But in FM24, the intelligence and the player movement, the player positioning is such that when Abel moves forward like that, Mosquito, as I've lovingly started calling him, Mosquito, naturally moves over there like that and he sits in there. I'll show you this clip and it shows it to perfection. But don't get in each other's way, but move out of the way. Okay, so we've just won the ball back. So Mosquito's there and Abel's there. Now they're in that same zone there, aren't they? Same area of the pitch. But when we get further forward, you'll see the difference that they make. So as they carry on, Abel moves into that central midfield attack right kind of position. And Mosquito, knowing that he's there, he's starting to move in the complete other direction. We get the ball back. He's seen him. See that little wave he did? I'm enjoying that. Let's get that back up. But now look at him moving across. And now he finds himself in the AMCL position. So he's moved all the way across. In previous editions of FM, he'd probably stay over where Abel Shoshua is there. 
but he's moving across. He loses the ball, but there you can see there's a free in line there. That's the what I wanted. This is all the same attack, by the way. Rodrigo picks it up, and you can still see them both up there. Abel there, Mosquito there. So remember, Mosquito's start position is where Abel is, but because Abel's moved over there, he's now moved across. This is what I love about this version of FM. There he is, in a complete different position than you set him in, because he's got the intelligence to move into that position. You can see this movement here. We're working it, we're working it. Zhao to Manga. Now over on that far side, it goes to the winger. And this shows it the best. Mosquito now in the AMCL spot. If he was where he was normally going to be, is where Abel is. But because he's in that new AMCL spot, he gets on the end of the cross and bags it. So that's going to give you a whole new way of setting up your tactic. In play, my tactic looks a bit like this, like we saw from the screenshot. We've got these guys coming up like this. We've got Vieira pushing up. It looks a bit like that when we've got the ball and we're high up. We've got five of them up there. But in reality, we set up like that and he moves across and he comes forward. I love it. It's beautiful. And it's going to open up so many possibilities for you to do as well. Now, it didn't take long for the finances to take a turn. And bear in mind, we've spent no money at all. We were positive 136 when we started the season. Now, in the 14th of January, we're already near enough £100,000 in the red. Not good. And if you look at the wage budget, it hasn't moved. We're still spending too much. We need to get rid of players. When you get to January, it's probably a good time to start looking about who you want to keep because our squad, basically, everybody, other than a few at the bottom, are out of contract. So I've had a look and I know who I want to keep. And one of them was John pierre Zapata. He's been a bit hit and miss this season, but he's only 21. And something really interesting happened when I renewed his contract. Take a look. So this is the first contract we got renewed. He's not on a great deal of money, £350 a week. But if you look over at the clauses, the first minimum fee release clause has been set. £54,000. Why is that important? Because it could well be the first step on our journey to the £1 billion. Remember the stipulation we have in place where we must sell players when clauses are hit. So if anyone hits the £54,000 mark, he's off. And that'll be the first step on us earning some money. Everybody else in this squad doesn't have a clause, so that's going to start coming into play as we get a little bit better and rise up the leagues. It's also worth reminding, though, that if we do get a big bid in that doesn't hit the clause, but it's still a decent-sized bid, we will accept it, keeping this real. But I can't tell you enough how many different variations of the 442 I used. I used comprehensive highlights throughout, tweaking as we go. I did it live on Twitch as well, so people could see us doing it. Only now can you see the tactical familiarity levels rising up, and now they pretty much understand what's what. By the way, the squad views, which a lot of you asked about, will be linked down below if you want to use them yourself. You can see from my centre-back squad views here that I've got a decent budget now, working in that 10 to 13 range. We've got Pex, we've got Faustino Manga, which was a pre-arranged transfer, and I'm quite happy with him when you look at him. And we've also got Mateus Brito, who I experimented with as a libero. I still think he can do it, so much so, in fact, that I've got him training to be one. Now, I haven't got him next season, but I'm going to look to extend his loan. And if I can, if we go up, we might be able to convert him to a libero. You can see some of his attributes are on the way up, such as dribbling, heading, marking, anticipation and positioning. He's going to be a good player, so I want to keep hold of him. And one final thing for this episode, I am considering an affiliate. I don't know whether to do it. What do you think? Do we try and hunt for a senior affiliate or not? Or do we try and do it ourselves? I'm 50-50 at the minute. We've got about 11 matches left, 11 matches to get us up from this league, but it doesn't just end at the league campaign because there's four divisions of four teams. We're then going to go into a playoff situation where the top two from each league, now bear with me here, then go into a group stage, the promotion stage, and then after that, I think you play off for the championship and then you go up. And it gets complicated because I think one team needs to play against the team bottom of the league of three, and it just blows my mind, but... Basically, we need to finish in that top two, and then we'll see. But yeah, all hail the king. Straight in, something I forgot to cover last time, we've got our youth intake preview, and check this out. It's apparently an excellent intake, a terrific group of players coming through, particularly goalkeeper, winger, centre-backs. This, for our situation, could be ideal. I say our situation because don't forget that we need to replace any players we lose with players from the youth team or scouted players in our current financial situation. We ain't buying anyone. So that's got me excited. It's time to finish this season, though, and let's see if we can get these boys promoted. The team started to fire and we went on a 15-game undefeated streak near the end of the season. 
Even our little funky throwing techniques were starting to work. Some lovely movements coming in from set pieces. This meant we held on to top spot, only losing four times throughout the season, and we won our little section of the Portuguese fourth division. So good times, all good in the hood. By the way, we've got our youth intake in. Take a look at this. Do you remember when they said it was going to be an excellent intake? Apparently not. Apparently not. Seems like my head of youth development got a little bit excited in the preview and we've actually got ourselves a poor intake, as you can see. There's not a lot to shout about here. Key standout players potentially is this 15-year-old centre-back, but as you look at his attributes, he doesn't exactly hit our 10 to 13 range. Can he get up there? I'm not too sure. And the head of youth development seems really excited about namesake Pedro Diaz, and if I look at him, I mean, there's not a lot to shout about there, but if we look a little bit closer, he's only 16 and he is six foot four. And if you look at his attributes wise, heading 10, jumping 13, teamwork 16, he could be something to work with. I'm clutching at straws here, but hey. So what is with that? Why did it say at one point, excellent you've been taking, but in reality it's poor. It said excellent back in the day in relation to what we already had. So these lot are probably an upgrade on what we did have, but in reality, they are pretty poor. For example, if we go to my under 19 squad, all the players there are the youth candidates. So we didn't have any players initially. So yeah, it looks excellent when you don't have any players. Back to the positivity, we did win our league. So we are top, it doesn't count as a trophy. Not yet, because we go into the Portuguese, fourth division, playoff, group stage, drama. And here it is, we get separated into a group of four. Now, unfortunately for us, Herides are also in this group and we cannot beat them this season. They've beat us once and we've got a draw against them. The other two are from another two leagues. So we need to play each team twice now. So we've got another six matches and the top two get promoted. The top one, so if you finish top, you go into a match to be declared the overall champions. But I just want to get us up. Well, let's go. So into the playoffs we go and then disaster struck. Edu find our boy Valente, our 39-year-old talisman. And he pulled up. He pulled up lame. All linchpin, our icon. Achilles tendon ruptured. He's out for seven to eight months. Naturally, he's now thinking about quitting. This cannot get any worse. Why Why did I even speak? Look. I mean, Rodrigo Lima. He's out for a year. He's played every match this season in central midfield. He's one of only three players I've managed to give a contract to. A year. Perides, we just can't beat them. I do never want to see them again. That's four games we've not been able to beat them. And it leaves us like this. We need one point from our last match to get up. We're not going to win the league. I don't care. We've got to beat or not lose to Javier, who need to beat us to get promoted. It's all on this. Yeah, 
yes, the boys come out on top. Just, just. That was a bit squeaky, I won't lie to you. But we got promoted. Can't win the league, but we are up. This leads to a few new challenges. After much debate, we did ask the board for a senior affiliate. And to my shock, they agreed, but they couldn't find one. So it's going to be something we have to revisit next season. And remember that contract situation where we've got 20 of a 25-man squad out of contract. Which leads me nicely over to the finances. Remember, we started on day one with a plus 130,000 finance. Today, as it sits, we're in the red by nearly £400,000. But despite that dire situation, the board have somehow came together. And for next season, we've got a wage budget that's way up at 40 grand a week and transfer budget of 26 grand. Can we do something with that? The plan is now to plan for next season. Do I stick with this tactic? This tactic's got us up from this league, but it did have some frailties, especially against Paredes and their 4-3-3. It could be time to experiment with something new. And if you think we're going to get an entirely new squad, there's probably time to do that. MVPs of the season, definitely King Abel. He ended up with 10 goals, 11 assists, with an average rating of 7.32. Thankfully, he's got a new deal. I moved Zapata to the right wing, and when we did that, he was on fire. He scored four times from right wing for an overall season of nine. However, out of that 11 there, you see only Shastri, the goalkeeper, Zapata, Joshua, and injured Lima are the men who've got new contracts. But not only now do we have a massive job getting a squad ready for a higher division and better teams, but I've also got hardly any staff in contracts. So I've got to decide if I'm going to keep them. Now, at the minute, the staff levels look great, but they are in comparison to the league we're in. When we go up, they're going to drop, drop, drop. So we might have to have a massive clear out there too. At the minute, we're allowed a coaching team of nine, which includes analysts, fitness coaches, and youth development. I'm hoping they give us an extra coach or two, especially a set-piece coach would be nice. And if he does retire, what more fitting role than the set-piece king, the Diego Volante, to be our new set-piece coach? But now with likely 20 players leaving us, it's time for our first look into the scouting screen, trying to build a squad for next season in Liga 3. So very shortly, we're going to go through the squad planning for a higher division, the tactic we're going to use for this season, wiping the slate clean on staffing. I've got a lot to get through here. We've established that loads of these players are about to leave us because their contracts are expiring. And to be brutally honest, not many of them are going to be good enough for the next level. Remember, the next level will equal a key attribute raise from the fourth division where we went for 10 to 13 for our key attributes. We've got to go to the third division this time. And that rating is going to be 11 to 14. So we're moving up a bit in terms of quality. So all in all, there's going to be a massive, massive turnover Bigger than I want to do, I want to keep the nucleus of the team, but it needs most at this stage. First season, contracts have gone. There's the players that are left that we're going to take some part. Starters, three of them, and we've got some on the bench. A lot of work to do. But first, completely out of nowhere, I've got the news bulletin that we are moving stadium. We're going to rent Gondomar's stadium. What this means, and this is probably the earliest this has ever happened to me, is the board of announced plans to enlarge our stadium by another 860 seats. So we need somewhere to play for the next season. So it's going to be there, this beautiful Estadio de San Miguel Gondomar Stadium, built in 1970. It's a little bit bigger than ours, so yeah, we're there for this season. So this has happened early. I didn't expect it. I thought our stadium would be good enough for the league above, but apparently not. And that's where we're going to play for the next season. But it does mean we're going to get ourselves a nice little upgrade to our stadium. Which is incredibly surprising if you remember the state of our finances, where we currently sit in the red by £400,000. The prep begins now, and we did say about the coaches what we were going to do, and I've made a tough, tough decision, but it's what needs to be done. We've been brutal, and we've sacked everyone. Assistant coach, head of youth development, he's not been good enough. Out goes the fitness coach. 22-year-old coach, Zhao Cruz, has also gone. I know what you're thinking, that means Valente is in as a coach, right? Unfortunately, it's a bit of a no-go, because he's unfortunately not very good at all. His coaching abilities are pretty poor, and then I thought, director of football, maybe? No. So we've got our staff search underway, then out of nowhere, this has came. Tycoon Eyes Salgeros. Already, could we be subject of a takeover bid? From a mystery foreign tycoon? Hmm, not too sure about that, not too sure about that. Will it come off? Probably not, but we'll keep an eye on that. But now, we had to reshape this squad, and we have done so. We've started the process, and I'm quite happy so far. 
One of the staff that survived was Unborn Penza's chief scout. I was quite happy with him. Our level, judging player ability 11 and potential at 11, but more importantly, his extensive knowledge around the world, that played into it. So we've kept him and he's completely in charge at the minute because he's the only member of the scouting team we have left. So he's come up with quite a few recommendations for new signings, but we need to decide if they're going to be good enough. Using our parameters of 11 to 14, that's what we need to look for. Now, we don't just take anyone who hits those targets because it's early days, so we can have a look at them and then weigh it up. Now, I've got a good idea because he's hit the first three key attributes I want, and then I can start broadening it out a bit and have a little look further. What's his pace like? What's his finishing and his passing like? He's good. He's in that sort of ballpark, so he's probably someone that we'll look to get, especially if you look at his contract at only £200 a week. With our finance situation, he could be exactly what we need. Not forgetting the save outline, ideally we'll be looking for players who could potentially be sellable. So we don't really want to be getting too many players 30, 30 plus. We want to be looking at that potential sell on range, you know, from like 20 years old and up. So the good news, I spent hours over this past weekend looking for players to build this squad ready for a Liga 3 campaign. And I think I'm about there now. If you look at the transfers out section there, those are the players that have been released. An absolute army of them. It left us with a squad of about three or four. But thankfully, we have replaced them. I'm not going to show you all of them, but I'll show you a good chunk. Now, here is the squad overview. You can see that it's a decent size now. We've got probably a 25-man squad, something like that, which is about where I want to be. I don't want to be too much bigger than that. And it's got enough cover all over the pitch. First up, this is the boy who's going to replace Diego. This is Z Valente. You can see the upgrade we've got here. His attributes are even on the higher side of the range we're aiming for. We're aiming for 11 to 14. He's got a load coming in at 15, 16. He's probably too good for us. We paid a little bit for him, £825 a week, free transfer. He's going to be the linchpin. He's our new creative threat. We have ourselves some South American influence with Pedro Benique. He's a Brazilian. He wants to play in midfield, but I see him more as a central defender. We're going to try and make him play a bit of ball. Now, his heading's not great, so it's very important we get someone next to him who can take the burden of that. This is where Dennis Martins comes in. He's 27 as well, so good sell on value potential. Good broad range of attributes, and you can see the key attributes for centre-backs. Positioning, concentration, and decisions are all covered, and he's got some nice other ones as well, such as his jumping reach, his marking, and his tackling. Very good for this level. Last season, we got ripped to bits by Miguel Constantinescu. He was on loan at Parides, our bogey team. This season, he's on loan with us. Now, King Abel will be our central midfield on attack, but next to him, we now have Yaya Bamba. He's going to be the midfield enforcer, if you like. He absolutely hits the remit of anticipation, concentration, work rate and positioning. With all the creative players around him, he's going to be vital. And late in the transfer window, Umbo and Penza came up trumps with a brand new goal scorer for us. Off the ball, composure, anticipation and he can chuck in some decent acceleration, pace and finishing. Balasangare at this level could score a truckload. Now we have paid a bit for him, he's our highest earner on two grand a week, but I'm hoping he will be worth it. As with all the players who've came in, he does have a minimum free release clause of 105,000. So this is where these release clauses might come into play. Now, overall, I'm super happy with the progress we've made. We've got some good players coming now, and we've still got the players that are hanging around from last season. Remember Zapata? Well, the good news is with Zapata, I've now got him a face. There he is from Peru. He's going to still be there. He'll probably be in rotation with our new striker, Sangare. Goalkeeper Shastri is still there and King Abel and Rodrigo Lima, both injured, will be in the squad. But you can see their turnover we've had, but I'm hopeful that this squad can do the business. Now, tactic-wise, we do have last season's successful tactic, but it did have some frailties. And I'm just wondering, now we've got better players, can we go for a more gegen press style and press a little bit more with a sort of classic 4-2-3-1 variation? I may move Volante over here. He's going to have pretty much a bit of a free roll now, but we do know that if he sits in there... If the central midfielder on attack pushes up, he will float around, so we don't need to worry. He will move around in match as we see fit. I do expect Constantinescu to be really creative, and I want to give him as much freedom as possible. So that's why in behind him, we've got an inverted wing back on defender. He'll just sit back and cover these areas. So I've got a decent sized squad now, and the attribute level has definitely gone up. There are, a lot of them now are in that 11 to 14 range that we're looking for from the third level of the competition. However, if we're going to look for a bit more of a pressing style on last season, there's some more key attributes 
that I need to make sure we've got. And I've got a squad view here that shows that we're pretty much getting there. Okay, so that's my full squad there. 26 or so, I think it's that, 25, 26. We'll go up to views up here and I've made one suited for Gegenpress to see if we've got the right type of player to make it work. We'll select that. And now you can see the key attributes I've got across here. I'm just going to deselect the goalkeepers because obviously we don't need them to be pressing like crazy. And this is what we're left with. You can see across the top there, we've got eight attributes that I deem kind of essential for Gegenpress style. Work rate, teamwork, stamina, natural fitness, decisions, bravery, anticipation, and acceleration. Now, a couple of those might surprise some people, but I'm just going for an all-round approach, specifically with the acceleration and decisions. Now, if I look at the squad overall, you can see a lot of those are in the yellow in that 11 to 14 range, and it's looking pretty good. I think the team, the squad, might be able to handle this style of pressing. Where it may waver is with attacking midfielders and strikers, but if I have a look at it, I'm still pretty happy with it. Some of them are a bit off, but not massively so. They're still in the 10, 10 to 12 range, such as Z Valente. But remember, Z Valente is going to be our freedom fighter. He's going to have positions to just roam around wherever he wants. So I'm not too concerned about him. The rest is pretty competitive, you know. So if you think you want to have a look at your squad in that style, the filter for that view, the Gegen Press view, is down below in the description. But it does mean now I've got a few more options. So if in match I feel like we can press a bit more and crank that right up, we can do so. There are a couple of things I'm wondering about. If you remember last season, we had the attacking midfielder in behind the central midfielder on attack because there was more room here because we were playing a winger. Now here, we've got an inverted winger on attack. So he's naturally going to come inside as well. So I'm just wondering if this gets a bit too crowded. We'll see how that plays as the season goes out. But overall, I'm pretty happy with the three options we've got at the minute. We've got this asymmetric style there. We've got a bit of a classic 4-2-3-1 there. And we've got a slightly more defensive version of it there with team instructions backing off a little bit. Early signs are good. We had a pre-season friendly against top division Forense and put up a good fight. Game ended 0-0 and they weren't really on top of us. We played a few weaker teams and again, it looked pretty good. Dominating each match. This is Benfica's B team we put to the sword. By the way, it was a total accident that I replaced Valente with Velente. It's just a total accident. A happy accident, but he will have the creative freedom. We will move him around in matches as we see fit. So once I got my squad together and I decided on where they were going to play, I wanted to double down on that with a bit of training. So literally every player, I would go to their training and make sure that they were position and role duty they were training in was where they were playing in my key tactic. So even someone like King Abel, the legend from last season, his training would still be all around the central midfield attack position. Some players that I brought in, such as Jelani Trevisan, a young Belgian, were hitting his position rolling duty, but also adding an additional focus to help his overall progression. Now the squad's one thing, but this is my next big update and my favourite one yet. You ready? Remember how we sacked all that staff and wanted to upgrade? Take a look at this. We basically revitalised our entire staff in, and the coaching staff now is the highest in Liga 3. Annoyingly, other than goalkeeper shot stopping, but still, look at that. Recruitment team, although small, again, highest in Liga 3 with a new scout to assist Umbo and Penza and a new director of football. And stop press, we've even got a full medical team. I feel like this is one of the things that gets overlooked when you're going up through the leagues. You just kind of leave your staff as is, but we wanted to really upgrade ours and we've done that. Even my new assistant manager, Ricardo Lima, he's way better than what I had previously. The coaches are better than our in double figures. In fact, pretty much in the attribute zone for our key players. So we might as well use it for the staff as well. But without doubt, the one I'm most excited about is the new head of youth development who's judging ability, potential and working with youngsters is through the roof and he's probably too good for us. All that meant I could reassign the coach assignments, making us that bit more well-rounded and a better coach workload overall. So now we're pretty much set. We've got ourselves a brand new captain in Jose Shastri, who's been there since we got there. We've got a new key player in the new Valente, and we've got ourselves a new hot prospect in young Jelani. Not forgetting the four or five players we've kept from last season. Hopefully some of them can come up the leagues with us, such as Zapata. So all that leaves us now is Liga 3 and working out the way it works. So initially, two groups of 10 rather than the four groups of 14 in the division below. And it looks like the top four from each of these league tables goes into the championship group and the rest go into the relegation stage. 
Then, if I'm reading this correctly, the top team and the second team get straight up into Liga Portugal 2 and the third place team will go into a playoff. I'm sure some of you have more experience of this league, so if I've got that right, let me know. If I've got it wrong, let me know. So the season preview, by the way, Sporting a 4-11 on to win the league, their B team, but us in at ninth, we're the best players of the promoted teams. So a little bit of pressure there, 14 to 1. We don't have any players in the Dream 11. And in fact, if you look over to the key players section, so this is like basically the whole squad of Dream players, we do have Valente in there and our boy Constantinescu. Other than that, that's it. So a big summer rebuild is complete. Complete new staff, complete new squad. Decent preseason in terms of results. New tactic. Let's see how we do. I reckon it's time for an update. So, how's the season been going? Life in Liga 3 has started really well. Even the King's back from injury doing things like this. And hot prospect Zapata has been insane. I couldn't have asked for a better start. We've won every match and we've looked really good. We've only conceded three goals and we're smashing goals in. Tactic-wise, we've... Mostly played this, it's the 4 2 3 1 with Valente kind of roaming around. Now, during the matches, if I see a gap here and there, I'll move him. I'll put him there, I'll put him in the middle. I'll even, and this is a key one, if we're dominating, sometimes I've made him into a track with Tista, even though he doesn't actually want to play there. But when he doesn't need to defend, push him on a bit more. Now, this is the player instructions episode, but we'll get to that later on if this tactic holds up. Because we've got bigger news, and it's this. If we're going to hit these targets, we need to stay here a long time. So one of the early steps on this is to get a new contract and the board have come at us with a two-year deal, which I happily accepted. So that's us here till 2026. So that's a good early step, a good early target for the manager in this sort of service to keep the contracts coming. You don't want one-year deals, really. So we've got a two-year deal and our early days have looked pretty good. Interestingly, if you look at the player stats, it says players bought 17. Signed, because we bought nobody. Players sold for, same deal, because total value in is zero, total value out is zero. We've paid a little bit to agents, which is annoying. Further down though, number of players released is 18. So actually, it's more like we brought in 17 and out have gone 22. Now over to finances, and you can see in the top corner there, we are in the red by 53,000. Current board put some money in. We were in, in the black for a little period, maybe a couple of weeks, and now we're back in the red. What that does mean is the tycoon that was rumoured hasn't came. And to be honest, I'm quite happy with that. I don't want a sugar daddy at this stage. I want to stay down and dirty in these lower leagues and build our way up. So if he comes, he's not welcome, but it doesn't look like he's coming. So currently we are five for five. We're five for five. We're top of the league and we just need to be in that top four because the top four goes into that breakaway group. So I think what it is, is there's two, two leagues, promotion and relegation. The promotion one's going to have eight teams in, seven games at home seven away 14 in total so it'll add to it gonna end up being about a 32 game season all in all i mentioned at the start about zapata he has been unreal we've played him up front this season last year we moved into the wing didn't we but he's up front he scored six in five he's starting to recognize that potential we had now he's a day one of zapata so we want to bring him through the leagues with us and to get him better we've actually focused on his positioning of playing in advance forward and we've added the additional focus of agility and balance and they are on the way up so that's how we're trying to improve him. We'll see how he goes as the season progresses. And if the momentum sticks and we're starting to get success with this tactic, we'll get back to it and we'll have a little look at the player instructions and see what we've done. Now it's time to get through this clutch of games. Yes, what a time we have had. We've finished top of our little group. Again, it doesn't mean a league title. We did this last year, didn't we? It doesn't mean a league title. We need to win the championship group. But we are top. Second in total points, only to Sporting CPB. Only the three defeats. Plenty of goals scored. Lovely. And you saw Zapata score a truckload. Now, I do want to pay attention to one match. Do you remember Perides? That one team. That one team that we could not beat. Late in the season... Late in the season, Paredes came to visit Salgueros at our temporary home 
and this happened in the first 10 minutes. Five nil after nine minutes, the game finishes seven three. I think we've had our revenge. Results like that meant that we are now in the top eight. The championship group, we play each team twice, so we've got 14 more matches here. Makes it a bit of a longer season than you think. So the top two will go automatically up to the second division. The third place, which is why it's in a slightly different colour, will go into a playoff to get up into the next division. So it's top three or bust. So here is the current lineup. You'll notice that there's no Abel and there's no holding midfielder, Yaya. They're just in rotation at the minute. Abel's had a few injuries this season. Let's have a little look at him. There he is. He's still contributed. He's had 12 total appearances, two assists and a goal, but he's been injured so much. But he's lingering around the squad and we love him, so we keep him. So Pat has been the main guy up front. Started the season like house on fire. The whole season now, he scored 15 and 19. If you look at his attributes there, they're all on the way up. We have progressed him really nicely. In fact, if you go up to his development tab and drop down to progress, you can see the start of February 24. He's a bit of a two and a half star player, but you can see the incline of his abilities on the way here. Three star at the minute, but his potential ability is going up and up. Three and a half star. Now we're at three and a half, pushing to get that four star potential ability. He's a wanted man, and because we have to sell players who hit release clauses, we actually went into him and we got him a new deal, which meant his minimum fee release clause has now bumped up to 120,000. So that's double what it was. We had to get that deal done. So if he does get sold now, at least it's more money, but I'm hoping he doesn't. You'll notice the progression that's purely from playing him in his favorite position, training him right in the same role, and picking out a couple of areas of his game to improve as well with some additional training. It's worked the treat and he's bagged 15 goals this season. You saw some other goals there from highlight players. Konstantinescu, who's only on loan with us. Nine assists, 17 games. He's a class above. We need to keep him. And Valente took a little while to settle, but he's there now. His current form is fantastic. He's on 7.4 in his last five matches. Five goals, four assists. Lovely player. So player instructions. These can make your set tactic into a completely different tactic. And this is what we've done with ours. We haven't put too much on them because it's lower league football. We don't want to do too much and overcomplicate things. Just a few key ones. My approach to player instructions is accentuating some positives of the players. And in some cases, eliminating the negatives as best you can. If you look across the back there, you can see the inverted wing back on defend. None needed there. Quite happy with that. Same with the central defenders. And the wing back, we've actually asked him to dribble a little bit less because if you look at his attribute level, He's dribbling his nine, so let's not encourage that. He's not the best at it. I want him to stay wider for the sake of the team to spread the game a bit. Central midfield defence, even making him more solid, he's taking fewer risks. Basically, I want him to get it and give it, get it and give it. Central midfielder, we've only got movement the channels on him, mostly because behind him we've got an inverted wing back popping in there. And we've also got Constantinescu, who likes to roam around and come inside. So sometimes he will overlap him as he comes inside. Speaking of Konstantinescu, we want to take advantage of his class. So he's got more direct passes because of his vision and his passing, his technique ability with the take more risks as well. Cross less often because we don't really want him to do that. We don't need him to do that. He's coming inside a lot more and shoot less often. I want him to be more of a creator. Valente, take more risks, dribbling more, get further forward. And you'll notice I've got Mark's specific position. Which one is that? It's the opposition's defensive midfielder. So he kind of hovers around this side. If there is a defensive midfielder who's a bit of a playmaker, he will be around him to try and nullify that. Inside forward, we leave him as is, and then Zapata up front. Simple, simple, simple. So yeah, just a little few player instructions. You'll notice the main guys like Constantinescu. I still can't say that. And Valente, they've got a little bit more because I feel like they can deal with it a bit more. The rest, it's all pretty basic stuff, if any at all. So the January transfer window is open. We haven't done much, but we've just done a little bit to help improve our team. And it's one I'm really excited about using the South American flavor. Shastri is our number one and he has been for two years, but there has been a slight drop off when we're conceding too many goals. If you look at his last five matches, 6.74, but conceding seven as well. An opportunity came to sign this man, Breno, a 24 year old Brazilian from Santos. Now goalkeeper attribute wise, across the board, really good. And because of his age, there can be improvement here. He's probably going to be an upgrade 
on Shastri. Signs are good when he came in and he needed a minimum fee release clause of 170. That's close to being the biggest our club. I'm tempted to throw him straight in the team for this championship group. It'll be harsh on Shastri, but he could be the future. So we're about to go into this championship group. We've got seven matches now. Sporting twice is going to be tough. We need to somehow get in that top two. Worst case scenario, top three. I do think that we are ahead of schedule. The squad were more than capable of hitting that Geg and Press approach, like we used the squad filter to find out. We made some good sidings. A basic formation, but one that's working. It's time for the championship group. Let's start with the good news. The good news is Breno is fast becoming the lower league Edison. All of his attributes are on the rise. And if you look at his on the ball play, such as his passing, his first touch, his vision, he can definitely play as a sweeper keeper. Now you'll notice that he has conceded a few, 12 and eight, we'll get to that. But do bear in mind that he's never played a game for Santos. This is his first few games. So the fact that his attributes are rising like this is a really good sign. Into the championship playoffs, and despite dominating our first match, a 93rd minute winner for Amora robbed us. However, we fired back in the next game, we battered Trofense 3 0. Making it two in a row with a really good win against Braga's B team. Absolutely battered Academica. but somehow they scratched an equaliser. And this started a worrying theme, a theme where we dominated matches, but somehow lost. Halfway point of the playoff group, that looks a bit savage. We're sitting the seventh. We've won two, drawn two, lost three. I have no idea how we've lost three, we played really well. But if you look at it, we're only three points off second place. So we're not that far back. We've got seven games to go. This is a halfway point. We've got a big seven coming up. We needed a 95th minute wonder goal from Constantinescu just to rescue a draw against Trofense. This meant we hadn't won in five matches. This is our worst form since we took over the club. Absolutely typical. That late equaliser gave us a bit of form though. We did the double over Braga, which meant we are on the brink of promotion now. Three teams above us, all on 17. We sit on 15. Four games to go, we've got to play two of the teams above us. It's in our hands. Counter attack twice from Academica. And somehow we lost that match. Look at the state of the match stats. Player of the match, Carlos Alves, their goalkeeper. Same story in the next match. We should have won that one comfortably. 3.7 XG. 89 minutes gone. Sporting B team beat us 4 3. Like a broken record. Match stats say we should have got something. This meant our last game against Caldas. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't go up. The boys lost their heads. We've run out of steam. We conceded six. A disastrous end to the season. We just conceded 10 goals in two matches. If you look at the entire championship group, we conceded 30 plus in the 14 matches. It looks like we simply ran out of steam, but I think I am to blame. Because the initial season went so well, only losing two or three matches, I've simply put, got complacent. I should have changed it more, I should have more tweaks. We've got to change something for next season. At this point, it would be quick to jump on the panic train and just say, right, I've got a new tactic, everything. But let's think about this. We finished top of our group. We were class. We just ran out of steam. So I need to look at it a bit deeper and find what we can change subtly. So I visited the data hub and I don't have the greatest analyst, but I will be able to gauge something from the available information. So I went up to team and team performance and I've got myself these scatter graphs because I knew we had so many chances in some of their matches. So the first thing I looked at was attacking efficiency. If I bring this one up, you can see aggressive shooting. Yes, wasteful shooting. We're up there. We manage more shots per match than average, but we are less clinical. So I need to do something about that. So what I've done, I made a copy of the original tactic. There it is. I'm just going to tweak a few things. Now, what I'm going to ask the team to do now is, because I have so many shots, I'm going to bring that tempo down a bit so we can take a bit more time. I'm also going to add in work ball into box as well so we take less stupid shots because we seem to be having an awful lot of them. 
Next up, I looked at the defensive side of the game. If we look at defending here, we can see we're down in this area here for fewer blocks and fewer clearances. If we also look at tackling, we can also see fewer tackles. Back to the copy tactic. So this is going to be our alternative version, our B version. We're going to change our central midfield on defend, make it a bit more aggressive, a ball in midfielder. And because we're a high pressing team, we're going to ask the three forward midfielders here to add in a bit more aggressive tackling because maybe they're standing off a bit too much. They're not going to be the best tacklers in the world, but when they get there, we want them to put their physicality across a bit. So we'll ask all three of those to tackle harder. Next up, I saw possession as a big outlier. Let's have a look at this. Loose in possession, we're basically the most loose. Now, we are the most aggressive, so that's going to be a risk we do play, but we can probably tighten up a little bit. So I'm actually going to lower the tempo even more to a lower tempo in this version. I'm going to have a look at a few players once we start the season and ask them whether or not it's a right option to take more risk. We might take that off on a couple of players, such as the central midfielders. We might add take fewer risks in there so they complete a few more passes. Finally, I looked at the last five matches. The ones where we've conceded the most goals, I think there's something like 15 goals have gone in here. And we can see we've conceded 7 of 15 goals have been scored from positions close to the penalty spot. They're recommending a low block, which is an option. I think what I will do is drop this down to standard or maybe even low defensive line. Remember, we're going to use this in not all games, but in some games where we might be against a stronger team. So I'm going to keep tweaking away at that. I want two versions of the same tactic, but a back off version. I don't want to over panic because the original tactic, the high press one, which I know my squad can do, we won the league with it. So we were close. We just ran out of steam and we need a plan B and that was my fault. So I'm going to work on this one to be the plan B and use the data hub to make it as effective as possible. Another easy place to panic is to replace all the players, but most of them have played great. But what I will say is we're going to look at the contracts expiring now and we've got one, two, three. We've got about six or seven on the way out and there's not any of them I'm going to keep. The big loss is going to be Miguel. His loan is about to expire and we can't get him again, so he will be needed to replace. But for most of this team, they will stay. There is a couple of positions I would like to upgrade, namely the inside forward on attack. So I'm going to take him away from that position now. And the wing back as well, we're going to take him out. Everybody else is probably going to be a key nucleus of the team. We'll take our man out as well, considering he's leaving us. So you can see we've got three positions we need to fill. So don't expect a mad season like this one where we got to get in all them players. I actually really like the nucleus of the squad. I want to keep it pretty similar, especially because we're in the same league. There will be some outgoings. And we need them because if we look at the finances now, we're now over £1 million in debt. How has it got this way? If we go up to expenditure, we'll have a look at the last month. I need to see where the big outlay is coming from. And you can see player wages is 73000 Staff wages is 53000 There's not a lot we can do about that, really. What it does mean is the board have set a different type of wage budget. It's less than last season at £24,000 a week. Transfer budget is 16. We won't spend that. We'll keep all this back for agents' fees and wages, but we're going to have to run it tight. So it's another season in League of Three. We didn't get the back-to-back -back promotions. We're going to make small tweaks. Small tweaks, but that's going to be the basis of the squad. I do want to use King Abel more next season. Injuries have got a hold of him, but he's still a vital part of the squad. And I do have an alternative tactic if we can't get these two to fire. And here's a little sneak preview. It's a free at the back. It's a free at the back. I'm thinking about disregarding the wide players high up and getting a bit more solid at the back. Hopefully we don't have to use it, but it's there, it's built, it's ready. But for now we're going to pre-season. It'll be less hectic than last one, which is good because that one took me hours. Hours. And we built our tactics based on a few things from the data hub, not too much. I don't want to over panic. I can't get that across. We were good. We were good. We just ran out of steam. So all I need is a plan B for the plan A. We're going to come back firing for season three. And this is the one where we need to get promoted. But indeed, this, this is a big problem. We're just about done for pre-season and looking at the tactics screen, we've had some good success filling up those key positions that we wanted to in the pre-season transfer market. Hey, we came up against Porto for the first time in this career. It's their B team, but still, it's the first time we've met our rivals and we beat them. We spent all that time at the end of last season creating this tweaked version of the 4 2 3 one. I'm excited to see how it goes. In pre-season, it's done really well. Some big results there. 
We can disregard the one against the B team, but we look good, especially against Porto B. We look really good. I gave you a sneak preview of the signings. You can see it's far less than last season, but these are quality ones. So we've gone for quality over quantity. Francis Tony Khan is going to play on that left hand side inside forward role. A key position we didn't really nail last season. He looks good. I think he could be exceptional. A brand new commanding centre back in Elton Montero. He does miss the concentration attribute that we wanted, but everything else I think is worth the risk to get him in. And finally, Santiago Scolo Street. That's how you say it, right? He's my new winger. And for the wingers and our attribute levels, he absolutely nails it. But stop press, you will notice, transfers out. We have had 49,000 come in. Two of our clauses have been hit, which means after three seasons, part of our epic challenge to get a net transfer profit of £1 billion is underway. We're currently sitting at... Right, let's get a billion pounds into this calculator. How many zeros is it? I'm reliably informed it's nine, right? So there's a billion. We can now take off the massive player sales of 49,000, which means 999,951,000 pounds to go. So we built this new version of the tactic using the data hub at the end of last season. What it meant is we were a bit less hectic, lowering the tempo, trying to make better chances. Early days in the season, things looked to be going really well. Not only were we scoring loads, but remember the defensive problems? We've only conceded one goal so far. At this early stage, after five matches, we're back on top of this league. This league we're great at. It's the one afterwards that it went a little bit, you know. So far, so good. Now let me talk to you about those data hub changes that have made us look really good. There's a data hub and I wanted to look at some key metrics from last season that we were pretty poor at to this season we seem to be nailing. It is early days but it's very promising. A huge one is attacking efficiency. You can see where we sit there right up in this section here with aggressive shooting and clinical shooting. Last season we were over here in the wasteful shooting department. This could be down to a combination of the lower tempo, the work ball into the box and just being that bit more clinical. This ties in with the goal output, which is high scoring and impenetrable defence, which we'll get onto. Both of those things are linked to this pitch tilt. We're in a good position down here for fewer passes against in the final third, so we're defending well, they can't get through us. But we've also got lots of passes for in the final third, so we're attacking really well as well. It's a really promising start, but there are still some areas that we need to keep an eye on. We're still not great winning the ball back. We can see here the tackling, it's fewer tackles, poor tackling. It's going to be down to the fact we're dominating a lot of the ball, but I'd still like to see that up a bit. And also possession tab, if I look at possession, we're winning the ball back, but we're losing possession as well. So those two things kind of counter each other, but I just need to keep an eye on the losing possession thing. All in all, this version has started really well, really well. I've had problems in goals because not one, not two, but three of my goalkeepers got injured. At the minute, if we have a look at the tactic screen, Breno's in there injured for three weeks, back up Shastri, Three weeks, so we're going to have to bring in third choice, our boy Manu, for the next month or so. Right, so we had a quick look at Francis Khan, our new inside forward. Not traditional, because he's left-footed, so you'd think he wouldn't be able to play inside forward role too well. However, he has had a lightning start. Every game, doing stuff like this. Right foot there. And like this. Left foot. He is an absolute constant threat, getting in the right positions. He looks like he's going to be an absolutely superb pickup. First five games, five goals, two assists, an average rating of 8.10. And on the other wing, keep an eye on our boy Santiago here because he's going to be something special. Already got three assists and a really high average rating. High, high hopes. We do have some breaking news. You will notice that the Complexo Desportivo di Campania has been upgraded. It's finished. We've got a capacity of 2,000 now. I need to get us a better picture of it. There is actually no picture available, so I'm looking for one. If you do have one, let me know. But we've got a nice stadium now. It's 2,000 capacity. It's, it's classed as good. I'm still unsure why they bought it, because let's be honest, our finances are in the mud. The worst screen in the game for me at the minute. I'm not even spending any money. 1.2 million in debt. Okay, deep into the season now, we were having some big wins and some lovely football.
All in all, the first stage in Liga 3 has gone fantastically, probably even better than last time. In fact, we only lost one match all season, right at the end. We've had a terrific season, and the little tweaks we made to that tactic, remember, we didn't want to change too much, there wasn't a lot wrong, they seemed to have done the business. We made two more signings, loan signings completely free, and look at one of them. Here's the outlier, you'll notice the club, Liverpool, Rodrigo Mora, in on loan from Liverpool. Now here he is, a young player, 18 years old, his value is ridiculous, that's probably based on him being at a Premier League club though, but what's interesting about him is his history. You can see he's came from FC Porto, our big local rivals, Liverpool have bought him for 7.75, immediately loaned him to us, he started off really well with 4 assists, he's kind of a backup to Valente. A completely free loan signing with no wages, this is a fantastic move. As fun as last season's pre-season transfer window was with all 20 coming in, that's more my type of transfer window. Just a clutch of players to improve what's already a pretty good squad and I'm really happy with that. And we're top of the league. But we can't get too carried away because we were in the same position this time last season going into the playoffs and then it all just fell apart like a house of cards. So hopefully this time we've learned from it. We've had some huge standouts and the faith in Zapata, again, 13 goals in 15, a few injuries this time but still lethal. And Z Valente has had an even better season this time, 11 goals, 8 assists. So we've got the Championship group now, we're about to go into that and see if we can actually get promoted. But I just want to focus on Valente. He's our main creative force. And in the lower leagues, if you can get a player who's this good, he'll just be a standout for you. He does things in matches when we're watching this, when I'm streaming. He drops off, he finds space. The amount of passes he's doing when you watch it on Comprehensive or Extended is ridiculous. In fact, if you go to his player profile and go across to Player Analytics, this is the Tato skin, which is available now, by the way. I'll put the link down in the video description. His general performance, so as a midfielder in general, fantastic. The ones he's not great at is uh, tackling, which I'm not expecting him to be great at, and pass completion. But again, he takes the risks. He's my link, so I'm not bothered about that. Kevin De Bruyne in real life, he's similar. He goes for so many risky passes, his completion rate isn't great. So I've got absolutely no problem with, with that. And that leads us to this. The creativity in midfielders from Valente is ridiculous. He's way up there in terms of key passes, in goals, in open play expected assists, shots, it's just the all-round package and he's been a bit of an x-factor in our team so that is the takeaway from this episode if you can find yourself a proper player like that a little creative force and you can get him somewhere across that front line whether it be out wide or in the pocket like he is he's going to do some damage now if you remember we got ourselves a new head of youth development at this probably the end of season one pedro he's came in we haven't had anything yet but we have found one little nugget that he could be something tell me what you think into the development center we go and you'll notice there's no players worth noting let's not panic yet because a lot of them are really young and the one i really like is down here this is lu gu cheng now he's chinese he's only 16 on the face of it his attributes might not look great but look a bit deeper you can see he's actually a six foot six potential target forward or potentially a wide target forward to give us something a little bit different off the bench in our current financial situation in a year's time he could be what we need to accentuate this i've got him training as a target forward on attack so he focuses on those key attributes and he's a little bit weak at the minute bless his heart so i've got him strength training as well so he's hitting the weights he's eating his spinach fingers crossed on him we'll keep an eye on him Three games gone, we've started really well. We're top of the championship group. We need to finish in that top two. If we finish third, it's another playoff match, but the top two is the goal. Hopefully we don't fall away like we did last time. 11 matches to go in this Barmy league. It's tougher than it looks when you first start. So here's hoping that the tweaked version of the 4 2 3 one holds up. We haven't had to use this yet, but you never know. If it goes wrong, we will go back to it.
Right, mad couple of games there. Lost 3 6, 1 6 1. And then we won again with 4, and then we've just lost again. Problem is, as you can see by these injuries down here, and the fact more is on international duty, I am running out of players here. We then lost our next game to Amora. Don't start me on the match stats. Don't start me. Fazim next at home, and we got absolutely battered. 3 0. We're starting to bottle it again. Now we haven't won in five matches and we haven't scored in four. Two matches ago, we scored 10 in two. What is going on? Having not won in five, we now haven't lost in five. And this thumping win over Champions Trofense, Champions, somehow we're into the playoff third place. Now the problem is we've got to play a team from the higher division who are on the way down. Tricky. Mad championship group though, winning, losing, remember the league campaign again where we lost only once, we just seem to fall apart but we're there, let's see who we get in the playoffs. Okay it's Barenze, two leg game against Barenze, first game's at home, early days, didn't start great. 2-0 down after 15 minutes thanks to a penalty, rest of the match they didn't do anything, we couldn't quite get the goal back though. Second leg, I tried a different style of formation here with two inverted wingbacks. So Pata deflected, back in it. Free kick from Valente, hits the beans. Bit of a scramble, Hugo puts in, the back level. Into extra time ago, this is the 97th minute. Parenze break down the left, damn it. But we're not dead yet, 100 minutes gone. Brani Tony Khan lashes it in, it's 3-1. Which meant 3-3 on aggregate and we went to penalties. It was level all the way up. Yeah, again, we're stuck in League of Three. We don't go up. We're getting closer, but after our league campaigns, we should be making better attempts at the playoffs and we keep bottling it we keep bottling it and i need to know why so i'm going back in the data hub like we did at the end of last season and the problem is everything looks pretty okay the attacking efficiency looks good the goal output looks good the one thing the one thing that i can pick out is this is tackling we're not great fewer tackles poor tackling it makes me think are we aggressive enough are we too nice as I start looking through my team, basically I'm looking at the aggression levels there. Maybe a bit of bravery, but aggression mostly. Most of them, I've got a team of absolute nice guys. I need a Roy Keane, I need a Gattuso. I need someone who's a little bit dirty. But here we are again. What do we do this time? I've got a tactic that is comfortably winning the first part. And then for some reason, we just bottle vital parts of the championship group. Do I change tactics? What I do need to do, looking at this, is have a little bit of a mini, I hate to use the word, but rebuild, because it looks like I've got 10 to 12 players out of contract. And do you know what? They ain't good enough. We've been at this level a couple of seasons now. We're gonna freshen things up. But first, something really weird's happened. There's the Complexo Desportivo de Campania, and shout out to viewer Stevie, long-term viewer, supplying me that picture of our beautiful stadium. It's just been increased to 2,000 capacity. Brilliant, right? What is going on here? This is our fourth season we're about to go into. And for some reason, the Salgueros board have today announced an agreement for a new stadium, a brand new one. Now, I know what you're thinking. We are massively in debt, right? But look a bit closer. It does say that it's a completely grant based stadium so the council are going to own it and we're going to pay them rent eh uh, what so at the start of next season we're going to have an 8,000 seater brand new stadium we can't really be in league of three when that happens so the time is now to look at this squad and decide who's going and who's staying now i'm looking at all these expiring contracts all of these lot are going and yet yeah, that includes king abel it's been emotional but we need a new king also, my starting 11, right, who's safe? Breno, great keeper. Centre-backs, good. Right-back, yes. Now, the left-back situation, not too happy with. Vieira's just covering there, he's out. Definitely Maria. I'm going to move him across from central midfield attack. So we need a new aggressive central midfielder. You'll see a massive gap there, and this hurts. But 
Scalacci, our wonder winger, he was our best player last season. There he is, 10 goals, 16 assists in 31 matches, an average rating that broke the record in the league. We can't re-sign him, we've got literally no money to get him, he's going back to Argentina. Which means we need a new right winger to go in there. So I make it, three definite starters and at least 7 or 8 bench players. We're looking at about 10 to 11 players in the off-season. Now I've offered a contract to Marco Cruz, he's at Sporting CPB's team. That's the sort of level we're going to look at. So we're going to think of elite teams, Benfica, Sporting, not Porto, not Porto. And we're going to go to their B teams and see who's out of contract, the youngsters. So this is my recommendation to you, get yourself over to the B teams of these big teams, they release loads of youngsters, drop down to contract, sort it by expiring, you can see, this is where we found Marco Cruz, he's about to get released, he's a 6 foot central midfielder who can also play wing back, what a play he's going to be, fingers crossed we can get him, but then go up to the league table that's sporting CP, B team, play in, drop it down to league and you can see all the teams down there, and do the same gig, we'll check Benfica next. Go to their B team, all players, sort it by expiring and you can see there's a clutch of players down here, 8 or 9, that are about to get released who we could possibly jump in and get. And here's another one we've gone for, Rodrigo Marquez also at Sporting. Now the benefit of this is that obviously the free transfers, the young, but the selling value is going to be way up there. So I'm going to look to fill the gaps now with these youngsters because I've got a good nucleus of more experienced players now with Valente, Khan, Maria. Get some youngsters in that we can own and then maybe one or two elite youngsters like we got from Liverpool. Surely that'll get us over the line. But we keep failing at this stage, so there's got to be something wrong. So what I've done, I've decided to find yet another plan B with the tactics. Now we use this one right through the season. I'm going to start working on a new one. It could be this, a bit of a flat version because we conceded too many goals in that championship group. So I might drag Valente back a bit, change that role somewhat, but go for a flat three perhaps. Got an experiment in pre-season. You'll also notice behind him, he's got two inverted wing backs. So the plan is here, that they'll jump in here, sit something like that. My two attacking midfielders will bomb on. And depending what role we do here, he can run the game. So whilst we're not panicking, we're just going to tweak it a bit further. I'm toying with this. We'll probably go back to the other formation, but I need a viable plan B. Oh, by the way, there's one last bit of news I think you'll be interested in. Just like we had a load of players out of contract, we had a load of staff out of contract too. So I kept most of them, but I did one big change. Not to worry, Umbo and Penza is very definitely still my chief scout. But ladies and gents, we have a new director of football. And you might recognise this guy. The icon. Diego. He's back. Okay, into season four we go, and we've got some big transfers to show you. All to fit into this tactic, which turns into a 2-2-6, but more of that later. Like we said we were going to, we raided Sporting CP's B team, and picked up Marco Cruz, who's going to be a fantastic player in midfield or wingback, João Asenseo, and Rodrigo Marquez. South America for a new backup striker in Cowway from RB, and potentially the signing of the summer, Elvis. Elvis Balde, he's going to play down the right wing. Yet again, zero spent, but if you look above my head, there's some traumatic news. That's right, day one at Jean-Pierre Zapata. He's left us. He's gone to Amadora, who have triggered his release clause. They paid 120000 for him. That's the biggest fee we've received yet. So what it does mean is it does help us a little bit in the £1 billion mission, but it's going to hurt us a bit in the quest to get up the leagues as well. Gutted with that one. We've acted quickly and got two players to replace him. One of them is Miro. Not that one, this one. This is Miro. He's 23-year-old. For an all-around striker, he's probably better than Zapata probably better he's bigger he's better in the air he's quicker it's only on loan from Boa Vista but for a season so we toyed with this at the end of the last season the 4-3-3 should we use it well we've used it we're about five or six games into the season when we've gone with it and it's working really well Balde down this side Can down this side two pacey wingers striker up front Miro who's started really well and then attacking midfield three with these two jumping in here creating the the cover so they can bomb on lovely stuff we find ourselves in a familiar position of top of the pre-group, which means nothing to us because that's what we always do. But I've seen signs that we're looking better. We're not conceding many, we're scoring just as many. I like the way this tactic's looking. It's going to be available for patrons now. If you're in the Patreon, you've got it 
in your homepage. I was asked about this on another video. Have you had any job offers yet? Because you've done reasonably well. Thanks for that comment. And we have. The first one that came in was Santa Clara, but the recent one is here. Estoril Playa have offered us a job interview. And if you look at these guys, these are a top division team. So if I was doing a traditional save, I might be tempted by that, but I'm not leaving Salgueros. There was also an offer from Aruka for a job interview as well. I'm really sorry if I've mispronounced that. And Aruka, Arusa, they're also in the top division. So our stock is rising. Our squad is a bit light, especially in fullback areas. So what I'll really like to do, and this is a takeaway from this episode, is retrain defensive midfielders into inverted wingbacks. For me, they are the perfect combination. Now, you can see his attributes are on the way down at the minute because I've just started to retrain him. So he's been used to be a defensive midfielder, but now he's going for a complete new position. If you look at his pitch map there, it's a tiny, tiny, what is going on here kind of shout, makeshift. We're going to work on that, and we're going to do that by retraining him and playing him in that position when we can. If you look at the training tab, for example, I've got him inverted wing back on defend, and instantly the attributes highlighted, you can see them. And look at them. He's a defensive midfielder, but they all work really well. He's not going to need acceleration and pace in that role because he's going to be sitting in the defensive midfield zone. Importantly, he's still good in the defensive areas, such as his marking, his positioning, his decision, and his concentration. I think he'll end up being a really good player. At the minute, his attributes are on the way down because he's learning it, but we'll stick with it and we'll see what happens as the season progresses. It usually takes about a season to get it to be that bright green down here, so he's completely comfortable. So Hugo Morales is the starter in that position, but in games I think we're going to win and we're comfortable, I'm going to slot him in there so he can learn the role or simply bring him on off the bench. Visiting the Data Hub, early stage of the season, we had a bit of worries about tackling, didn't we? Now, if you look at tackling now, we have moved our way up. So things are improving. Things are improving. We were way down here, way down here, but we are now on the way up. This is a good sign, especially when all the other metrics are pretty much where we want them to be. Yes, here we are. It's January, and guess what? Yet again, we've finished top of the first stage. We've lost three times this time, but I'm actually happier with the way the team's playing. We're not peaking too early. Different style of play. Very much like a lower league wish.com version of Man City, I like to think. But we're winning, and it's into the playoffs now. That's been my team of choice. Do you know what? I haven't changed the formation once. Once. You'll notice a lot of goals there were from Miro. Man, what a signing he's been. It's safe to say we haven't missed a pattern. Miro's came up now with 11 stats, 17 goals, with the pace of Valde on the right, who's electric, and the same goes for Tony Khan on the left. Miro's getting all sorts of goals and loads of headers, which is new this year. New kind of role for Volante this year is had a more of a chill back, sit back role. He's more like a Rooney when he was at Man United and he dropped back into midfield in the later days. That's what Valente has done for us, linking things nicely. He has two runners either side of him in Cruz and Morea. They do the legwork and he ends up sitting back. It says advanced playmaker, but you'll be surprised when these two come inside like this and sit into the defensive midfield zone, these two end up going up here and he kind of floats in between just dictating traffic. It's beautiful. So the only big change we've done and it's really helped is if the opposition have a weak fullback. So they've got a weak fullback, say, down the left side. What I'll do is, I'll have a look at these two. At the minute, they're on opposite sides. So Cruz is left-footed, but I like him on the right. But if they've got a weak right-back, I'll move Cruz over there, because he's completely left-footed, to combine with Khan, and I'll change him into a Mazala on attack, and we'll overload that side and try and punish them. That's worked really well when they've got weak full-backs. When they don't, and it's normal, we just play normal, set them midfields on attack. So halfway through the playoff situation, things are going a lot better this time. Lots better. You can see we're second, we're in the automatics, and we've only conceded seven. This has been our bugbear. We keep conceding, but we've only conceded seven. Now, you might have recognised a scorer there who was a little bit of a blast from the past. Here's the team at the minute. Same formation. You can see how well they're starting to play together. But there's a couple of additions that we got on transfer deadline day, and they are great ones. The first, he's back. He's back. Miguel Contanescu. 
Yeah, him. He's back. And do you know what? He was a free transfer. He was just lying around free. He got released by Vizela. You remember his amazing season he had with us? But since then, he had a bit of time in Portugal too. Released, came back to us. He's played seven times, two goals, two assists. Completely free transfer. Wage is pretty decent. Happy to have him back. He's been valuable. Now, how's about this? This is Craig Nelson. I've got him in on loan for free from Manchester City. Now, I won't often say this, but a centre-back as a game-changer, well, he could be it. He could be it. He's a massively, massively improved player from what we've got. He's only 19. He's going to take a little while to bed in, but he's six foot six. He's a ball-playing defender. I don't even know how we pulled this off. In fact, I'll tell you how I pulled it off. I just chanced it. I chanced it. I, was, I needed a centre-back. We had loads of injuries, and the other two weren't playing great. So I went over to Man City, and I thought, give us a little look at your B team. What have you got? I literally went into their under-21 squad and noticed who was on loan, and I just put a bid in for Craig Nelson. They didn't ask for anything. And unbelievably to me, not only did they accept, but he agreed. So that's meant this side here are actually really solid. Now, he's next to Roman Reigns Correa as a natural left footer. Six for six. I'll also shout our boy Vieira. He's a day one of Vieira. I had no hopes for him this season. Kind of disregarded him. I couldn't find the left back at the start of the season. He's now pretty much started every match 24 times and his average rating is 7.06. He's playing really well. I need his attributes to rise. I'm going to focus a bit of his training a bit. Try and get him up a standard, but still. So that stunning run down there, five wins on the spin. Overall, great display in terms of defence this time. Means, crew, we've finally done it. There's a big P next to our name. We're promoted. What a time, what a time. They've finally done it. Do you know what? This formation has done the trick. I did not think it'd work. Trying to be aggressive, but keep the ball, lower tempo. But it has, it's done really well. This man jumping into advanced playmaker because our boy Valente got himself an injury. He's covered in superbly well. Miro. What can I say? 24 appearances, 27 goals. We must get him next season. We must. Now, we do have one more match. It's against Vazim. Now, if you look at the league table, you guessed it, they are second. So if we draw or win, we will be champions for our first trophy, if you like. That match will be at the end of the episode. So stay tuned to that to see if we can do it. For now, we need to do our squad planning thing. The way we do that, we need to remember the attribute level for next season that we're going to be working at. So next season, we're going to be in the second division, one off the top tier. I'm going to be looking for key attributes in the range of 13 to 15. So for example, for a central midfielder, normally in the lower leagues, I'll just look for the free passing vision work rate. Now, when we go up a bit more, I'm going to look for a little bit more range there between that 13 to 15. So a better quality of player is needed. So as we always do at the end of the season, we'll have a look at the team and see who will be able to play in the division above. Now, I'm happy with the front three. Miro's not a certainty because he's not our player, but fingers crossed. In midfield, Cruz, great. Sambu's just filling in at the minute. So in his position will be Vasco Morea, and he will comfortably start. Same with Valente for... So the midfield five and the strikers, the five there, no problem at all. Now, at the back, Breno's 100% staying. I think he'll be our keeper for as long as we can keep him. Left back, I love Vieira, but... The next stage is going to be too much for him, so we'll take him out. Right back, he's still learning the role. That's our defensive midfielder, so he'll be on the bench. Now, centre-backs are interesting because Nelson came into the club and he was class. He built into the role. He ended up with a 7.27 and definitely helped us get them clean sheets. But we won't be able to keep him next season, so he's going to need to be replaced. Possibly Correa as well. At the minute, we'll give him a chance. So three starters. And looking at the bench situation, I'm happy with about seven of them. So I'd probably like another five or six on the bench. So we're looking at between eight and nine new players to get in. If if we can keep that man, Miro, as well. Tactically, I'll run with that for the first part of the season. We are going up a division, so there's going to be better teams. So we'll just weigh it up. We just need to survive next season. So we're going to start with that. Now, the other thing we need to do is tie some players down. For example, Breno, who I'm convinced is a top flight goalkeeper in the making his contract runs out at the end of next season but also in his contract details you can see his minimum fee release clause is only 200,000 
I need to up that at least double to scare some teams off because he is elite. There's about four or five players like that that we need to re-sign. Anyway, we'll think about that later. For now, it's time to go against Farzim and see if we can claim this title. Here we are then, it's a new league, which brings new kit, and of course that brand new spanking, beautiful 8,000 seater new stadium. Now many people, including myself, think we brought Diego Valante back just as purely a romantic thing, right? Not so, he came up trumps when I asked him about a player. I went to the transfer screen, I asked my director of football, Diego Valante, suggest me some targets, namely a free transfer striker. And what he came up with was Davy Selk, a 32-year-old German. I've seen this guy around in previous FMs. He's been around the Bundesliga for ages. He's just going to be a bit of a class act at this level. Six foot five, mentals for days, physical player. He's been a decent scorer at Bundesliga level with double figures here and there. So I think at this level, he could be a bit of a bargain. So a real nice clutch of players down here. Miguel Alves from Sporting's B team. Ivan Pavlic from the high division. Looks like a really good all-round midfielder him. Vasco Oliveira in that centre-back. He's got the right attribute range. Remember that attribute range? Now check out Luca Fletcher. He's an Englishman. I didn't want to bring too many Englishmen in, but I couldn't resist this one. He's formerly of Man City. Finishing's there. Off the balls there. Really quick and great in the air at six foot two. There's Davy Selk. Now under him, we've gone back to South America for Ian Lucas. The main reason I went for him was because he's a Brazilian called Ian. But other than that, he's six foot one. He's only 24. Sell on value could be there. Now, probably my star signing is Hugo Felix from Benfica's B team. Didn't make the breakthrough. They released him. He's 23. Attributes for days. He's going to be like the heir apparent to Valente. So he's going to be his apprentice, if you like. And then on stream, someone told me this. I don't know why I didn't put two and two together, but told me this on stream. It blew my mind. We go to information down here. His brother, Tony Zhao Felix. The plan is, the plan is, in four or five years. Let's reunite them at Salgueros. So the tactic is going to be the same as last season's because it did so well. And I want to give most of the players that got us up a chance because I do think most of them are good enough. The only changes in there is in the centre-back because he's taken the place of the player we lost on loan. Same deal for the striker. Selke goes up front instead of Miro. So this was a bit of a mad pre-season. I was lining up, got my friendlies ready. We had a decent early big win. But then after just one pre-season friendly, we were straight into the League Cup. It was literally right in the start of July. We got through the first round against Fazella, but unfortunately got knocked out in the second phase away to Boa Vista, local rivals, but they are a top division team and we put up a good fight. So we're all set for a big season here. The media predictions got us 13th. I think we're going to finish 13th out of the 18. And do you know what? I would snap our hands off for that. A nice season of consolidation. That'd be lovely. Into the first games of the season now. We had a bit of a dream start. 52 minutes gone against Lyra. In it goes and Seke scored on his debut. However, the rise up is starting to bite us already because they came back at us, they came back at us. And we lost our first game in our new stadium 3-1. Second game of the season, 93rd minute. Vizella steal it, and I mean steal it, we battered them. So this is a bit of a new situation for us. We're usually dominating at the start of the season, but now, two losses out of two and we've conceded six. No need to panic. Next home match, Fletcher got off the mark, bang. Belting 4 0 win. However, that was followed up by a 4 1 defeat at home. Hmm. Then, on paper, a really tough looking away game to Maritimo. I'm not quite sure what happened, but we scored five. And then, in our next match at home to Santa Clara, we scored another five. And then got battered. And immediately got our revenge in the cup. This team is just blowing my mind. Right, Barmy starts the season. We win, we lose, we win, we lose. There's goals all over the place. I can't keep track. And we're randomly into the Tacadie Portugal fourth round. In the league, we're sitting 14th. 
It's not looking great. We'd scored 24 times in 11 matches, which is fantastic. But we'd also conceded 25, which is not good. This led to an epic deadline day. With the team struggling in defence a bit, I somehow managed to get Nelson back on loan for Man City, costing around two grand a week, but still, what a result. And while I was there, in the Man City under-21s, I grabbed Harrison Parker as well, another centre-back. So I managed to do that on deadline day, and what a difference that's going to make. I've got two really good centre-backs now. They are really young and raw, but we needed a change, conceding too many goals. But when you look at that team, you can see why we concede goals, can't you? At the end of the day, we've got three attacking midfielders there. Two central midfielders on attack and an advanced playmaker. Although he does drop deep thanks to the whole position, but it's still really attacking. Now, if you look a bit further back, both of my fullbacks, they are literally midfielders. Jao has been retrained and he's now pretty much, pretty much a natural in that position. In Cruz, it was always the plan for him to play in that position. Came in as a midfielder, but now I've got really good midfielders. He drops back. So we've basically got two midfielders playing fullback. So in essence, in that entire team, I've got two defenders. So look, we're in a bad run in the league, but check it out. Check out our next three matches, will you? Have a little look at that. Next up is the first derby of this save. It's FC Porto B team in the league. But after that, wouldn't you just know it, in the Taca de Portugal fourth round, we've only gone and drawn FC Porto. If we survive that somehow, we've then got to play SL Benfica B. We've got three of the biggest matches coming up and we're on our worst run since we started this entire career. So a rough few games, but that Benfica draw actually meant we'd not won in the league in eight. Definitely our worst run since we started this save, but it was a bit of a building block. Now I looked at the data hub and there was some things that we could change to help things. So look at this, this was the XG table a couple of matches ago and you can see position 14, expected points position that we should have got with chances missed, etc. Hit. So something wasn't quite right. We're creating loads of chances, we just weren't finishing them off and leaking too many. So I had two big things to address there. The fact that we're not scoring goals even though we should be and the fact we conceded too many. Now the goal scoring thing. I had a little look at it and I've got an advanced forward there in Fletcher. Wingers either side, central midfielders bombing on. There's loads of movement around him. So then I thought to myself, why am I asking him to move all over the place? So all I've done is simply I've changed him to a poacher. Now the other thing I've done, I don't want to get rid of this attacking flow we've got with these three. I've got every confidence in these two jumping in, into there like that, sorting it out. So the other thing I changed was a team instruction, just to maintain our shape when we're out of possession. I'll just pop these two back there. This is the initial one, and this is now very, very slight changes. In fact, the only changes are Poacher from advance forward and out of possession, I've dropped the press. I've dropped it right back now, so we don't press all over the place getting out of position. The, what I was seeing was this man or this man was chasing the ball everywhere trying to press it. Now we get back into shape and it's helped with this run of results on both ends of the pitch. So we just won two five goal wins on the spin. And then this one against the team who are third in the league, we're focusing through the middle, look at this football. Absolute thumping, those little changes have meant that the squad have just burst into life. From eight without a win till six without defeat. We're sitting mid-table now, it looks a lot more comfy with 24 points. This is the other area I like to look at when I'm conceding an absolute ton of goals. I go to conceding like that. I'll break it down for the last 10 matches or so. And what I saw from assists was the through balls were killing us. They were killing us. So that contributed to me adding trap outside to force people out and that less pressing to get us back in shape. Now, terrible news, Francis Tony Khan is out for the season. Snapped his cruciate ligament. 
Ruthlessly, I acted quickly, thanks to Umbo and Penza again coming up front with Samuel Bamba. Now, his pedigree is, not only does he hit the attribute range we're looking for, but his former club was Dortmund, and you know their pedigree for bringing up talents. High hopes for him. He's just joined. He's already started pretty well. So about halfway gone, now my plan is, if we get safe at some point, then I'm going to think about what am I going to do for next season, if I'm going to change the tactic. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to bring it in with about 10 matches to go. It's also January in game, so it's time to create a nice recruitment focus in which we're going to eye up contract status. I'm going to look for expiring in six months' time because with our finances, next season, it's going to be free transfers again. Hugo is on it and so are the team. We are now 10 matches unbeaten. So, brother of Shao Felix, Hugo, absolutely on it. Last five matches, four goals, two assists, 7.88. Them little tweaks we made to the tactic continue to hold up, despite the fact the two centre-backs who play at Man City and the basically roommates hate each other. We're nicely sat in 11th now, but if you look a bit closer, right? Third is only five points off us now. This league is super tight. I was going to experiment with the tactic, but not yet. Now, it is deadline day, and I've just rejected a... Awful offer from Augsburg from Marco Cruz at 215,000. Now, he does not have a release clause, so I can play hardball here. But if you look a couple of tabs up, they're coming back. So after I rejected that move, he wasn't happy, and we agreed that if we get an offer of 1.3 million, we'll accept it. So now, Augsburg, it's over to you, and... 475. Not a bad offer. Especially when you consider our long-term goal, but I just think at 23 years old... I think we can hold out for more than half a million, so I'm going to swiftly reject that, and Marco can't argue. I guess it's a good sign that big top division teams are coming for our players. They're coming for me as manager, and now they're coming for the players. Now now we're keeping Marco Cruz, and the tactic's kind of working. I want to make it better. How can we do that? We can make our players better by chucking in some traits. So this is something I'd normally do in pre-season, but to be totally honest with you, I kind of forgot, and now I've assessed my players, I know who I want to start developing a bit further. We'll start with Cruz. He's going to be staying with us for a while. So what I've done, I've gone through the training, and you can see I've asked to go for killer balls often. He's got the passing, he's got the vision, and from that deep area he's going to be in the pitch in the inverted wingback role, that could be a nice trait. Striker Luca Fletcher, who is smashing the goals in, by the way. Now you look at him, he's got finishing at 15, acceleration and pace, no traits. So... Over to his development, and we've got likes to try to beat offside trap, which for a striker like him would be perfect. We didn't stop there. Elvis Balder, who I expect to be on the right-hand side for many seasons to come, he provides us width, so I'm asking him to hug that touchline. How about Konstantinescu? Now listen, his average rating of 7.46 is actually the best in the league at the minute. He's less of a winger. I see him more eventually coming inside, so I've got him to come deep to get the ball. I see him like a bit of a playmaker. The main man, Felix, he's a class above. Get the ball to your feet, my lad. So like I said, I normally do that in pre-season, but the fact that, for me, this is a bit of a foundation season to attack next season, now seems like a perfect time, and I should have it by the start of next season. Other than the Marco Cruz bid, a nice quiet transfer deadline day with just a fringe player leaving on a free transfer. I told you, it's not just the players that I wanted. This is Rayo Vallecano. A quick look at them, and we'll see that they are actually in La Liga. They are struggling down in 18th. It's got to be a thanks, but no thanks for that one. So back to the league, we're excited for the run to continue. We're absolutely flying, remember. 10 undefeated. In the 10th minute, he did that. He nearly killed the man. I mean, what is he thinking? 80 minutes with 10 men, we lose that game 4-2. Proved to be an absolute momentum killer. We lost the next one. And the next one. I know, the corners, right? The corners. And in the 90th minute, we were denied the win. In the next one, meaning we hadn't won in four. Undefeated in 10. Can't win in four, mate. Total momentum killer. That's probably happened to you a lot as well. What we have to do for the next match against Chavez, we got a 3-2 win and we absolutely ground it out. When you go into a bad one like that, you've just got to grind a win out, I think. And we've got it back into some sort of form. But those glimmer of hopes that we had of a potential sneaky third place finish have kind of gone now. We're on 41 points and third place is 52. So 11 points to get back in eight matches is probably not going to happen. So we're going to experiment now till the end of the season to try and see if we can get a plan in place 
season six. So I'll have a look at new tactics in a minute, but just to let you know that we are in financial peril. 2.5 million in debt now. Okay, two and a half million in debt, right? Now let me show you this. If I type in take over, okay? Top corner, take over. Ready? This has been the season. Look down this side. So, 13th of March, could be close on the rocks. Could be close on the rocks. And yet again, for the last six games, we did have an experiment. We tried a little Christmas tree and we also tried a bit of a 4 2 4. However, that Derby Day demolition of Porto was the only bright spot and we didn't really find half blow. Back to the drawing board. So I'm going to disregard those. I just didn't feel right. The team didn't look right playing it. So what I'll probably do is we'll have a look at the end of the season, how we can improve the base tactic because it was absolutely flying at one point and just got derailed by that red card. So we'll probably just work on that and see how we can improve it. But big news. So it actually happened. We've been taken over. So we've got a new owner now. Antonio's gone, and this is our new owner. Gives a little message there. There were no plans to change the transfer policy, which, do you know what, I'm not that mad about. I didn't want a big sugar daddy, so to speak. But what he has done is, he's wiped the debt. So now we're comfortable. So hopefully that doesn't affect things too much. Club vision's kind of stayed the same. He wanted to become an established league Portugal 2 team. And if you look through the seasons, he's pretty realistic. Pretty realistic. So touch wood, looks like we've got ourselves a sensible owner. Okay, our first season in Liga 2 is over. We finished 10th, so top 10. It's not quite halfway because there's only 18 teams in the league, but I'm quite happy with that, especially the way we started, but also a bit disappointed because we really picked up a bit of steam. Now, if you look a bit closer at it, we finished 10th. 70 goals, which is more than two a match, by the way, but we also conceded 60, and we need to sort that out, otherwise we're never getting promoted. So now Fort's turn to season six plan and how we can improve his tactic and improve that position now. We have got some future transfers incoming. Miro, do you remember him? The goal machine is coming on a free transfer. So that scouting for contract expiring, Miro's on the way. There's a striker who's going to be great backup. We've got Noah Cooper who's going to be back up to Edison. I'm always worried about Breno, someone coming in for him. So there's a Jamaican goalkeeper on his way. And we've got ourselves an absolute unit of a centre-back if I just need to throw someone on to defend some headers. Rafa Fernandez incoming, all of them free. So we scored 70, but we conceded 60. And the reason I don't want to change the formation is if you look above my head there, this is the formations we've faced in our previous 50 matches. And look at the clear cut chances column. We are fantastic on all of them other than 442 Diamond. So it's just a case of getting the chances and keeping them out, and we're going to be absolutely fine. Now, the next thing to look at is conceded. We hit this tab here. We can see the last 10 matches, but I'm not interested in that. I'm going to go big time, the last 40 matches, so that's going to cover the whole season. We'll go to the assists tab, and now you can see here, there's one massive outlier there, isn't there? 29 assists by through ball. 29. So what that means is, when we're giving the ball away, there's too much room in this sort of pocket there. So there's a few things we can do here. I'm going to have a little think about it. Obviously, the biggest one, the most obvious one, is to change one of these roles to the sit a bit more. But I don't want to lose any of the attacking edge. So whether it's going to be defensive line, a role change in the defenders, maybe a stopper. Lots to think about. Now this is a nice positive thing. New two-year contract from our new board. Let's go. Easy decisions here. Two years. No problems. So with the faith of a new contractor for it, now's the perfect time to ask for that new coaching course because at the minute I'm stuck on Continental B. And despite being in the off-season with no training, they have refused our coaching course yet again. Which, when you look at our overall record of 176 games played with a win percentage of 54%, I'm a little bit annoyed, I won't lie. We all agree, we all agree that I need to change something. Something probably in these midfield areas because despite their beautiful link-ups, the way they're all enjoying having dinner with each other, the chemistry. We are just conceding too many through balls. So these guys are just not doing enough of the dirty stuff. So we love Volante. At this level, beautiful creative player. But in midfield, you need a bit of steel. So I thought, let's have a look at each midfielder and have a look at their defending 
how it's gone through the season. So this is Zay Valente's defensive output as a midfielder. You, know, you can see the blue is his output and the white is the average. The only thing he does more than anyone else is foul, probably because he's not great at tackling. If you look, his interceptions per 90 minutes is down. Tackles win ratio is actually not that bad, but the attempted's not there. The clearances aren't there. There's no blocks going on. This is where the problems kind of stem. We'll have a look at the other two mainstays in midfield. Hugo Felix, probably even worse, actually. Probably even worse. He's getting no clearances. He's not getting back, basically. He's not winning any headers in that midfield area. He's not attempting any tackles, and he's not doing many interceptions either. Now, probably the most rounded of the midfielders is Vasco Morea, and he is a little better. In fact, his tackles attempted is up there. He's doing most of that work. His ratio one is decent, but again, not many interceptions because he's in that advanced role, and clearances, non-existent. Headers, a little bit better, but still lacking overall. Now look, that's not their primary goal. They are creative players, so they're not expecting themselves to come back and defend. But when we don't have a midfielder of that type in there, we need a bit more. Basically, Felix and Valente offer nothing in defending situations. This is Ian. He comes on in defensive midfield, more like a defensive playmaker rather than Valente when Valente gets tired. And you can see the difference overall. He just does a little bit more. He's not on the pitch long, so he's not going to attempt as many tackles. But interceptions are there. And blocks are there. He's a bit more defensive. It's a bit of food for thought. I'm going to lock down that tactic a bit later on. I'm going to lock it down and we're going to get set for season six. For now, we need to rebuild this squad and decide what players are going to stay for next season. As we always do, we'll take a look at the starting 11 here and we're going to remove players that will not be involved next season to give us a nice reminder and stay fresh in our head of the type of players we're going to have to find. Now, we'll start from the back. Breno is outstanding. One of the best goalkeepers in the league. Now, the two centre-backs, we have a problem here. Because they're both from Man City, both on loan, both will not extend, so we're going to have to remove both from position. We know about the qualities of Marco Cruz, he stays. Now on the other side, Jao Asensio has been okay, but if we think about our levels, our attribute levels, he's right on the border, so I'm going to see if I can find a slightly better player than Jao. So I'm going to remove him and place him on the bench. Felix and Maria, great players, they stay in midfield. On wide, we've got Balde and Konstantinescu, he's going to rotate with hopefully a return in Tony Khan. No need to change there. And Fletcher. Fletcher up front scored 12 goals in the league, 14 overall. His value is starting to rocket. His attributes on the way up. He's only 21. Outstanding. He's definitely our starting striker next season. Which means now we're looking at something like four players for the starting 11. And the bench, we're going to improve that as well. But four players from the starting 11 is not too bad for a mini rebuild, is it? In fact, if you look at the bench, I've got... 12 players there, I'm happy to keep hold of there. It's 12 players, so that's not bad. And bear in mind, we've got a couple of players coming in, so we don't have to do as much transfer business. We can really focus in on the starting 11. And there are the three players coming in. The keeper in Noah Cooper, backup. Rafael Fernandez, defender, which will probably start him. And Miro as the rotational striker with Fletcher. Pre-season friendlies are underway and some decent transfer business, again, spending zero. First off, we had to get Selke off our wage bill. A really good player, but he was earning £6,000 a week. We managed to cash in for about 25000 But more importantly, who's came into the club? We knew about Fernandez coming in on a free transfer for centre-back. Miro up front will replace Selke in that rotation with Fletcher. And Noah Cooper, who's a very good backup to Breno. How about Kevin Ortiz, formerly of Bournemouth? If you look at his mentals, you can see why I've bought him. Aggression, bravery, leadership, teamwork, work rate, determination. He's a little bit nasty. Mateus Serrara is a Brazilian in on loan from Santa Clara. I can't believe they let us have him. Now he's a midfielder, but for me, he's perfect at playing that inverted wing-back role. He's a little upgrade. He's going to start on the right. Tedan Menji is a centre-back, formerly of Manchester United. Luton spent some time in Africa. We've brought him back. Nice signing. He'll start centre-back. Now, a sneaky little signing that Umbo and Penza found me from the Spanish lower divisions, a free transfer. This is Antonio Capellas. Now, he looks like Andrea Perlo, and when you look at his attributes, he kind of mimics him as well with the passing, with the technique, decent vision, decisions. He's also quite a big player at six foot one, going to be good in defensive situations. This guy at 20 years old could be something special. So I'm really happy with the summer rebuild. I've got some decent players now and I've slotted them into the team and that's where the starting 11 will probably look. You can see the two new centre-backs. We go through centre-backs like crazy. I'm hoping these two will stay a bit and be a bit of a mainstay. We do have a backup if we need it. 
in on loan from Serbian football in the amazingly named Cornelius van der Heyden. He's going to be back up until they recall him. But we do have two coming in in January from South America. And that's vital because our long-term goal of generating money and replacing with South American players, I feel like these two can do a bit of both. Last season, we got some players late on. We learned that you can get players late on. Well, these guys are coming in in January, so they'll be primed for the second half of the season. Two centre-backs, both from Brazilian football. First one is Cal Luiz. That was only 22. High hopes for him. We'll give him a face. We'll give him a face. And the second one is Chao Amaral. Again, 24 years old, but he looks like he could just walk straight into the team. So this was all about getting a tactic that didn't stifle our creative flow and the goals, but getting a bit more sturdy at the back. And this is what we're going to go with for season six. Now, there are very slight changes, but there are some changes that could be significant. Now, if we look down at the back first, I'm going to adopt a cover centre-back with a no-nonsense centre-back because that will tie in with a new higher defensive line. We're going to push up a little bit more and squeeze the space. That should be helped by the fact that I'm having an inverted fullback rather than a wingback on one side so he won't go as far up. And on the other side, my inverted wingback will drop in there and he'll be next to and joined by our new more defensive player, a defensive deep-lying playmaker in Capellas. I say defensive because quite often I might drop him to defend. But he's going to sit in there rather than bomb on a bit like the old advanced playmaker did. There's also a slight change to the midfielders. I'm going to ask Felix to go into a Mazala role. May change that, but early days I'm going to try it. And Maria, instead of being on attack, I'm just going to ask him to drop to support so he can help out a little bit more in defence because he is good at that, a good all-round midfielder. Other key changes in transition, we're going to lose the counter press. When we get the ball, we're going to drop into a regroup, get ourselves back into position, specifically these three midfielders. I felt like when we had counter press on, they were chasing the ball and that's where some gaps were getting left. So we're going to combine the regroup with the higher defensive line, with the change of roles in midfield. I'm hoping that'll do the business. I use preseason to try a load of different things. There's a load of different results there. You can see the League Cup against Firenze. They are the favourites for the league. So to get beat 4-3 was not a disaster and I hadn't settled on a formation yet. As we've gone down, there's some, been some decent performances. But I'm kind of set on this. One change we can do is, if this isn't working with a midfield playmaker, we can always bring on our destroyer and go... Here he is, Kevin Ortiz. We can always bring him on and get a defensive midfielder in. Or if we're trying to hold on to a lead, I'm going to explore with a more traditional 4-3-3 and drop him in there and try an anchor man role, maybe. What I do have, though, and which is why I'm going to go for a higher defensive line with a cover defender, is I've got two centre-backs who are pretty pacey. He's got acceleration and pace of 14 and 15, and Fernandez has got a top-line pace of 14 as well. So I think it's worth a shot. I think it's worth a shot while sticking with our principles of the lower-tempo passing football. So that was our first clutch of games. So far, so good. Promotion favourites, Forenze just came and got absolutely put to the sword. Look at our XG, look at our possession. We even missed a penalty. Really good so far. So there's the start to the season, our first five matches. Not bad at all, not bad. Has us sitting second, long way to go. But the best thing is we're not conceding an absolute ton of goals. They're still going in, but it looks a bit more solid. First five matches, we've scored 12, conceded six. If that carries on, I'd be more than happy. Because don't forget, last season we conceded 60. <laughs> so it's better, it's better. That's the way we're going to set the team out. I like the counter regroup combo. I like the slower tempo that we've done right the way through. I've started the youngster in all five matches. I wasn't going to, but I just think he looks class. Now I've started his training as well. The things he's going down in are his penalties, free kicks and his corners. I'm not interested in that anyway. I don't need him taking them. Now he's training. We've got him doing agility and balance just to make him a more all-round player. 
stick into that deep line playmaker role. I'm telling you, it's Andrea Perlo, Mark II, with the hair. I will point out that now Sporting got promoted last season, so now we have four B teams in this league. And remember, those four B teams cannot get promoted. So that basically means we're in a little mini league of 14, because the four can't go up. Yeah, so that good start to the season, yeah, it's kind of backfired a bit. As you can see there, the good start to the season was kind of squashed by a really iffy patch here. Something wasn't quite right. But thankfully, our boy Capellas, one for the future, is now very much one for the now. Thanks to this man, I changed the formation again. I know, I know. And that meant we started to piece together some decent results with Capellas in his new role. It kind of unleashed a bit more attacking force. So after that latest tweak, we've had a decent run of results now. I'll show you the latest tweak to the tactic, and it makes us go into somewhat of a 3-2-5. This Salgueros ride has been a bit of a journey, because we've already had a tactic that went into a 2-2-6, and not forgetting the original 2-3-5. That's right, we've done the 2-2-6, we've done the 2-3-5, how about the 3-2-5? So what happens is, we've got ourselves a halfback now, it looks like a traditional 4-3-3, but in motion... Capellas drops in here all the time, and these two jump in here, like this. And with these two bombing on, that's the way the team looks at the minute. It's quite nice. So hopefully you can see it here. We've got the ball now, and look how deep our halfback Capellas drops. So deep. I've got a player instruction of take more risks because he's got a good passing brain. But you can see there, that's the centre backs. In between him, we have Capellas. So we've got centre back one, centre back two, half back, and then in front of them, there's our two full backs which is why we always want our fullbacks to be midfielders. And in front of those, you've got the five across the front. Different take on what we've been doing, and it's working quite well. So Capellas has gone from being our new Perlo to our new Rodri, and he's got the physicals to match up, to be honest, so we might have something here. So despite having a defensive midfielder now, it's actually more of an aggressive tactic because whenever a halfback drops back in there, it encourages the wingback to go up further. So by dropping him back, I've actually dropped these two to support from defence. So they're a bit more aggressive, believe it or not. With the decent form in the league, came some more job offers. How about Girona from La Liga? And even Brentford from the Premier League? It's because we're sat in third position at the minute and there's only like 13 matches to go, something like that. Defensively, we've been way better. We've conceded 28 and 21, but remember last season we conceded 60. And in this league, nobody keeps clean sheets. You can see the best defensive record is 22, for example. But we're still banging goals in. We're still the top goal scorers in the league with that halfback tactic. And remember last season how we struggled with defending on midfielders. Well, Capellas is absolutely wiping the floor with that. And Mareas have improved as well. He's only really lacking on headers, but other than that, everything else, much better. So that's working really well. Everything was rosy, but you might notice something if you look closely at that team. Yeah, so this happened. Our biggest sale yet, 2.3 million, rising to 3 million. Breno, our Edison, is gone. The general manager decided it was too good to refuse. And to be fair, it was more than his release clause. But what that means is it's our first real big dent in the long-term goal. Now, we are rising through the league steady away, but there's that big clause. Sell players when clauses are hit. And he went over his clause, which means the mission to get a net transfer profit of 1 billion. The calculator is back. So let's get 1 billion in there. How many zeros is it again? That's 1 million, 10, 100. There's a billion. And we're going to take off our value we have now, which is a total transfer income of 2.6 million, thanks to that 2.3 million for Breno. So we're going to take that off to six. There it is, which means our running total is 997 million, 400,000. So let's park that for a while and concentrate on the goals we can control at the minute, and that's getting promoted. So, Breno's gone, and believe it or not, because of these finances are right there, and the wage budget, we can't do a thing. They've actually slashed the wage budget, so we're now 8,000 over it. I could not bring in anybody to replace Breno. So that summer transfer that we talked about, Cooper, the goalkeeper, who's now got a face, it proves to be absolutely vital because he is now the number one to the end of the season, and he has to be. If we compare him with Breno, he's not miles off 
He's not miles off. He's really comparable in a lot of aspects. He's just not quite there in terms of shot stopping. So reflexes, things like that. Breno's way ahead of him. And you look at the overall value now, Breno's has just gone way up. But Cooper, he's only young. He's only 22. He's not a bad backup. Let's see what he can do. And look, he's got a face now, so we love him. Welcome in, Noah. Now, unfortunately, the five games after Breno left us, we only won one of them. We did recover to beat top of the table Rio. 3-1, though, that did help. And we're coming back into it now with only five matches left to go. And look how tight it is. We can see we're in fourth position now. Remember, top three, top two go up. Third place goes into a playoff. We don't really want that because that's against a team from the top division. But there's only three points between that top four. Now, we've actually got a decent running. We don't play any of the teams above us. So, fingers crossed. We're getting to this running now. We're going to try our best to get up, but... So we win our next three, which means we won four in a row and five out of six. We've nudged ourselves into second, but still that top three is separated by three points. Yeah, this is so tight now. It's ridiculous. It's so tight. We could actually finish top or we could finish fourth. The tactics holding up. There's been a couple of changes to roles, none to team instructions, but you can see I've dropped one of the central midfielders to box to box, a bit more solid. And when this man plays, I've got him as an advanced playmaker just to play them through balls that you might have seen. A couple of standouts have been Bamba. You can pick this guy up from Dortmund's second team and he's just really coming through his own now. Nine assists, eight goals. And just like last season, Luca Fletcher's banging him in. He's banging him in. He's got 21 in 29. We're going to be hard to keep hold of him unless we get promoted. So, two games to get up. Let's do it. One game to go, nothing's changed. But we are sitting top of the league now. What is going on? But we can still finish as low as fourth. So we can either finish champions or we can finish fourth. One game to go. Now, luckily for us, we play Amora at home, who are 15th. But they need a win to stay in the league. What a run at the end of the season. Seven wins out of eight. We took it down by the slimmest of margins. 65 points, 64, 63 and 60 for fourth place. But what a result that is. Top scorers in the league. Defensively, pretty decent as well. We're in the top division. I've literally just done it now and I haven't even read through these stories here. So these are all the big ups. Now this is the big one here. The board are about to set our budget for next season. Now we've never have had a budget throughout. We haven't spent a penny. 280,000 and 72 grand a week. Well, this bit's pretty cool, isn't it? Iconic. So, 48-year-old, he's already spoken in the same breath as the likes of Salgueros, icons, Carlos Manuel and Zoran Flipovic. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We've won the championship. Our second season in it, 10th for the first time. Now we're up. I do think it's a little bit too early. I'm about to look at this squad now and decide who's going to be in it for next season. Thoughts? I will shout out Bamba. I think he can do something in that upper league. He's only 25. Got to give Fletcher a go. Obviously, Hugo is going to be in there and Vasco, I cannot let him not do it. He's been up with us right through the leagues. Everywhere else, I don't know. There's going to be some major surgery needs to be done and we don't have a lot of money to do it with. But yeah, mission accomplished. Now we move on to the big time.
So promotion, what's the first thing we do? What's the most ideal way to attack this rise in standards? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is look at the squad. I'm going to take out the players from the starting 11 that I don't think will be good enough to start in the top division. So we speculated about this and I've had a look at it. Now, the major surgery is going to have to take place in defence because it's basically not good enough. So I'm going to remove all these players who I don't think will be starting next season. But I am also torn because I want to remain quite loyal to these boys that got us up and give them a bit of a chance. Initial thoughts, it'll look like this. I'm willing to give these boys a chance with just maybe four new starters if we can get them. Right, so next we fly over to the bench and I've already removed players I don't think that will be there next season. So you can see there's a few gaps there and we'll replace these gaps with the guys that we've left out of the starting 11. And bang, there we go. Now we've got a bench of nine, so I'm quite happy with that. I've got a backup of nine. I just need to sort out the starting 11 now. So that gives us a good guide on what to do. The next thing I want to do is release as much funds as possible because we do not have a lot of money. You know that, I know that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go up to filters here. I'm going to drop it down to contracts and everybody that's about to come out of contract let's get them set for release now so the board then know how much money we're gonna have to play with so now i've got about eight or nine players there that i can set for release and that'll just release a bit of the funds for the budget for next season which will help us with a bit of planning so if you're unsure about what sort of level your team should be at i like to go to the division you're about to go into and have a look at the teams that have got relegated. Now look at the best of the bunch there. Arusa, they've been relegated and this is their key players, captains. Have a little look at them and you can kind of judge what sort of levels they're at. Key player for them is Oriel Busquets and you can see that he's a pretty decent player. He's kind of in our attribute range in areas. So the player level is going to be pretty decent. In fact, look at his value of 10.5 to 12.5 million. Instantly, I'm getting worried now because my top player is 2 million. So you can even take that a step further by selecting a player who's comparable to this player. So Busquets is there, defensive midfielder, I'd say. So I've got a comparison and compare with, and our squad, it's probably Capellas. So we'll select Capellas and there you can see, now Capellas is pretty decent in the overall polygon. There's not a lot between them. If you go to attributes as well, you can really get down and have a look at what you think they are lacking. Are they ahead? For the averages here, we're not in a bad place. So for me, I can kind of eliminate that position in regards to needing to upgrade because I think we're going to be okay. I do that for the whole team, so I'll have a little look at what they've got. So their striker, who was the main man? The main man was Christo here. He bagged nine goals. And look at him. To be fair, this gives me a bit of hope because I think Fletcher is arguably better than him. And this guy bagged nine goals, so maybe Fletcher might be capable of getting 12 to 13. And I'll have a look at every position. Now, this is their centre-back who started. I think I was out far off that, and that's probably our weakest position. So maybe we can be more competitive than I first thought. Now look, in an ideal world, my attribute range for this top division will be between 16 and 20. And let's be honest, we're not going to get there yet. But if we can get some areas covering a 16, it's like the holy grail. And Fletcher's got some. We're saying Fletcher because he's probably going to be the key player. He's finishing his 16, and his acceleration and balance are up there. So we're going to have to grab little plucks of hope like that for this first season which is all about survival saying that though whenever we do go scouting and ask unborn penza and the scouting team for a player we need some players that will hit that attribute range otherwise we're just going to go backwards and fast now speaking of the staff at this level in our league we are the best coaching team and probably the best recruitment team when we go up that's going to drop like a rock like a rock so your next job is to upgrade your staff now hopefully like me, you've got a bit lucky and most of the contracts are about to expire. So we're going to have a good look from the assistant manager downwards and all these coaches. I want them to get an attribute level similar to what we're looking for in player range. 99% of the time when you get promoted, especially to a top division, your staff allowed numbers will go up. For example, our coaching staff, we're allowed another three, two or three extra. Same goes with the recruitment team. This is your chance to upgrade. And that's exactly what we have done. If you look at this now, this is our coaching team and it's considerably bigger. We brought in some quality coaches. One you might recognise, RVP, Robin Van Persie. He's going to be our new striker coach. And he's a good example of the sort of upgrade that you want for your team. Not only that, we've upgraded our scouts as well. with a decent knowledge of the world now. How about Stefan Chapusat? He is an elite scout. Look at that. For his attributes, he's fantastic. His knowledge is not as wide as Mpenza. But to judge a player to get a final decision, he's probably the man. 
On the flip side of that, I took on Jeremy Menez. Now, his attributes aren't great, but look at his knowledge base. France, Portugal, Belgium, Spain, Italy, a few African nations as well. So if you take that philosophy and you get yourself a good mixture of scouts, it's going to open up your recruitment. A little Easter egg for you. Do you remember Diego Volante, who is now our director of football? Well, Zee Volante retired, and he's now our head of youth development. Might seem like a balmy decision when you look at his attributes, but to be fair, our youth intakes have been disgusting we haven't had a good one yet and that was with a really good head of youth development so i'm giving him the job and he's a hell of a lot cheaper so our staffing levels look like that and this is for the new season going into the top division and coaching team that's not bad is it we've still got some elite coaches that robin van Persie one was elite for the best attacking he's helping out there technique is good goalkeeping's really good and you've got to believe that's going to be pretty important this season now the recruitment team it doesn't look great it's probably more down to the amount of numbers we've got there, but we'll do our best. And as for the medical staff, I think it's my nan doing it. So we've upgraded our staff now. We're ready for this league campaign. The one thing we haven't done, though, is upgrade the team. We're in the big time now, remember? We're in the big time with some big boys. Porto, Benfica, Sporting, Braga, the list goes on. This is scary. If you look at the season preview, they've got us at 600 to 1. I'm actually amazed that we're... Down to finish 14th. I will take that right now, thank you. And as a footnote, previous winners of this league, if you go right back to the start when we started, so Benfica took it first season, Porto took it back twice, so back to back, then Benfica claimed it back, back to back, and last season, Porto claimed it. So them two are trading places. 600 to 1 though. So who have we brought in? You're expecting to see a sea of people, right? Well, there's five. So this is the man we've spent some money on. It was £100,000. It rises to 450 over about four or five years. So it's still a dirt cheap one. He came in from Benfica. This is Gaspar. He can play centre-back. Or more importantly, he can also play as a left-back as well. I feel like the sell-on value of this man could be huge. Also from Benfica is Gustavo Ferreira. Now he's a striker. He's only on loan, but he is out of contract at the end of the season. So if he likes it here, he could be a keeper. He's going to rotate with Luca Fletcher. He's very good. We might have our new Brazilian keeper. This is Matias Donelli. Is he as good as Breno? Probably not. But at 27 years old, he's not bad. Attributes are actually on the rise. He is an upgrade on Cooper. Remember Capellas last season from the Spanish lower leagues? We've done it again with Raquel May Maria. He's actually came from the fourth division in Portugal. I'm not sure what to do with him yet, so I'd love to know what you think in the comments. He's down as an advanced playmaker, but he hasn't got a great first touch and dribbling's not great, but his flair is off the charts. So I'm wondering what to retrain him as. And right at the end, we've used the last of our wages on Ruben Vinagre. Now, he's a left-back. He's been around. You've probably heard of him. He's been at Sporting, at Wolves, a few places. He gives us the option for a slightly different take on our tactic if we need it. And a bit of experience. So five in. And starter-wise, probably two or three. It's been an absolute disaster this preseason in terms of recruitment. A disaster. 3.5 million in debt. It's the most we've been in debt yet which meant our transfer budget got slashed as soon as we bought Gaspar. No wages for loans. Help. So tactically, we are able to fill the team. We are able to fill the team. At the minute, that's the way it's set up. You'll notice Menji here, our centre-back from last season. I'm going to move him over to right-back this season. It's going to be super solid. What I plan to do when everyone is fit is to have four centre-backs across that defence. A lot like what Pep's doing at the minute. We're going to try it. I think we're going to be under so much pressure this season. That's what I'm going to do. So when Fernandez is fit, he's currently injured. He's going to jump into there and Gaspar will move across. So we'll have two centre-backs as full-backs and two centre-backs in the middle. A half-back's probably overkill. We might switch into anchor, but I'm getting ready for a tough season. But you've got to have a plan B. You've got to have a plan B. And this is ours here into slot number two. I'm going to move the wing-back to an attacking wing-back. And that's where our new man comes in. Vinigre will jump in there as an attacking wing back. He's going to have to cover that entire flank. So he's going to have to, a bit of ground to cover, but we're going to move this guy in. Now, the other option, because in a high likelihood, our best two players are going to be the two strikers, is this. We move it a little bit further forward because Ferreira, he's got the capability of playing as a complete forward. So we might get a bit brave and go two up front. But that's all dependent on if our original tactic from last season doesn't fire we had 280,000 going into this preseason it was never going to be easy i did not expect it to be quite that hard that squad is smaller than last season and only marginally better 
I need to get some late, late loans and hope that we can do Man City style and get them for free. True to form, there was a League Cup before the season started and we got through the first round pretty easily. I rotated a bit and we lost on penalties in the second round. I don't think we've ever got past that round. Which means we're set, we're ready to start. We're up against Firenze, who we played last season at home, so we've got a good chance to get off to a good start. And just looking down that list, them first five games are important because after that first five games, it's then Benfica and then it's Derby Day against Porto. The realisation hits. This is going to be brutal, but we've got the staff. We've got somewhat of a squad. It's not what I wanted. We'll keep trying till deadline day, but we've got somewhat of a squad. My question to you is, where do you think we're going to finish? If you gave me 15th now, So what you saw there was the first game of the season, a very impressive display against Ferenze. They were also promoted, so we can't look too much into that. So the top division days have begun with a nice win. We're still using the last season's tactic. We've got alternatives, but I'm going to stick for now. Now, the first big test is on the way. Looking at these fixtures, you'll see it's Braga away from home. Now, they're one of the crack teams in Portugal. So this is going to be a tough one. So I'm going to go in depth on the opposition instructions and the in-match management of how I'm going to try and get a result in this one. Now, having a little look at Braga, you can see why I am instantly worried. Now, up top, they've got Sebastian Haller. I mean, how old is he now? He's 35, but he's still absolutely class and would walk into most teams in this division. And up front with him is Abel Ruiz, who is valued between 36 million and 55 million. Now I'm starting to panic. Other notable players you'll recognise is Serginio Dest, who's a really good fullback, 30 to 38 million. And in midfield, Rodriguez, Alan Rodriguez from Uruguay. They're just, let's be real, far better than us. So we're going to have to work our nuts off to get a result. So what we're going to do now, we're away from home as well, which makes things even harder for us. I don't want to change our mentality because if you go too defensive, I think we're just going to invite pressure on us. So I'll probably keep most of the team instructions the same going in. We might change it as we go. But we'll start off with opposition instructions. So into opposition instructions we go. They've also got Scott McTominay, by the way, who at this level is ridiculous. His physicals are outrageous. But they're playing a 4-4-2. So I'm guessing they want to go wide and I want them not to do that. So Serginio Dest, who's more of a right-footed fullback, although good on the other side, I'm going to try and tuck him in by showing him onto his left foot. I'll do the same with left-back Conte. We'll show him onto his right foot. So that means that these two, when they get the ball, will be forced somewhat in field. Now, I'm also going to do the same with their wingers. They've got Rodriguez on one side, who's only 20 years old, but he looks lightning, acceleration of 17. So we'll put him on his left foot or weaker foot, if you like, either or. And on the other side, they've got this guy called Elton Carvalho, who, again, is lightning. Really quick, but he's all left foot. So I'm going to put him on his right foot. Also, looking at Carvalho, you can see his bravery is only 7, so I'm going to go in a bit harder on him. The two strikers, Haller is 35 now, so he's not going to get away from us from a standing start, so we can kind of worry less about him. Now, Ruiz looks a bit more of a threat. He's got acceleration of 15 and pace 14, so he might get away from us. If we tight mark him too closely, could leave our centre-backs for dead, so I'm actually going to title them to not mark him tight and give themselves some room against him. So I'm hoping by remaining positive and not letting them come on to us too much with those opposition instructions, forcing them infield, I'm hoping the boys in the middle can win the ball back. Let's get into match and we'll tweak it in match. Okay, so straight away we can see that they're playing really wide. It looks like they're going for a really wide formation. The two wingers there, way wide. Fullbacks are spread as well. More early thoughts. We're going to try and play through them. You can see that we've got a bit of a press coming on and we've got the ball, but we're in a good shape. The halfback's dropping in. Hugo's going to be really key in this match, dropping in, getting the ball. I'm just trying to work it through them because there's going to be gaps if they're going to play wide in that 4-4-2. So those two could be quite key as well, Fletcher and Felix. Match has actually started quite well. 23 minutes in, we're playing it around nicely. There's the inverted fullback just dropping in and Bamba's getting loads of room down there. They're kind of disregarding him. Felix, it's all on him. 
This is not bad. You know. Looking at the stats quite early, I can see there's a couple of players with key passes, Rodriguez and Serginho Dest. So we'll have to keep an eye on those two. So Rodriguez is the main guy ticking over in midfield. So I'm going to add tight mark into the opposition instructions to try and get a bit closer to him. So far, though, it's it's holding up pretty well. You can see our halfback dropping deep, super deep there, starting the moves off. So he's there with the two centre-backs either side. And that five and two ahead of him, it's actually working quite well so far. And I'm really surprised. This is Braga, for God's sake. And there's the five right across. We've got options here. I'll tell you what, this is not bad. So first corner, it's 30 minutes gone. I'm well happy with this. Goes in. Ref stops play Holy Jesus, we've got a chance to take the lead here. This season, Hugo Felix will be the man on penalties. Oh, let's go. Looking at their stats, it looks like Rodriguez is a lot quieter. One minute before halftime now. We just need to stick it out until halftime. But there is another highlight incoming. Damn it. Half time, to be fair, we've been really good. Our XG is fantastic and we're dominating possession against one of the better teams in the league. And there's a heat map. Our oh, pass map's decent, actually. And there's his kind of all over the place. So I'm having a look at our stats. You can see our key stats. There's plenty of key passes going on there. Quite happy. So I have noticed there might be a gap for us on the right hand side. Felix is having a great game and they are really pushing forward with their winger and wing back on one side. So I'm going to add something to the team instruction. I'm going to ask an underlap to come in, to try and get Hugo into that gap. Right, 68 minutes gone, I'll take this draw right now, thank you. So I'm going to play it safe by taking right back Zhao off because he's got a book in. He's on a 6.4 as well, so we'll play it safe and we'll take him out of the equation. It's just a safety first thing and Vieira will come on. Now their key man is still Rodriguez. He's getting a little bit more space. He's left centre mid, so I'm going to make a slight change. I'm going to bring Bamba back. I'm going to take him off, get some fresh legs in Elvis Balde. I'm going to change his role to a wide midfielder on support so he sits a bit closer to Felix to help him out against Rodriguez and we'll add in Sit Narrow for this last 15 minutes. We'll also add a little bit of cheeky time wasting and a bit of slowing pace down because there's 15 minutes left. Now we've got a corner. Set pieces are actually our go-to at the minute. 77 minutes gone. We're working it quite nicely and it goes. Header at the back post. Close. I mean, why not? There's only 13 minutes to go. We're under pressure. So let's get play for set pieces and then try and nick one. As time ticks on, we're doing fine. There's five minutes to go. They're not offering anything. Our momentum's not bad either. So we're into injury time now. What can we do to just get through this? So Felix is still centre midfield attack. For the last five minutes, I just ask him to drop back ever so slightly and try and get this result. 92nd minute, they're in. You've got to be kidding me. The full-time whistle goes. Braga take it. It was so close. So normally, I wouldn't probably do as many tweaks as that, but against a big team like that especially if we've just got promoted it's worth trying as much as you can we then played Casapia away from home this didn't go great some really sloppy mistakes and they just ripped us to shreds it's now that I realise the step up in class is going to be a big eye opener yeah that hurt yet another away game this is free on the spin by the way away to Vizela who played really well in this one a good response but we fell to defeat despite dominating the match. So a tough start and then disaster struck. Do you ever get one of those loans where they ask you to play a play in a certain role and you maybe haven't done it for two games or so? Ferreira, who is our key player, according to the media, has gone back to Benfica after playing one match. When it rains, it pours. Last season's first choice centre-back, Fernandez hasn't kicked a ball this season, out with a hip injury currently, on his way back. Which meant a deadline day swoop on you-know-who, Man City and Craig Nelson is back for his third spell at the club. What a pickup! Also, really importantly, £0 per week. He is a free hit. Another tough game, away to Benfica. Probably the toughest of the season, and it didn't go well. But that was to be expected, and they didn't run away with it. If you look at the chances created, we did alright. Next, it was our first derby against Porto at a packed Salgueiro Stadium. After only five minutes, we fell behind. But we played really well and we went close on a few occasions. Finally succumbing to a 1-0 defeat, but we were definitely in the match. And we also got back in the winning groove thanks to a tactical tweak. Fact, we're on our best run of the season now. Four undefeated and we've only conceded one goal in our last four matches. And I'm putting it down to one small tweaked tactic. And if you look at the tactic, it looks exactly the same, right? Same roles, pretty much everything the same, apart from one thing in out of possession. 
And it's this, invite crosses. I'm inviting crosses because, if you remember, the team that I put on the pitch, I've got four centre-backs in there. They're all absolutely huge, good in the air. So my plan is invite crosses, which isn't a team instruction that I've used much in the past. I don't know about you. But what it does, kind of sends them out wide and says, yeah, cross it because we're going to head it away. And since we've done that, our defence has been rock solid. Add to that the fact that Hugo has stepped up to the mark. His value, transfer value has gone for £6 million now and his attributes are rising. He's a future captain for us. He is the absolute key to this. So that good run, unbelievably, leaves us in eighth position now. We've got 16 points, which is more than I thought we would have at this stage. And if you look down the bottom there, 16 for on five. So we're 11 clear. This is a really, really solid start. But there's a long way to go. We've started well, but there was a hell of a long way to go. And if you look at our finances now, it's very unlikely we're going to be able to bring anybody in in January. Man, we are burning free money. If you look at our player wages, it's 250000 a month. Staff wages is 200000 a month. I don't know what I can do to cut the floor here. But a positive is the continued development of Antonio Capellas. His attributes are all on the rise, some of them in a major way. And what I'm really happy about is the ones we're focusing on, agility and balance, both of them are skyrocketing. So he has the potential to be a big time player for us in terms of... And we must be doing something right. We're getting job offers off Everton from the Premier League and Borussia Mönchengladbach from the Bundesliga. That part of the season was mad. A big losing streak, now a big winning streak, and it pretty much summed up by this match here. If you look at it, half time we were down 4 1, had to make some tactic changes. We won the match 5 4. It's probably the best comeback I've had in years on FM. So the fifth goal came from a corner. At this point, I completely lost it in my little office here, all by myself, making it 5 4. The best comeback I've had on FM for years. Our great run, we were playing the 4 3 3, going really well. A couple of tweaks to rolls, but nothing special. Now, half time in that match, we changed to this. We got ourselves a second striker. We made a wing back more traditional, as in going down that line, and it did the biz. And it got me thinking about experimenting for the rest of the season. Because at this point, as mad as it sounds after 20 matches, I think we're pretty much safe now. We're sitting in ninth, and if you look down at 16th, they've only got 10 points. So we're 20 points clear now. So I consider us pretty much safe. We could make a little run for the European spots, but let's be real. I can't help but scratch the itch of trying to experiment a new tactic for next season. We scored four times in the second half with that tactic. Maybe I should give that a run or maybe it was just a circumstantial thing. I'm not sure, but I'm definitely going to use the next 14 matches in the league as a bit of a free hit to try a tactic ready for next season. Because the 4-3-3 we've got now is reliant on controlling the game and there's some teams that are just better than us, so we're not controlling every match. At this point, a slight break in the vid just to point out that I do have an extra section over on Patron. This is where I release all early videos, tactics and loads of other stuff. You even see a script there for an episode. Loads going on there. If you'd like to support the channel that little bit further, you can do so under the membership tab. You can join for as little as a pound, you know. And all the extra support is massively, massively appreciated. So Hugo has been key, and not surprisingly, on transfer deadline day, some big meaty offer started to come in. Rail spotting Heon with 4.9 rise into 6. That's the biggest we've received yet. Having rejected that one, West Brom from the Premier League came in with a straight 5 million rise to 6.75. And having rejected that one, Income Nottingham Forest from the Prem, 5.75 rise into 7 million. It's getting pretty tempting now, but we've still got power on our sides because Hugo does not have a release clause, so I can play hardball here. I've got to keep half an eye on the fact his contract does expire in 2031, though. And also half an eye on this. Six in debt. Six. Not to mention that long-term goal. Remember the long-term goal of getting to that billion? Well, 
We're still on only 2.6 off at the minute, so seven would make a bit of a chunk in that, but I just think we can get more if we hold on to him. So at the risk of upsetting Hugo slightly, we're going to reject that offer, but to be fair to him, he only has a slight interest anyway. He's a loyal kid, is Hugo, so he stays. So we did some experimenting, and it didn't go well. Jokes aside, it hasn't gone well, but we have dropped down to 12th, but you can see the difference. We're still 16 points clear of relegation, so we're going to be fine, but it just shows there's a time and a place to experiment with tactics and don't just flip willy-nilly because it'll just wreck your season if you do it at the wrong times. I've took a risk here. It hasn't paid off, but there's a right time to take the risk because we had nothing on the line. Last time, which I forgot to cover, we actually beat Sporting at home. Shout out to Kev for pointing that out. But the beat is 3-1, but if you look deeper into it, match stats, there's nothing in it and their XG is inflated by a penalty. So there is room for experimentation with a tactic that I'm kind of looking at. And it was this, it was a free at the back and I'll tell you this, I have never got a free at the back working in any edition of FM, I'll be honest with you. I've had success here and there, but with teams like Inter, but I can never get one locked in. So I've used these games to try it. It hasn't really worked at the minute. I'm going to carry on through the end of the season and keep tweaking away because we've got that point difference to help us do that. So it's not quite right though. So we carried on experimenting and we had some good wins, including this Derby Day home win against Boa Vista. And we absolutely smashed Amadora with Hugo Felix picking up a hat-trick. But in general, if you look at the run from the Vizela game when we started the experimentation, that didn't work, did it? So all in all, the season is over and we finish in a pretty respectable 12th place for our first season in the big time. We won 12 matches, which I'm delighted about. About a third of our matches we won. We scored 51, conceding 58. Not a total disaster, but work to do for sure. So now we're going to go into our next season, our second in the top flight, and we want to improve, and I just do not know what to do with the tactic. I'm tempted to hone down on the 4-3-3, which got us to the dance in the first place, but there's something scratching at me, wanting to try something new. It might be a case of doing a brand new tactic. Now, with regards to the players, it's going to be pretty much the same players next season, because next season's budget is pretty much identical to this season, and that wage budget of 78,000, we're already over that, so we're going to have to do some wheeling dealing as always, it's a good time to have a look at your contracts. And I've got about 12 players there coming out of contracts. So that's going to help my wage bill. We've got a new plan. Because the finances are so bad, I am going to try and only bring in youth players now and take a risk, Alex Ferguson style, when he got rid of some older players and brought in the golden generation. I'm going to try that. And as far as next season's tactic goes, I'm going to keep that in the bank because I know it's pretty solid. But I'm also going to do the dreaded this one. And we're going to do... A brand spanking new tactic for the next season. But look, overall, decent first season in the big time. Now, Hugo Felix's value is shot up to 12.5 million. He's got some big clubs after him. Leeds, Sunderland, Las Palmas. Now, in general, our defenders have been really good. If you remember, Chao Amaral, we brought from Brazilian football. He's had a cracking season, an average rating of seven. And if you look at his overall record compared to other defenders in the league, it stands up. It stands up pretty well. So he's a great pickup and he's only 26. So he's going to be a linchpin for next season alongside him is Fernandez when he finally got fit he's played 18 times now but he's been pretty decent as well he's got a bit of work to do in terms of heading tackles attempted but as far as blocks clearances goes he's right up there but it's Gaspar who's probably been the standout Gaspar we signed from Benfica the only player we've ever spent big money on 400,000 he's now valued at 1 to 2.5 million and if you look at his comparison to other defenders the man is going to be elite and we thought he would be he's going to be hard to keep hold of now, other key players, as far as Luca Fletcher goes, he scored 8 in 29. To be fair, in a struggling team, that's not too bad. I think his role may have changed next season, though. And the keeper, the keeper was a success. I think we finally replaced Breno. I think he's the boy. His attributes are on the rise thanks to playing regular football. It's good to know we don't have to replace that many starters this summer. But the work starts now on creating a viable alternative tactic for next season. Wish us luck. You know, we must be doing something right. This is the biggest job offer we've had yet, Sevilla. So here we go then, season eight. We're going to create a brand new tactic for this season. That's going to come up shortly. But first, things are getting pretty spicy. The season's only just finished, but teams are now circling on Hugo. There's four teams after him, and I've just received the biggest bid yet from 11.5 million from Sheffield United. Now look, I'm going to reject that because I don't think it's enough. It's risky, but I'm going to reject it. It's 13.75, rejected. 
In the meantime, I've got ruthless with my staff, specifically the coaching team, and we've had a bit of a refresh. This is my new assistant manager. This is Marcelino. He's coming in for his first managerial job. He's an upgrade. New defending coach as well in Carleo. Those two mean that in comparison to the rest of the league, we're pretty well off here. Not bad, not bad at all. So it's early days in the season, more of that to come, but this is where it's getting complicated. We cannot get near Hugo Felix's agent's demands for his contract. We can't get near it. The most we can offer is about £4,000. It gets complicated because if you look at his expiry, it's 2031, which is next summer, and his value has now shot up to 16 million stroke 17.5. Decisions need to be made here, and I think there's only one. Now, this has been made even more brutal by the fact that Celta Vigo triggered Luca Fletcher's release clause, and he's gone to La Liga for 3.1 million. Now, that I was not planning for. That hit me like a ton of bricks. But we've managed to get someone in. Do you remember Ferreira? Benfica on loan last season. They took him back. Well, we've got him back on a free transfer, and arguably, he's an upgrade on Fletcher. So I'm pretty chill about the striker situation at the minute. We need another, though. Now, in the league, early days, we've started really well. Specifically, Ferreira, who's came in as our new striker. He started really well. I've played with a few different formations at the start, but I think I've got the tactic we're going to use. We've actually won six out of seven and four out of the five league games. Airing on side of caution, though, because they're the pretty easy games. We've got some absolute beasts coming up. So, early days, we're sitting fourth, but I'm not getting carried away because we've got some massive games coming up. And, dudes, things have just got a whole lot more interesting right on deadline day. You can see we've got 12 hours to go of deadline day, and it had to happen. The man, the legend, Hugo Felix, has gone to the Premier League. He's agreed terms with Bournemouth for a fee that will raise to 22 million. I did not want him to go, but the fact I could not get him to sign a new contract, out of contract, he has gone. That does mean our hilarious finances now look actually healthy, probably for the first time since day one of this save. But it also leaves a gaping gap in our squad. Our squad, by the way, which is absolutely tiny. That's right, despite selling Luca Fletcher earlier on, we had no money. 2.8 thousand I've spent. 2.8 thousand would barely buy you a PlayStation 5. And that's what we've had to work with. And it's deadline day. I've got some serious work to do. You will notice a bit of a funky name there. In from Sao Paulo, and this guy is a complete legitimate footballer. I swear to God, check your saves as well. This is Thierry Henry. He's in on loan from Sao Paulo. He's only 23. He's not a bad player. He's got a close saying we can buy him for 200,000 if it works out. But a more exciting one is Usman Diallo. He's in on loan from Borussia Dortmund. He's a winger. Everything looks cool for a winger, right? Attributes. But he's also got something quite funky about him. He's six foot four. He's absolutely humongous. But he's fast and tricky as well. But yeah, deadline day. And it's going to throw up some interesting things, believe me. And I've got a squad that needs filled up and some quality needed. So this season's tactic, I think you're looking at it. It's a variation of a 4-2-3-1. I don't know if you'd call it that because it's not something you'll see every day, this. But again, I'm being stubborn, dudes. I'm being stubborn with my inverted wing backs. I'm going to keep them in for now. But this might morph into something different. But I do like this section here. Now you can see the gaping gap left by Hugo Felix. We do need to fill that. But the two wingers are running rampant at the minute. And Ferrer up front is the top goal scorer in the league. In fact, at this early stage, he scored four in five. He's an absolute bargain. So it's pretty much the same squad as last season. The only two new names you'll see is Diallo and Ferreira. But we do have that gaping gap central midfield. Deadline day is upon us. We do have some money to spend if we want to use it. Thanks to that £22 million sale, the board have actually gave us 3.5 million of that and probably more importantly a wage budget of 13,000 a week left to play with. Now remember what I said last time, I want to bring in young players and that's exactly what we're going to do in deadline day. Using this, how often do you look at these agent offers when they throw them at you? Well let me tell you, I don't use them much but I'm glad I did this time. So we're just off the back of a wild transfer deadline day. You can see we've raised 20.5 million and we've actually spent a little over 1 million pounds. And there's four players down here that I want you to look at. Now, first up is Fabo Mayini. He's came from South African football. He's already capped for South Africa. He's 19, so he fits our remit. He can play any of the front three positions and out wide if we need him to. At 19 years old, what could he be? He's already valued at 9.6 to 11 million. We might have hit the jackpot there. The next agent offer, another South African footballer, and this is the one I'm probably most excited about in the entire transfer window. Mostly because his name, Dick Gang Mahatshwa. So for us, we call him Big Dick. So Big Dick here has insane, insane potential. He's already got aggression of 19, and determination is the key one of 20. His career could skyrocket. His agility is 15. 
His stamina is already 15. His work rate's 15. He's got cracking technique. My question to you is, what would you do with him? He looks to be a ball winning midfielder or a box to box, but I'm not sure yet. Next up is Leandro. This is a centre back. He's only 19. He costs us £130,000. He's a rough diamond. Some things need tweaking. I'm going to work on his defensive positioning in training. But for £130,000 at 19, potential. Right, this is the last one, and this is going to be, believe it or not, Hugo Felix's replacement. This is Pedro Antunes, and we found him a slightly different way. When we sold Felix, on a whim, I just said, I need a player who's a clone of Hugo Felix. So, so I was looking at his profile, kind of drooling at the attributes, and I went up to comparison, and I literally pressed find similar players. Now, all these amazing players came up. Of course they did. But then when you filter them down... This is where we found our boy. Our boy was in one of four or five of this search results. He's actually a younger version of Hugo Felix. Now, if we go to comparison and we compare the two players, you can see he's got some work to do, but the attributes are kind of similar. The pattern is similar. The polygon's similar. He's only 22. He's got time on his side. But like I say, he's 22. And if you look at how much we picked him up for, 325,000. He's already scored a goal. A little spoiler for you. In the league. I like him. You can see the fees we paid there, 325000 for Pedro, for Maini, who was the striker, half a million, and for Dick, Big Dick Gang, 400000 and 130000 for the Brazilian. Sell-on value for them lot should be ginormous. So like I say, those three players were found via agents, and I never look at those. So today's takeaway is to check out those agent offers, specifically on deadline day, because they were absolutely beautiful. Straight away after signing those players, and because they're so young, I went straight to their training and development and got to work on what I want them to do. Focus on a player role I want them to do and any areas of focus that we need to do to improve their game. For example, Dick Gann, when you go to his training, you'll see I've got him training to be a box-to-box -box midfielder on support, mostly because that covers a broad range of attributes that he can work on. We've added in defensive positioning as well to get that marking up a little bit, but he's only 18, so I expect all these to fly up. Now, even spending a little bit of money like we did, a million pounds, our overall balance is still 8 million, thanks to that big sale. So we're doing all right here. So system-wise, like I say, we're going for that. There is an alternative, which is a kind of 4-4-2 variation. I have listened to you a lot in the comments. I didn't want to take on the free at the back challenge yet, purely because I didn't get the players in to try it. And we've only just got four players in there on deadline day. So I had to go with something that were quite familiar with like the four at the back like i said we had some big hard games to come and those games that i just showed you there were kind of all together and we lost all of them but all of them were super close which is good the only time we've been battered this season is braga gave us a good scene to 5-2 at home now other than that we're starting to fire back we're still in the cup believe it or not which is madness for us we're in both cups i don't know how that's going on but we are and we just beat hill Vicente 4-1 who are flying high so that leaves us at the minute dudes sitting pretty comfortable in eighth we've won six and we've lost six but we have played all of the big boys now so we might go on a little run what to expect this season i have no idea i want a good cup run you never know it's all about making money and building this club we're trying to catch them boys at the top but they are so good it's going to be really hard but them new boys that we bought in they've started really well now to be fair to antunes he's got big shoes to fill in hugo felix but he scored three and five he's got a couple of assists he hasn't bought a hairbrush yet but we like him. Same goes for Dick Gann. And if you'll notice, every time I'm clicking on these players, their attributes are on the rise for a combination of the training and the fact that they are playing matches. Even at 18 years old, they're playing matches. The only one not a regular yet is Maini, and his attributes are still on the rise because he's playing regularly for South Africa. We're doing his development, his training, and he's getting some minutes via the bench. So I've stuck with this tactic so far. It's a slight change of tact because we're going a bit more high press. And a bit more higher tempo. We've been using the lower tempo. But I will say this. The higher tempo does not lock in. We use that until we get the lead. Or if I think we're giving the ball away too much. We drag that right back. So it's not a lock that tempo. It kind of changes per match. When we play one of the bigger boys. If we're starting to get a bit overrun. We may drop this defensive line back. But the template of the tactic is there. Long term if I stick to this formation and this setup. I do want some traditional wing backs to jump in. But to be blatantly honest with you. I have not recruited wing backs because I've been so obsessed with using these two four centre backs combo in here. So in January, we might have a look for some more traditional style wing backs and then we'll see if we can play a little bit wider, a bit more wing play styley. 
But for now, we roll on. Antonio Capellas is now judged our key player. That little kid from Spain that we found in the lower leagues of Spain is now the top dog. And we have turned down a bid from Inter Milan for him. So before the next update, do not be surprised if that morphs into a more traditional looking 4-3-3 if we hit a blip. Because looking at those players that I've got there, I think we can do it. And with January on the way up, if we can get some more traditional wing backs, could be spicy, could be spicy. But yeah, eighth place at the minute. We'll take that, wouldn't we? And top scorer in the league is that man, Ferreira. What a signing he's been, by the way. Free transfer from Benfica. I've already forgot about Luca Fletcher. Luca who? Right, so it's you in take time, and yet again, it's a complete write-off. Who would have thought appointing an unqualified former player wouldn't work? So instead, we focus on our scouting and building our scouting team. And the main reason we've spent so long building this scouting team with knowledge around the world. If you look at the world knowledge now, we've got a pretty good coverage of regions, specifically South America and obviously Central Europe, Western Europe. If I break that down into nations, you can see where we really focus on. Brazil is exceptional and we've got a good covering of exceptional here. Even outstanding in Iran. Look out for players from there. We've got some good knowledge of Africa as well. In fact, Africa and South America trumps European football. Now, because of that Hugo Felix sale, which we didn't want to do, but it's probably going to be for the greater good. Because what that is going to allow me to do now is, I've had a scouting range of surrounding divisions and even less than that for the entirety of this save. But now, because we've got a little bit of money in the bank, in fact, sitting pretty comfortable on the 8 million positive mark, for the first time in this save, we can go to our scouting range and we can increase this to world coverage. So now the time spent building this world knowledge, we can finally execute it and send our scouts all over the place. Right, a few more games have gone. You'll notice we're in sixth now. We haven't drawn a game yet. We've won eight and lost seven. It's either or at the minute, but we're sitting in 24 points. I was happy with tactic, but there was something missing a little bit and it was in the Capellas role. And you'll notice now I have switched him to a register and this is the rise of the register because it's starting to... So the reg, as we're going to call it, the register is a more aggressive version than the deep line playmaker. You can see Capellas there. Now, if he's a deep line playmaker, he's going to probably sit there and just ping balls left and right. But because you've made him more aggressive now, and we're focusing on that register role, you can see that he's asking for the ball still, so he's still the focal point of your team. And now when he gets it, normally he'd give it and probably sit. But he gets it, pings a beautiful ball to the right-hand side. Now keep an eye on him as we get the ball down the right. Look where he is. So the register will, all the time, get up with player, get in and around the edge of the box. You can see him there. Ball comes back to him. If he's a deep line playmaker, he's nowhere near this. Lovely little ball to Diallo who pings it in. Next highlight really showing this role. There he is again on the edge of the box, waiting for it, waiting for it. He's almost like a central midfielder attack. Now he's got it there. There was no way, no way in his old role he would be doing this. Absolute screamer into the top corner. In that match, we were far more dominant. We've had a good season, but we were really good in that one. And you can see Capella here with the player of the match award. With an assist, two clear cut chances created, and the goal all from that position. So that's going to be key, that, especially when we've got these two inverted wing backs tucking inside and backing up Cruz. I didn't think we needed all four of them sitting back. So now he gets a little bit further forward. You'll notice I'm using Big Dick now as a central midfielder on attack as well. It's early days there, but he's got a good average rating. I've got so high hopes for this man. It's January now and we've went Christmas shopping and you can see we've bought six new players in. So that tiny squad has now been bulked up considerably, mostly with young players, but I'll take you through them right now. So the total outlay for these six players was a measly £475,000. First up is Celso Luiz. He's coming from Palmeiras. I'm going to loan him out straight away because I think he's won for next season. In from Flamengo is Nico Colo. He's a Colombian centre-back, pretty much back up. Same with Gonzalez, he's a left winger. Now, this is more exciting. Carlos Correa in from Benfica. We've had a good relationship with Benfica's B team. I'm going to loan him out. We were looking for a player to use as a traditional wing back, and Edgar Mota is that man. He's been released by Braga, and possibly the most exciting signing yet is Robson, a Brazilian from Flamengo. And I was just talking about the register role. He could be absolutely perfect for it, and he's only 22. So happy to get those six in, especially as it's January and the Vultures will be circling. Gustavo Ferreira, by the way, 14 goals in 15 matches. Ridiculous. But I've got him to sign a new contract and it's got rid of his release clause. I've already turned down bids of 3, 4 and 4.2 million for Gaspar from the Bundesliga. Hopefully we can keep hold of him. But yeah, looking at the squad now, it's quite meaty looking, isn't it? It's quite big. I've got to register all these players and get them in, but that's not bad at all. Quite happy with that. 
All this means, by the way, that our average age of our squad now is 24. 24, which is pretty good. That tweak to the tactic in place, we're now on an unbelievable run. We've won seven, seven in a row and hardly conceded any goals. Six clean sheets out of seven. What this means is after 20 matches, we're sitting fourth with 39 points and we still haven't drew a match. Transfer window is shut and we've completed our business now. 20 million in, 1.9 million spent and a rake of youngsters from South America. Some players are really rising to it. Big Dick now has scored four goals from central midfield on attack. Attributes continue to go up. 19-year-old Brazilian Leandro has forced himself into the team now with four games with 7.42 average rating. So we've gone about our business nice and quietly, and I didn't even realise, because they didn't tell us we were in the quarterfinal, but we're actually in the semi-finals of the Taca de Portugal. And if you look at the other semi-final, it's Benfica Porto. We've got a chance to get the final here. There's two legs coming up. Well, this has been pure beast, this tactic. Ever since we moved him more aggressive, so he basically spends more time up here, meaning we have the free players, Cruz, the inverted wing back on both sides. They make the free, which means releases Capellas to just bomb on with the two wingers and the central midfielder on attack. We've got Maini up here. You'll see he's up front at the minute because our boy Ferreira got injured. He's on his way back. I think he's got about three weeks left. But when he plays, he plays either as a Trek with Tista or a deep line forward. Doing all right. But there's a run run. We've just stopped our winning streak because we drew against Vito Gamarish at home. But we've got Sporting next and they are absolutely flying. If you look at the league table, we're just above them there in fifth. But we are the two form teams in the league. So this is going to be tricky and it's away from home. This is a real benchmark game, this, because we're on a good run of form. How good are we though? Because we're just getting rid of some teams that are in and around us. But this is Sporting and it's away. Now looking at their team, as scary as it looks, we'll try some things. By the way, my assistant manager is hilarious. This is why you should never use this ask assistant button up here. He's a nutter. Watch this. I can guarantee what he's going to say here. He's going to say kill. <laughs> so he's asked me to go in hard on about seven players there. So we're just going to politely disregard what he has to say. Instead, what we're going to do is a 4-4-2. And I'm guessing that central midfielders, Goncalves has moved back to central midfield in his veteran years. And Fernandez, yeah, both of them have got passing and vision. So for both of them two, I'm going to tight mark. Now, outside of them, they've got Trincao. He's more of a playmaker, isn't he? He is. His bravery is only eight. So I'm going to try, I will try and rough him up. So my assistant manager will be happy there. On the other side, we've got Zaragoza, whose photo has been taken with a Nokia 3310. Again, his bravery is pretty low as well. So we will go in hard on them too. So at least he'll be happy with that. The rest, I don't think I'm going to touch. I'm just going to have a quick look at the fullbacks. Yeah, we're just going to leave it. I've, I've gone down the less is more approach on opposition instructions at the minute. So we'll see. A draw would be ideal in this one, but let's see. Two form teams in the league. So there's about 40 seconds gone here. It's early stages of the match, and it's what you would call a dream start. Bamba is playing out of his skin at the minute. You can see the inverted wing back just playing it around. Mayini's up front because Ferreira's still out. The four start, beautiful move there. Bamba, oh boy. Four minutes gone now, a little cheeky free kick. Gaspar down the left hand side, and Mayini's in. So we've had a dream start, we're 2-0 up now, it's 36 minutes gone here. Now this is a standout moment of this football match. I want you to let my team do the talking for you. Bamba's got the ball up here, away they go. So all them passes later, they just cut them open like a knife brew butter and our register there to finish it off, it's beautiful. Sporting rallied in the second half, but we've done a right number on them in that first half. 3-0 in the first half, we win the match 3-1. So what that means with 12 games to go, we are sitting fourth. Now look at Braga just above us, four points, they're Champions League. We couldn't, could we? So the boys are clicking now, don't forget we've got that semi-final to come up as well. We could be on to something pretty special this season.
Yes, our 12-game undefeated streak was ended by the big boys as we lost three on the spin. That left us in fifth place. We are the best of the rest behind the higher powers of Portuguese football, Benfica, Porto, Braga and Sporting. And there's five games to go. But at the minute, we're looking good for Europe. So disappointing to lose to those teams, but we're definitely in it, aren't we? We're not getting absolutely smashed. It's just a goal or two either side. So there's work in progress. Now, speaking of work in progress, Dick Gan Makashwa continues to rise and big news for him he's actually been voted the second best young player in the world and he's at Salgueros madness absolute madness and by the way Mayena our striker he was ranked number 45 so the future looks bright so we've been slowly rising up the ranks and we've increased our stadium our kits look good but let's be honest some of our facilities aren't great so I'm going to try the holy grail and I'm going to ask the board to increase the youth facilities and make them a bit better and to my absolute shock, they've actually agreed. They're going to do it. They're going to improve the club's youth facilities. It's going to cost us about 650000 but it's underway and it should be ready in August. What stuck out to me was the reason they accepted. I don't really look at this much, but I'm glad I did. We're in good form and you've played a big part in making that happen. So maybe the time to ask your board things is when you're absolutely flying. We recovered really well from those defeats to the big teams and bounced back very nicely. Two wins in a row and loads of goals from Pereira meant that European qualification is granted. We're in the Conference League at least. Tactically, I haven't shifted away from this at all. Occasionally, I've dropped the tempo here and there. I've dropped the defensive line, but it's been set like that. A bit of rotation in players, but it's worked a treat. So with three games to go, we carried on winning. Wins home and away, which meant with Sporting starting to falter in their running, if we could beat Casapia in our last game of the season, we'll actually get into the Europa League. And beat them we did with a thumping four-goal win. Ferreira with another hat-trick, which meant we break the big teams and finish in the top four qualifying for the Europa League. Hey, I tell you what, I'm buzzing with that. I did not expect us to do that. We've been on a right run. You can see our little greens in our form guide there. We won five on the spin at the end of the season. It means we finish above Sporting and we take down the Europa League. It's top three for the Champions League in Portugal, so we didn't quite get there, but we're only three points off and we're definitely making here in this division. And the best thing about this is we've sorted out that defence. We've scored 62, which is a good amount, but we've only conceded 37, which is just a little more than a goal a game. So we're definitely getting there. For next season, I'm going to stick with this tactic. My plan is to improve areas here and there, which we'll get onto in a bit. You know how we do it. We take players out and we replace them. As far as next season's budget goes, it's not spectacular at 1.43 million, but the increase in our wage budget from the early days when we started it's a beautiful sight. I showed you the league table, but have a little look at the player stats. Top goal scorer in the league, by some margin, was Ferreira. He's up there in average ratings as well, and assists Bamba's joint top. So a little reminder, if you're looking for players, you can pick players up from interesting places. Remember, Ferreira could not get a kick for his main team. He was in the B team. We picked him up on a free. Same goes to Bamba, whose value, by the way, shot up to nearly 15.5 million. We picked him up from Dortmund's second team. Couldn't get a kick for the first team. These are interesting places to look for players. In fact, Diallo is also on loan from Dortmund's second team and his contract's up at the end of the season, so we're hoping to make that a permanent move as well. So planning for the new season is an interesting one for me because I am actually really happy with this squad. There's not too many areas we need to improve. Initially, I need to take Diallo out from here because he's not going to be there unless we can sign him. Gaspar's an issue because there's so many teams after him. We might have to cash in on him. The rest of them, though, I don't think we can really improve anywhere. Of course, we can if players come up, but for now, I'm going to concentrate on the bench. Now, looking at the bench, there's a few areas where we can take players out. Players have run their course to a degree. Even club captain Maria wants to leave us. And we do have a few players out on loan who will come back into the reckoning, so we can start thinking about how we're going to look for season number nine. So it's a good time now to have a look at recruitment focuses. End of the season, there's some sneaky things you can do here. Now, I've got an ongoing one of 15 to 19 because that's what I was planning for the future, trying to sell on and replace players that get sold but the next one i'm going to do we're in may now people are going to be coming out of contract so we're going to do a quick recruitment focus we're going to cover any position from this tactic so i'm just looking for squad build that squad up and i'm going to look transfer only but the further details is the key one we're going to add in contract status and expiring in three months time so that'll give us a nice broad range of player we'll confirm that and then we're going to get players whose contracts are up basically at the end of the season who might not yet have been signed. Wrapping up this off-season, 
this is our transfer business. Now you'll notice that we spent two million mostly on young players. In fact, 99% on young players. But transfers out was 30 million pounds. Now that shot up because of a bit of an upsetting move late, late in the off season. Gaspar has left us. He's gone to the Premier League of Ipswich. A fee of nine million pounds. We bought him two seasons ago for 450,000. So it's a big, big profit, but it still hurts. That, of course, means now we have a big problem down the left-hand side because we don't have a winger and we don't have an inverted wing-back on the left. So work to do in the transfer market. Into the transfer market we go in pre-season and things have been interesting. First in is some bodies on that left-hand side. This is Crescenciano. Free transfer, a bit of raw talent there. How about Nicola Benedetti, who's going to be a backup register in case Capellas leaves us. He's in from Inter Milan's B team. We're hitting them B teams again. And the good news is we did manage to convince Diallo to sign on a free transfer from Borussia Dortmund. Our left-hand side problems from attacking sense are sorted. Our relationship with South Africa continues by signing Bongu Musa CBA, who's going to be a striker for us just in case Ferreira does leave us. We paid under 400000 and he's already valued at nine. In his backup, we've got this Chinese centre-back. Now, I'm going to make him a ball-winning midfielder because I think he might be quite nice cover in there. Yet more raw talent, 22-year-old Emerson Garcia. Not sure what to do with him yet. I'd like to hear your suggestions. Maybe retrain him as a central midfielder on attack? Yes, indeed, we've been busy. This is Hossim Gamal from Egypt. Our African scouts coming up trumps yet again. He could be an inverted wing-back for us. There's some things he does need to improve, but he is only 19. So now, in terms of squad size, we have a pretty big squad. That should last us a season. We could do a little bit of quality here and there. We're going to go through the squad next time in the new signings, but I want to show you one standout. I've gone against the grain a bit. I wanted a bit of a galactic off to help the youngsters, and welcome to Salgueros, Lorenzo Pellegrini. Season 9 and media prediction 9th. Do these people not know we've got Pellegrini? Good news is we continue to grow the club. The stadium has expanded to 10,000 seats now. We've now also got quite the player path where we've got our B team, under 19s, and recently we've just added an under 23 squad as well. With success comes challenges, and now we enter the Europa League, and these are our fixtures. Some big teams in there. There's the team for season nine. Do you know what? I quite like the fact that it's pretty much the same team as last season. Just little tweaks. Pellegrini's in the team. Corsi is. I'm going to get as much out of him in his 35th year as I can. Plus the fact that Capellas down here is actually wanting to leave the club. I don't know why, but he wants to leave. So he can wait for his chance and let the big Don Pellegrini strut his stuff. So Gaspar left us, who was our left back. We've replaced him with a completely different type of player. This is Samal. He is from the Czech Republic. He's only 20. He's more of a ball playing defender. Plus, Gaspar was six foot two. This kid is five foot six. So any deep crosses to the back post, we're in trouble. But on the ball, he is an improvement. We'll see how he goes. 58,000 pounds, by the way, from Sparta Prague in Czechia. So that meant our transfer business was done at 1.1 million. Pretty reasonable fees. We've brought in another 300,000 from loans. Basically just loans and constantinescu has gone as well. And our finances have never been more healthy. 11 million in profit now. Now we've had a pretty tough start in the league. The Europa League has caused us a few problems and the League Cup as well. There's so many cups we're in. We're having loads of matches and I'm getting injuries all over the place. However, we have had some good results. A nice draw away to Sporting. Even more impressive, the same scoreline away to Porto. So we'd lost our first three Europa League games. So we did a slight change with a big game against Fiorentina. I dropped the defensive line back a bit and I trapped them inside. Simple as that. It led to a fantastic performance and one of our best victories yet. So we've had an interesting start to season nine. We're out of the Alliance Cup, which I don't care about. There is too many cups in Portugal. We're in the fourth round of the Taco de Portugal, which we will go for. Europa League, horrible start, but that result there gives us a chance of qualifying. And in the league, we've only lost the two games. We're drawing too many, but because of all the injuries and all the matches, seventh at the minute isn't too bad. The only slight problem is we play Benfica next. And if you look at the league table, Benfica have won 10 out of 10 with a goal difference of plus 24. So we're about to take on the best team in the league. They've beat us every time we've played them so far. 
So they play a 4 4 2, but it's a fluid 4 4 2. What I'm going to try and do is shut down the central midfielders. So both of them are really good. He's like been the player of the year the last three seasons. And next to him is Eric Rick the model Martel. Really good, but and what I'm going to do to try and stop them is tight mark both of them. Then I'm going to ask the fullbacks to get shown onto their opposite foot. So they'll have to come inside and there won't be a pass on to the central midfielders because they'll be tightly marked. This is the theory. And then I'm going to try and rough up both wingers by just smashing into them hard. Nothing crazy about that. We're just going to try and stop them that way. But we are at home, so I'm going to keep the team instructions. I'm not going to drop too deep. Let's just see what we could do. Anything against these lots of bonus because they are smashing everybody. We did really well. They did break us down to the 65th minute. It was only 1-0 though, and in the 75th minute, Pellegrini with the corner. Big Chow Amaral, 1-1. One, one. We are the first team to take any points off Benfica this season. Come on! On the back of that, we got off the new contract, and it's the biggest one yet. Four years. So things are going quite nice. Look, we're sitting down in eighth, but we've played three big teams now, and we're only three points off the Champions League places. This is going well. However, this game is here to test us, and test us it will with the news that these five players will be away at the African Cup of Nations for six weeks. Yeah, horrible news, but despite that, we won another game in the Europa League, which means we're getting to the qualifying places. But this massive fixture list with all these different competitions is starting to take its toll. So add those international call-ups to all them injuries. It looks like I've hardly got a squad now, and I thought I bought too many players in in the off-season. My injury-ravaged squad lost to Braga, because we always lose to Braga. Everyone's got that one team, haven't they? We then lost in the Europa League to Shakhtar, which means we are clinging on now in the last qualifying place with a couple of games left. The only problem is we've got United and Feyenoord up next. In the league, however, we're up to sixth. It's looking okay there. So yeah, this has been tough. All them fixtures has been tougher than I thought. Now, we've got an alternative tactic. I've been using the League Cup to try a different version of this. We use the inverted wingbacks in our main tactic, but because Samuel here is so good going forward, we try this one in cup games. We're using two complete wing backs, asking them to cut inside, and we're just playing a little bit wider, giving us a bit more options. A complete wing back will still come inside now and again, but they'll also go around the outside as well. So I've been trying that in cup games just to see how it runs. When we do that, we change the register to a deep line playmaker because these lot will bomb on. Just worth a try. Just evolution of the tactic. It's January, so we're going to get some bodies in. We don't have a lot of money to spend, but we will get some in. Now, this guy, Carlos Valencia, has just came in on a free transfer from Colombian football. I like him. He's only 19. And I'm going to show you how I found him. And I've never done this until I tried this. So it's another recruitment tip, dude. It's another recruitment tip. So go to any of your scouts. I've picked this guy here, Ibo. And we'll go to reports, choose scout reports. And this gives the reports specifically picked by him. So it narrows them all down. You can see he's picked a couple of good players out here. If I look at Gary here from Spanish football. Nice player. Could have bid for him. A little bit too expensive. Did the same with Jose Altador. He's got more of an eye on North America for me. And you can see he's picked out these players from Costa Rica. And one of them I've added to my shortlist, Navarro. He looks fantastic. Fantastic. So I'm going to try and get him over the line. So that's a nice little tool. Is go to your scouts individually and see what they've got to offer you. Some will have more than others, such as Umbo and Penza, who is a Salgueirish legend. If we go to his score reports, he's got an absolute truckload of players to work through. A lot of A plus A star recommendations as well. So the good news is the boys are back from the African Cup of Nations, so we can start to play a bit of football again because Bamba's been superb. We missed him big time. Pellegrini, by the way, I've used him quite wisely. I haven't played him every match. His average rating's over seven. He's bossing it. But the goals have dried up a bit from Ferreira. He didn't actually score for his first six matches. He's starting to get back in the groove now. He's pinged five and in the league, but nowhere near as prolific as last season. It's probably because some teams have worked out our tactics. So the evolution into this one, when I get everybody fit and I can use it, might be the way to go. But there is some big news. Now, we said we were going to concentrate on the Taka de Portugal. And you'll notice we've drew Benfica CB. It's not Benfica, it's Benfica CB. If you look a little bit higher up at the teams left in the tournament, there's no Porto, there's no Benfica, there's no Sporting. There's no Braga. Now, I don't want to get carried away, but we have a hell of a chance in that tournament if we can get our full team back. So now the Cup of Nations is gone. Players are back from injury. Nice little January transfer window coming up. I've got high hopes. We might be able to push up and challenge Sporting for that third place. It'll be tough, but keep an eye on that Cup run. Hey, yo. Oh, I almost forgot. There's always room for one more Galactico, right?
so that didn't go to plan, did it? The European campaign was a disaster. We only won twice. And then the ironclad win of the Takati Portugal, we got knocked out by Tondela. Tondela, by the way, who were fighting relegation. You could argue we got FM'd because they only had two shots, but we should have took that one. We should have took that one. And the sixth round is actually the semis. So what an opportunity. Blown. In the league, we've been all right. We've kind of chugged our way through it, but at no point have I felt like we've been absolutely flying. This has led me to our friend, the Data Hub and the Analyst Report. And this time for once, it's not about where we're conceding goals because we're not conceding that many. Our defence is pretty good. We're just not creating much. So I thought we'd have a look at a new tab today. Now this tab here is going to help us decide if our formation that we think is working is actually working. So we've clicked that now and you can see here we've got our formations used down here. So these are all the formations we've used throughout the last 50 matches. And it's going to tell us how successful it has been. So for example, we are currently using the 4-2-3-1. They call it a 4-5-1 with two DMs. And you can see here we've used it 80% of the time. Started 45 out of the 50 matches. But you can see, clear cut chances, we are plus 23 up. So obviously that means we've had 23 more chances than playing against opposition when using this 4-5-1-2 DM, which is pretty decent, right? But then if we look a little bit further down, you can see here it goes into a bit more detail. So it's got the 23 there, the plus 23, which equates to a chance every 86 minutes. 86 minutes, a chance against every 180. So it's super solid. But my question is, is a chance every 86 minutes going to win us things? It's solid, but unspectacular. And that is a good summarization of this formation and tactic, I think. It's super solid, but it's not spectacular. And to get to the next level, do we need to think about changing it up? So we're sixth in the league with about eight matches to go. We've only lost six matches, but we were a little bit far away from getting Champions League. That's not in the equation this year. So it's all about keeping in these European places. And again, with the solid and unspectacular theme, we can see we've scored 37 in the 26 matches and only conceded 31. So in a bit, we're going to look at revitalising this tactic and looking into if we can make it a bit more aggressive. So listen, we've got about eight matches left there, something like that. And I'm going to do what I like to do at the end of the season when there's not much on it. I'm going to experiment with some other tactics. I might try three at the back. It's going to play around a bit. Getting ready for next season. I just feel like we need to be a bit more aggressive than the safe but solid one we've got at the minute. And oh yes, did we experiment. You can see there, there's one of the tactics we used. The three at the back with a libero. This version as well, bringing back the halfback. You'll notice the inverted wingbacks are on attack. It's safe to say I have not settled on any formation yet for season 10. I'm still playing around a bit. But it was fun to watch. I have loved having Pellegrini as an option. We've used him sensibly, started about half the matches. He wrapped it up with 24 appearances, 5 goals, an average rating of 7. However, he has decided to retire and given his physicals are starting to drop, I'm not going to fight that, but a good one season hit with him. Similar story with Rafinha. I used him mostly off the bench, but in his 11 or so matches, he gave us four assists. He just comes on. He's got a little bit of class about him. And it was good to see after a really slow start, our boy Ferreira managed to bag 20 goals again this season. 16 in the league, second top scorer overall. So he's still got it. Yes, mad little season, mad little season. It kind of staled out at one point when we got knocked out of that semi-final of the cup and that's when we started experimenting and kind of wrote the season off. But we still finished fifth and finished strongly. So on to season 10. You may remember this. The stadium got expanded, giving us an extra 2,000 seats for 10,900. Well, out of the blue, they've decided they're going to do it again and chuck in another near 3,000 seats to make the stadium even bigger. I mean, I'm not mad at it, but what I am kind of mad at is next season's transfer budget. The wage budget's gone up a little bit, which is good. The transfer budget is 2.2. Now, given the fact that we make these lot a load of money, we could have done with a bit more, but it's not a disaster. 
and finances have remained healthy throughout. So we don't lose money every season now. Sponsorship, TV money, top division stuff all helps. So it's off-season time. I'm right in the middle of thinking about what we're doing for next season. I thought it was worth revisiting our Gegenpress squad view to see how suitable the team actually are. Now looking at it just straight away like that, it looks like we are decent at it. We are set up pretty well for a gig and press approach if we want to stick to it. There's not many people who can't deal with it. In fact, some of them absolutely excel in it. You're looking at work rate across the top, teamwork, stamina, natural fitness, decisions, bravery, anticipation, and a little cheeky bit of acceleration. Those are just mine. You might have a different take on it, but those are mine. There's the squad gig and view there. It's in the description as well if you want to give it a little go. But judging the team, we are still decently set up for that approach if we want to use it, which is good because I hadn't checked it in a couple of seasons. So to plan then, to plan. Now this is our team. That's the super solid one. We're probably going to work off that because I feel like we need to keep it because it does perform well against the big teams at times. They didn't beat us that many times this season, just that Benfica game. And we weren't using this tactic. So I want to make an aggressive version of that. I don't think that starting 11 needs a lot of work. I'm only going to improve someone if someone jaw dropping becomes available in the off season. For now, I'm pretty happy with that starting 11. But I think it's time to get deep into pre-season with transfers, the new tactic, any other techniques for scouting we're going to do. Ah, let's get into it, eh? Pre-season was rudely interrupted by RB Leipzig offering us a job. Nope. And then Aston Villa offered us a job as well. That's arguably the biggest job offer we've had yet. All right, scratch that. This is the biggest offer we've had yet. Spain want us to be the national coach. Although tempting, I'm going to say no. In a bid to freshen things up a bit, I'm a strong believer in rotating around your staff. So Marcelino, he loves a hard tackle, but for me... It's time to go. A few of them are out of contract as well, so we're going to get rid and freshen things up. So welcome in new assistant manager, Luis Boamorte. Now, not only is he a nice fella, but look at his people management. He's motivating. I like it. I've also improved my coaching staff by bringing in Ilke Gundogan. And you can't tell me that he's not going to help some of my players. First off, the bad news. Donelli, our keeper since Breno left us, has gone. He's gone back to Brazilian football. He's joined America for 3.8 million. You can see there, we bought him for seven grand, for seven grand. But he's gone back to Brazilian football, couldn't really turn it down. And he was kicking up a bit of a fuss. So he is out of here. And looking at the transfers out, you can see we brought in about five million pounds from that play sale and a heap of loans as well. We're getting like Chelsea here with like a loan farm. But more interesting is the players in. We've spent 650,000, which is about as much as I want to spend this off season. And we brought in a load of players mostly from some big teams, a few free transfers as well. Now, we raided Sport in Lisbon twice, and this is the man we've spent a bit of money on. 450,000. Gabriel Silva can play up front just off the striker. Like him. How about Virgil Dorsberg from Feyenoord? Centre-back who can play right across the back line. Free transfer. Now, Radek Vitek is came in initially as a backup, but then we sold Danelli, so he might get pushed to first choice if we can't find another. Elizu initially on loan from Fluminense in Brazil, option to buy for 5 million look what stands out on him flair agility could be something special as always i like to bring in a little bit of experience as well for an incredibly young squad he's not quite a galactico i would say but sofian amrabat in central midfield with a little hint of left back as well free transfer wages aren't crazy at all at four thousand a week bit of a no-brainer now there is one sign in there near the bottom pedro maria alonso you can see him there now it's a free transfer I want to show you where I got him from. And, I mean, where do you see him? Right, here he is. This is Pedro Maria Alonso. His physicals are off the chain for a 21-year-old. He's got acceleration and agility of 19. He's a six-foot left wing back. If you look at his former teams up here, you can see it's Man City, and he had a little loan spell at Girona. So how the heck did we get him? Right, so you go to Around the World tab and leagues in focus, then you've got all your big leagues or whatever leagues you've got loaded up and the big leagues is what we're going to focus on so you could go somewhere like the Bundesliga for example and you go to transfers and this is what I did with Pedro from Man City once you go to transfers you'll see all transfers here you'll drop this down and go to release players and this is a big long list of all the players released by the teams in that division so all the big teams here and this is how we got Pedro I was just scrolling down and I noticed I went to Man City and I saw their players and I just looked at them I was like, right, who's been released here? You can see there's a few players here that look pretty decent. Ropnak, for example, released by Dortmund's probably second team. There he is. He's available now, so I can make a bid for him. That's that's basically the way I 
got Pedro Alonso. We've started the season pretty good. Pre-season was pretty solid, tried a few things, and the Conference League qualifying has gone really well, and we've won our first game in the league. Now, setup-wise, that's the one we're used to. That's what we used last season, but we've gone away from it. We've kept elements of it, but we have gone away from it and gone a bit more expressive, and we've moved to this. This is what I'm using so far, and it's largely due to our new complete wing-back, Alonso, just because he's that good going forward. I didn't want to restrict him by him being an inverted wing-back on defend. So I thought, let's expose it down here. I've also asked the big man, Big Dick, to move into an advanced playmaker role. I think he can do it. If you'll have a look here at his playmaking attributes, he's got them all. He's just a really good ball-winning midfielder as well, but I want him to get a bit more expressive. So I've moved him forward, and that signing of Amrabat has helped that. So Capellas moves over one. Regista goes that way. We've still got an inverted win back on one side. Bamba's still chilling down the right-hand side, but it's a new asymmetric version of our tactic. Squad's decent, it's quite bulky, and they all seem to fit in with the work rate I'm asking of them. So no problems there. In the league, we've started well. We've won two out of two, and this includes, ladies and gents, the best performance I've had in charge of Salgueros. Yes, so the season has started pretty well, you know, and this is a landmark result for us, I think. It's not even much the result, it's more about the performance. 2-2 away to Sporting, but match facts wise, we give them a bit of a battering, you know. Now, it has us sat in fourth position at the minute. We're seven points behind Benfica with a game in hand, but we've got the big three teams above us. And this is how we've done it. We've gone with an attacking mentality. We've cranked it right up there to attacking. To offset that, I've dragged Capellas' register all back to a defensive midfielder, so he's got a, a pair in there with Cruz working really well at the minute. Now, mentality is an interesting one. When you change mentality, it obviously changes the mentality of, of each of your players as well. For example, if we look at someone like the right back here, he's on inverted wing back on defend. Once we click onto that, you can see inverted wing back on defend. Now, his player instructions will tell you his mentality is balanced despite being on a defender duty. That's because of the overall team mentality. If I change the team mentality to balanced and go back to the same player player instructions, you can see his mentality is now defensive. So bear that in mind when changing your team mentality, it's going to change each position's mentality as well. So yeah, the only change that I've really done from the last episode where I showed you this tactic was the Capellas role leading. It just sits a little bit deeper because we've got that attacking mentality anyway. And if you look at his defensive midfielder there on support, his personal player instructions will see he's still got a positive mentality because of the overall team mentality. Now something rather big has just happened. We played Benfica and we went up 2-0 just before half time. Now Benfica did fight back into half time. It went to 2-2 after about 55 minutes. But my boys have made a sterner stuff this season. We are a match for anyone. And in the 88th minute, we went and got it. Biggest win we've had yet over one of the biggest teams in Europe. 
So that tells me that not only are we competing now, but we're getting up there to their sort of level. Previously, when we played someone like Benfica, we would get battered and hardly have a shot. But now, we're actually beating these teams. To help me along my way, I've got some set opposition instructions that I use for every team we play against now. Every team. So we go to the position tab and these are the set opposition instructions that I use for every team we play against and they are dead, dead simple. You go to show onto foot and we're putting everybody on the right hand side onto their left foot, forcing them the opposite direction and tackling hard the winger on the right hand side. This is because we do have a gap down this side. So I want to force their players away from my complete wing back on the left hand side in case he's high up the pitch and force them infield where more of my players are. So far... It's worked quite well. We've done well in the Conference League as well. We've got two out of two there, so hopefully we can get quite deep into that. Near the end of the transfer window, we made a couple more signings. You can see now we've spent 2.7 million, which is quite a lot for us, but I do believe we've found our keeper for the next 10 years. So this is Dylan Drovic. He's came in from Australian football, Sydney FC, 1.6 million, already valued a stupid amount. He think he's 18. What's he going to be like in a few years? The other one we signed was Lindo and Basso. We went back to our favourite stomping ground of South Africa. I'm going to play him in an attacking midfield. He's six foot four, by the way. Attributes already sky high. Keep an eye on him. Currently, I've got this guy in goals, Velkovic. He's on loan from Benfica. But to be honest, I think I'm going to chuck my 18-year-old in, take a risk and just get him in the team right now. And just like that, he's got a perfect face for an Australian, right? In both surprising and shocking news, I asked my board to increase the youth facilities yet again and they've accepted again. We're just off the back of deadline day, going well in the Conference League, going well in the league. Our new boy Mabasso is starting to look something special. But deadline day has brought us a few problems. One of our favourites has left the club. Antonio Capellas, he's finally left us. He's gone for 10.5 million to Bournemouth, the same team that took Hugo Felix off us. At this point, it meant our finances are really good now which allowed me a deadline day swoop for Vlad the Destroyer, Saisan from Romanian football. He's an 18-year-old centre-back. Do you know what? I was going to bed him in gently, but looking at his mentals and the physicals and the fact he's 18, I think I'm going to throw him in the team straight away. 2.3 million, our biggest outlay yet. Now, do you remember the thumbnail of the last episode about chance creation? And we were on something like plus 23, I think. Well, new tactic and the way they've bed into it, even using a more defensive role in the defensive midfielder, Check this out under my head. You ready? From plus 23, we're now plus 48. More than double. More than double. We've chopped down the chance creation time from about 86 minutes to 43. We're giving a chance away slightly more, but overall, that is a massive, massive improvement. It goes to show we're going the right way with this tactic and this attacking mentality. I've honestly shied away from attacking mentalities for a few editions of Football Manager, but right now... I urge you to give it a go because it's making a big difference in our team. Now, this tactic is available in the Patrons. You can download it, tweak it to your team. But at the minute, it's working really nicely. Yes, the team are cooking now. Five straight wins and we haven't lost in the league since the back end of November. Next up, it's a bigger test in Sporting, our big rivals for the Champions League spot. So like I said, I do this every match. Whoever we're playing against, I'll go up to opposition instructions, I'll select everyone and I'll pop in that tab there, which means my set opposition instructions are locked and loaded. We didn't just beat them, we absolutely battered them. The good form continued in the league and in Europe as well. A real standout performance against Dynamo Kiev in the last 16. Following this destruction of Chavez, our chance creation stats now are a ridiculous plus 66. That's triple, triple where we were last season. And our scouts continue to do us proud. The best wonder kid in the world in the year 2033 is our boy Mabasso. To be fair, he's had a cracking first season at 19 years old. 19 starts, 14 goals in all competitions. Also ranked number 20 is our keeper. I knew he was going to be a good signing. He's now valued between 27 and 40 million. And the best bit is about our keeper, no release clause. 
while we're talking about players, I want to shout out Amrabat. He's had a cracking, cracking season. He started 15 times, super solid. I'm going to keep getting an experienced player every season because the rest of the team is so young. He's been superb. With success comes the Vultures, though, and you can see Motta's wanted, Alonso's wanted, Big Dick's always wanted. Now, Sabaya up front is wanted. The cracking form has meant that we sit in third place at the minute behind the big two and sandwiched just above Sporting. We've played a game more, but as it stands, we are in the Champions League. As for the Conference League, we've qualified all the way to the quarterfinals and we've got a massive, massive test now against Roma. And Jose's still there. I'm going up against Jose. He's 70. That great win against Roma meant we made the semi-finals where we played Austrians Lask. We absolutely battered them in the first leg, but it was only 3-1. But thanks to the greatest wonder kid in the world, Mabasso, we went away to Austria and got the result we needed. We're in the Conference League final. This has been a great season. We are flying. We are such a goal threat now. So we're in the final of the Conference League. Totally unexpected. Now, look at the league table. It's super tight. There's two games to go and we're two points behind Sporting to get in the Champions League next year. It's going to be tough, but do not rule us out yet. In the first game, it took us to the 87th minute, but we got the job done. Unfortunately, at the same time, Sporting were away to Hill Presente and they won as well. Which meant we had to win and rely on favours to get the Champions League spot. At home to Vizela, we played probably our worst game of the season. We got the draw, but it wasn't good. So the league campaign finished just shy of the Champions League spots, finishing fourth, but a great season overall. Massive improvement in terms of goals scored. 70 goals scored, only conceding 38. If we can tighten up a bit next season, we should put in a decent challenge. But now it's time for the highlight of our season and probably this save, you know. It's a Conference League final and we're playing Athletic Bilbao, so really tough. What a good team they are. I haven't decided on my team yet, but as always, I'm doing the same opposition instructions, forcing them away from my left-hand side. Into the final we go. One minute gone, less than 50 seconds gone. Bilbao down the right-hand side. Jesus. Ten minutes gone. My boys are made of sterner stuff and the high press works. The defender panics. Ferreira pounces and Silva with a beautiful finish. 1-1. One, one. 24 minutes gone. Alonso, how do you fancy it? Oh, my God. 2-1 up. Into the second half. We're doing all right. There's 60 minutes gone, though. A nothing ball into the middle. Garrido gets there first. It's 2-2. Two, two. It's the 88th minute. It's been back and forth. But Williams puts it in for 3-2. Absolute heartache. I am gutted for the lads. Nearly historic. But look, it was still a cracking season. And with that tactic next season, I think we're going to push and try and get into that top three. Young players were great. Mabasso with 16 goals from 25 games. Gabriel Silva, what a first season for us. 12 goals, 13 assists. Ferreira, again, injury ravid, but still 23 goals. And Bong Musa, 22 goals. He's now wanted by so many teams, by the way. And on that theme, this summer's transfer window is going to be a bit hectic, I think, because Motta's wanted by a load of teams from the Premier League and Saudi Arabia. Alonso's wanted by loads of teams. These guys have got release clauses. It's a problem. Dick Gang's wanted by the Premier League. Maini's wanted by Leeds. Bong Moose is wanted by the World. Ah. So I've seen this coming. I've already got four players on the way in, just in case. And you'll notice two of those are from South Africa. Again, it is an absolute goldmine down there. There's another lad coming in from Australian football who's going to be a midfielder. And I've got a young lad coming in who's been disregarded by PSG. They're the type of players we like. Players with a point to prove. 
We'll get into those players next time, but we're going to work off this tactic. The big problem we've got, and it's probably a Hugo Felix situation with Big Dick, he's out of contract next season, he's worth 20 million, he's probably going to have to go if someone will come in for him because he won't sign the new contract. With Binance is sitting at 24 million in profit, and that beautiful stadium, which now holds nearly 14,000, the board have actually upped the wage budget to 300,000 a week, and the transfer budget is now 6.6. .6. We can maybe do a bit with that. Ooh, hang on a minute. Bournemouth have just been relegated and the transfer listed a load of their players including Hugo Felix and Antonio Capellas. <laughs> Season 11. The bookies think we're going to be worse than last year. Maybe they're basing it on the fact our transfers out last season was 47 million. That's right, two big moves right at the end of the season. We enjoyed our boy Alonso for one whole season. He's gone to Ipswich, the triggered his release clause for a measly 10.5 million. But we saw it coming. Big Dick, the leader of the Dick Gang, he's gone to Burnley in the Premier League. They triggered his clause as well, 20 million pounds. We had to take it. He's gone. That obviously meant we got loads of money. 44 million in the bank. It gave us a little bit to play with in the transfer window. What should I do with that money? What should I... Enough teasing. After less than half a season away, Capellas is back. Bournemouth are relegated. They give us him on loan. But even better, our boy Hugo returns to the club. It's a free loan and he's out of contract in the summer. We could get him for free, but he's back. Add to the return of those two legends with Benjamin Forshaw, who's in from PSG. I have no idea where to play this guy. I'm kind of tempted to play him back here in midfield, but what do you think? So like I said last time, I don't think we need many players. Well, we didn't. We didn't need hardly any players until those two key players left us, Big Dick and the left wing back, which is probably more vital. We made this entire tactic based around his quality. And now he has gone. What do we do? Now Alonso's backup last season was Samuel. He's decent, he's decent, but he's more of a backup player. I cannot see him being our starter. We need to find someone who's worthy of that position. The system is entirely built for someone to dominate this flank. So we need someone who's as good or ideally better than Alonso. It's going to be tough though. Now because the finances are pretty good now, our scouting budget is well up there. So back to world's wide scouting. So we've got a generic left-back search underway, but we can really go for it now because we've got a big scouting squad. I can get detailed here in the search for our left-back. I'm going to send them to specific places around the world. Now remember, our scouting team has been built to cover all of the world, right around the world, so I'm going to focus on their strengths. For example, I'm going to choose a North American one, and I'm going to use Jose Altador to look there because that's where he's strong. We're also going to look in Brazil. We've got a good record in Brazil. And for that, we'll use Survivor, who's got extensive knowledge in Brazil. Right, so they're set up, good to go. Hopefully, they'll bring something back. I'm also going to do one of my personal favourite tricks, is get to some big teams, B teams, because after all, that is where we found Alonso. So hopefully, we'll get to that later and have our new left-back to show you. But now, I was wondering, how can we improve on this tactic? We scored a boatload of goals last season. We should have done better in the league, I think. So what I've done is, I've gone back to last season... And I've gone through each of our defeats in the league. And now you'll notice when we quickly go through them here that none of them are absolutely big beatings. They're all by one goal, two at max. But when I went into them, there was more than one game like this one where we absolutely battered them, but somehow managed to lose the match. Here again, here's another one. Another game where we should have won. And if we did win this, we would have comfortably qualified for that Champions League. Even this game against Benfica, we were in it. We had more shots. We probably should have got a result, even though they are the home team and the best team in Portugal. And again, this defeat against Porto, we should have won this match. So there's things we can do with our tactic in games where we're dominating to make sure we get over the line. Another against Braga. It's good that we look at this because it just shows you what a good season we had and how close it was to being even better. Then I have two options. Do I go even more aggressive in games where we're dominating but we haven't got the breakthrough? Or do we pull the brakes on a bit and tighten up the back? Because we're attacking and that formation is attacking, I'm tending to think we find an even more attacking way. And I love this setup and we will start the season with it. However, if there's a game where we're not making those clear cut chances and I feel like we're dominating but not getting through, there's things we can do here to change it up. And if you look, we've got two defensive midfielders. I'm thinking of getting pretty extreme with one of them. If this man was to start, he does give us a range of possibilities. You can see he can play anywhere down the middle or even out wide, but mostly down the middle is where it's quite interesting. 
This means we have options with him. If we're totally dominating, we can potentially move him forward even more or even put him in the attacking midfield strata alongside the other two. If we do this, we could obviously just knock Capellas along and he's going to be joined in the pivot by Motta. Then the question would be, what role would he occupy? Would he stay as an attacking midfielder? Would we make him a basso, even more attacking and knock him to a shadow striker? It's an interesting thing to think about. Now you may be screaming at your TV and saying, why don't you just move someone out wide, someone attacking out wide, or why don't you put another striker on? Because there's not a lot wrong. They are the top scorers in the league and this complete wing back was absolutely fire. So I'm just thinking this role could be our little floater role for the season, possibly jumping into there if we're not making that breakthrough. Keep an eye on that. We started well in the league, particularly our boy Hugo. I mean, that is a murder on the pitch against Casapia. Again, though, shots, but at least lots of them are on target now. It was more of the same against Chavez. Some of the boys linking up beautifully. Hugo puts that in. Now, as I roll that back, you'll notice I experimented in this game to see if we could break them down a bit better. And there's our defensive midfielder, Forsha, who's moved up into attacking midfield. And you can see we've got basically a front five there. And the defensive midfield was covered by Motta and Capellas. So I used it in this match and it worked really well. XG was good, good 3-0 win. For some reason, in the Europa League qualifiers, I decided to rest most of my team. And against Zagreb, we drew away, which was a decent result, but again, we should have scored way more. And in the home leg, with a heavily rotated team, we somehow managed to lose. Meaning, we're out of the Europa League already. And that throws us back into the Conference League. Our redemption, I guess. As the transfer window slammed shut, we brought in 6.5 million and we spent 3.5 and I promise that calculator will be out next episode. Now, I wasn't going to buy any more strikers, but my Asian scouts brought up Kim Min and for 1.7 million, a wonder kid already, I had to make the buy. We like our experience at this club and with Amrabat retiring, I brought in Rodrigo Bentenker. Yes, he's 36. He's not going to start many matches, but he's going to be a solution from the bench to shore up some matches. Here I am at Barcelona. Why am I at Barcelona? Because in the search for a new left back, I ended up in Barcelona's B team, FC Barcelona Athletic, and I've got myself a left back. This is Pep Arnalo. Now he is as good, if not potentially better, than the left back we lost. I feel like our problems are solved. He's on loan for the season. We can buy him at any point for 2.7 million, which we will do. We just didn't have enough to buy him in the window. But he is our new complete left wing back. Delighted. Right, so early days, but we have started the season on fire. Maybe going out of the Europa League was a good thing because we've won five out of six. We haven't lost yet. Hugo Felix has scored seven already. Mabasso's on fire. And I hope you notice we've actually finally beaten Braga. There's our setup. And that's been the team that started most of the matches. Felix up there next to Mabasso. Gabriel Silva, really unlucky to miss out, but I've got so many options up there now. And the good news is this man, he's had two matches, Arnolo. Two games, his average rating's already 7.4. It looks like he's going to be absolutely perfect. And this man, this man, the guy in from PSG who's got multiple positions. I don't know what to do with him, but we start matches with him there. If we're not breaking a team down, I will move him up into that slot there. I'll move Capellas across, knowing that Mossa will jump in there as well. So far, so good. Now, there's about to be a drop-off this season. I just hope it's not too drastic. Have you ever noticed when things are going well for you in Football Manager? Something happens just to grind it all to a halt. Gabriel Silva breaks his leg pretty much out for the season. Despite that setback, we carried on storming on and did the unthinkable and beat Benfica. Going into November, we are top of the league. We haven't lost yet. We are absolutely flying. And then it all grinds to a halt. Seven of our squad are leaving us for up to six weeks, including four or five absolute key players. Yeah, I didn't think about this when I was plundering around South Africa, finding players. So of that team there in this tactic, you're looking at Mayini who's going to be out. Mabasso's going to be out. Sibaya's going to be out. Oh, any more? Yeah, on the bench, Bamba's going to be out. So basically, I've got no right winger now. 
Problem I've got is Mayini and Bamba are my two starting wingers, and Baker's not really a winger, so I don't really have anybody to play in this slot, damn it. This brings me to one of my great frustrations with Football Manager. So I've got Edgar Motta here, who can play down the right-hand side. Ish, look at his position map. He can play perfectly at right wing back, perfectly a little bit higher up, and he can play more than adequately in the attacking midfield slot. But no, but no, he cannot play as a normal midfielder on the right. Somebody tell me how that makes sense. But look, he's going to have to play there and fill in for a few weeks and see how he does because we can't bring anybody else in. As for the other two slots, it's probably a bit of an opportunity for a couple of the young players. Mostly Kim Min, I'm looking forward to getting him involved. He is injured at the minute though, but he will be back for a bit of it. And thankfully, we have this legend to jump in up front, so we're not going to be too damaged, but it's still going to hurt like hell. It's nearly into the new year and we still have not lost in the league. In fact, all competitions are going pretty well, you know. We're in the semi-finals of the Alliance Cup, we're in the fifth round of the Taka de Portugal, and we've qualified comfortably in our old friend, the Conference League. Sitting second at the minute, still haven't lost. And the good news is the boys are back from the African Cup of Nations. They didn't do too well, so some of them came back a little bit earlier, which has helped keep a bit of momentum up. We're actually looking really good, and this win away to Marseille was a bit of a standout. We have put our bid in for Hugo Felix for his end of contract. Let's hope that his heart rules his head because money boys are after him. So Hugo's made his mind up, he's away now. You'll notice transfers out is up to 23 million. Unfortunately, we've lost yet another of our key players. Edgar Motta has left us. Money talks, he's gone to Saudi Arabia. They've triggered his release clause for 16 million. It was really late on and I struggled to find a replacement with him. I've got this guy in, Andrea Maric. He can do for now, I love his mentals. But is he going to be as good as Motta? Time will tell. Now, that means we've spent 9.75 million in this season, which is probably one of our biggest outlays, and we've brought in 23. So, curiosity has got the better of me. How are we doing in that challenge of ours? I haven't forgot about it, although sometimes I feel like I want to. The bottom goal down the bottom there, have a net transfer profit of £1 billion by the end of this save. Hmm. Right, so we'll go over to my manager profile. By the way, I've just realised my manager attributes have shot up, and my reputation is four and a half now. I am elite. So up to overview, and there we can see that players bought. We've brought in 109 players in our 11 seasons. So that's what, like 10 a season? Transfer value, we've spent a total of 17. We've sold 49. Doesn't include the guys we've released. And the transfer value we've brought in, we've broke the 100 million barrier to 109 million. Right, so if we take the 17 off the 100... In fact, let's get the calculator. Okay, here she is. So if we take the 17 off the 109 million that means we've got a profit of 92 million right so reset that let's get in a billion in there how do you type in a billion is that that's 100 million right so there's a billion and let's take off 92 million i think that's right and that leaves us with our grand running total of 908 million on the nose the club finances are great at 44 million but God, have I got some work to do to get to that. Meanwhile, back in the league, we've dropped a third. We've lost a couple of games to Sporting and Boa Vista. Now, we have dropped a little bit. There has been a little drop that I was worried about, but it doesn't help when we get a couple of red cards in key matches. But we have made another final. We're in the Alliance Cup final right now against Sporting. Name a more iconic duo than me and losing cup finals with Salgueros. We'd also drop to fourth in the league, drawing a couple too many matches. And this is why I love this match day screen. If you look up here, my custom view is match day essentials simple. All I've added basically is the last five games. Form guide. Now, when I look down here, you can see that a lot of them are absolutely flopping it at the minute, including some big guns. 
So when you're out of form, it's important to be ruthless. Even someone like Felix, he's got his eyes on the money now in Saudi. He's going to be dropped. Same goes for Arnolot, the left back on loan from Barca. Not good enough at the minute. It could be slightly different for Mabasso. He's only 20, so young players can be inconsistent. So I will take him out of the firing line for a bit as well. So with Porto and Benfica just starting to crank it up a gear, this means that the Conference League now looks even more important. We've been knocked out of the attack of the Portugal by Sporting as well. They are literally our nemesis. We need to get to Champions League and the Conference League is now looking like our best shot of a trophy. It was starting to look like we peaked a little too soon in the league. Porto found us out and Benfica got their revenge for the defeat earlier in the season. So I decided to really focus on the Conference League, resting players for the big games, and this game against Stuttgart was a real standout. A stunning away performance, probably the best we've had this season. And we got the job completed in the home leg. So those defeats in the league have cost us any chance, any slim chance of fighting for the title. But we are on a good run now and we're smashing goals in left, right and centre. I haven't made any changes to the tactic, we've just kept flowing through. They are getting really tired though because we've played so many matches. But by dropping those players a bit earlier on, the form has returned for a lot of them, which is ideal. So in the league, there's four games left. As it sits, we are sitting third in the Champions League spots, but look how tight it is with Boa Vista and Sporting both chasing us down. But I've got cheeky with the board and yet again, they're going to improve the club's youth facilities. I swear we're going to have a good youth intake before this save is done. So with the pressure on, the goals just kept on coming. A win in our game against Mafra would mean we qualified for our Champions League and our best ever finish in the club's history. A nice normal match got us there. I mean, what the hell was going on? Thanks to that though, we got our best ever Liga Portugal finish. Qualifying for the Champions League next season, huge. The budgets? It's our biggest budget yet with a wage budget of 550,000 per week and a transfer budget at 10.5 million. Needless to say, Hugo Felix going to Saudi Arabia is going to be a huge miss next season. 26 goals in 41 matches. So a cracking league performance and we are in the final yet again of the Conference League. We got Austria-Vienna in the semi-finals and pretty much battered them. You can see there with 22 shots to their three. So we're in the final where we will play Aston Villa. I didn't really want a Premier League team because it's always really tough. We'll have a little look at their key players now. You can see Odai Jose, Lewis McMahon, 19 year old wonder kid. Jose, how much is he worth? Ah, just 112 to 136 million. A great season though, a record total league goals, 86. So for the final, I'm not going to change a thing. I'm going to stay loyal to the, what we've been doing with our opposition instructions. We haven't been trigger and press on anybody. We've just been doing really basic things. Now, despite Villa being really good, if I pick out one of their players here, Chris Furness, I mean, their average players are all worth at least 45, 50 million. Some of them are ridiculous. I mean, they've got a centre back there for 60, 70 million. This is going to be a real tough battle, but you never know. Oh, 140 million striker. Into the final we went. 56 minutes gone. Sam Well down the left hand side. Deep cross to Sibaya with a huge header. Let's go. We held that lead up until the 83rd minute. Villa down the left hand side with Ahmed. He crosses and it's an own goal from Captain Fernandez, which meant we went to penalties. I'm going to let this play through. And you can just sit back and, well, you can watch it. Rotating, revolving door for my left wing backs has taken another twist. As the new season approaches, check this out. We've moved up 59 places. Little Salgueiros are now in the top 50, which has brought a bit of attention our way. How about Portugal? Mighty Liverpool. And the most tempting job offer yet. 
Brazil. But I had to turn them all down because we've got a job to do with this Salgueiros team and this mini rebuild. From last season, we couldn't get Hugo. He's gone to Saudi Arabia, remember. And Capellas, he went to Valencia. Now this meant when I looked at my team and what I was looking to replace, this is probably the biggest first 11 rebuild that we've needed for quite a few seasons. Not helped by the fact that Benjamin Forscher has gone to Sunderland in the Premier League. We sold him for 27.5 million. He came on a free a season ahead of that, so that's a huge profit. But that did mean a gaping gap in them central midfield positions. You'll also notice a big gap, yes again, in the left back position. You remember we had Pep and Lot on loan from Barcelona. The deal was done, it was done. But I hate this man. I don't hate Pep, he was ready to come, but his agent kept moving the goalposts, asked for stupid things. Deal fell through. So we brought in 34 million, another player leaving us. Was centre back Chao Amaral. We brought him from Brazilian football years ago, but we got a good fee for him. 3.4 million, he leaves us after six seasons. 34 million out meant 16.7 million in, which is the most we've spent in this save. First man in was central midfield to replace Capellas. Silvanio Voss came from West Ham on a free transfer. He's 29. Starts his career, by the way, at Ajax, if you fancy picking him up. Speaking of experience, Billy Gilmore comes in. He's 33. I wanted to get a bit more experience around all these young players because I've got wonder kids galore now. Gilmore comes in. He'll play central midfield. Another free transfer. Filippo Mane comes in from German football. He's a great young player. You can get him from Borussia Dortmund at the start of the save. He's either going to play on the right-hand side if we played more defensive fullback, or he can play central defence or a bit of a destroyer in midfield. Two balls to the squad. The next player in was from Thailand. And it was Sarakan. Now, he cost us 2.7 million from Japanese football. He's going to be a, more of a ball-winning midfielder when we need to lock a game down, but his physicals are elite. Look at them. Okay, Wunderkid alert. This is Sergio Pozo. He's came in from Chilean football from Colo Colo. They like to think he's a left-back. I see him as a centre-back. Only 19, he's already got 10 caps for Chile. He's cost us 4.7 million, so quite a big outlay. But his current value was shot up already to 23 to 32. Looks like good business. Also from South America, from Peru to be exact, Oscar Azario. He's a 23 year old striker. He's going to be a target forward. He's 6 foot 6, by the way, jumping reach of 18. Going to offer us something a little bit different. So we've been working hard in the off season with scouting focuses, with suggestions of the director of football. And then there was one tab that I've totally forgot about. And it is the shortlist tab. Now, I am really bad for adding a player and just putting them on here indefinitely. Years ago, and I totally forget, totally forget that they're on there. This happened with Adam Asnu. Now, he is in the game. He's not a new gen, regen. He starts at Bayern Munich's second team. I wanted him for ages. I added him ages and ages ago. Look at all the positions he can play. He's a key, key player. We've actually signed him now from Malaga. Hello, Trek. For 5 million. Biggest outlay we've ever done. 5 million. Initially, I thought I'm going to play him at left wing back. More on that later. But he can also play on the right. Quite got an eye on him to play in central midfield as well. Just a good all round player. Again, peak age at 28. So I urge you to get back to your shortlist and have a look through it because honestly, some of these lot on here have been on there for season upon season, thinking about the future. And I've totally forgot about them. But now, I've got a chance of getting them. So it's a new season, but I've kept my staff pretty much the same apart from one. Luis Bomote got stolen by Villarreal. They stole him off us. So naturally, we replaced him with Alex Awobi. Who else? <laughs> right? But his people management is really good, which is what I like. And his preferred formation is narrow, which is kind of what we're playing. So he seemed a good fit. So we qualify for the Champions League, but we have to qualify for it. And the first qualifying round was a tough looking game against Galatasaray. In the away leg, we absolutely bossed it. A stunning, stunning result. And by the way, look at a few of the names in the Galatasaray team that we've got at the minute. Baku, Mason Mount, Nicholas Jackson, Ben Britton Diaz. I mean, they're getting old and the legs started to show. Pretty comfortable tie that. The next one was PSV. This was a bit closer, but a game we played really well in the away leg, beating them in Holland. Which meant we have qualified for the Champions League proper and we're going to be playing against some of these big, big teams here. Just waiting for the fixtures to get announced. As the season got into full flow, so did we. 17 games unbeaten now. Do you remember all those problems we used to have against Braga? Well, no more. No more. So a really nice start to the season. Let's keep it calm though. We started like this last season, fell away a little bit. We changed a tiny couple of things in the tactic. A tiny couple of things. The first one, got a ball playing defender now when Pozo plays because he's that good. The second one, 
We've settled on an inverted fullback role here instead of the inverted wing back, so he sits back a bit. Now you might have noticed a few new names in that highlight, and here's one of them. This is Jorge Hernandez. Right, I've just got him on loan from Bayer Leverkusen. He's an attacking midfielder. In theory, he's there to replace Felix. His finishing stands out like a sore thumb on 19, but he's got so much standing out. We've got a future fee locked in for him, which is pretty reasonable as well, at 17 million. I'm going to get him in the team as soon as he gets his fitness up. And you can see Asno is currently in that left wing back spot. There he is. But, but the rotating, revolving door for my left wing backs has taken another twist. With this tactic, I've got laid out the ideal guy for that left wing back spot in real life would be Davis at Bayern Munich. Now, obviously, I am 12 years in, so he's going to be 34 and we probably couldn't get him anyway. But I think I've found the next Davis. So there is Davis's profile when you start the game. You can see everything that stands out there. His physicals are ridiculous. That acceleration and pace on oh my days. His crossing's okay, could be better, but dribbling, the flair. It's fantastic. He'd be the perfect wing back. Now, let me show you Maurizio Suzano, who I've just got on loan with a view to a permanent move. And here he is. He's on loan from Hoffenheim. He's already been capped by Portugal. Two caps, one goal. They are stolen from a lower league team years ago. But look at what we're looking at here. The acceleration, the pace, the crossing ability, the dribbling, the mentals. So if I put these two next to each other, you can see what I'm talking about now. You can see why I'm potentially really excited about this guy. There's not a lot of difference there, is there? The attributes are very, very similar. So he's got to play. He's got to play. I'm just going to get him fit and then he's in the team. The guy that was there, Asnu, who I've been chasing forever, can definitely do a role though. He could probably jump into there. Potentially, we can get more expansive with this role. We've made a second alternative tactic for that. Here it is. You can see I've got a double complete wing back pushing Maini on a bit. This is one I'm toying with that we might jump into purely because I've got two really good wing backs now. So let's not get excited, but we are sitting top of the league. We've only played three times. All the other teams have played five or four, so it's a pretty damn good start. Couldn't have asked for a better start to the season. Once we get those two new players in as well, there could be fireworks. So we'll see how it goes. There might be a few days before the next video because apparently something's going on in the world. Uh. So as you saw, what a start to this season. We have absolutely lit it up. Absolutely rolling. The one thing that's kind of bothering me is this. So you look at our last game against Hurton Champions League, which was on the 19th of September. Our next game is not until the 15th of October, which is a 25-day gap. Now this may change, but this is my first choice team at the minute. The front three change all the time. They're the main positions that we change mostly, the front three. And as of yet, we have not had to experiment with this one yet we've just kept tight with this one we're going to jump forward now the 25 days i'm worried because it's that far i just want to keep the momentum so the first game back was against porto Monense, and you guessed it estevez goes through pablo we called it we called it 25 days at this point in the season ridiculous anyway we've got a couple of problems dylan our goalkeeper Wunderkid, how old is he? He's 20. So when we got his initial contract, I thought 36 million would be enough. You know when you're putting your clauses in, you think 36 is going to be enough, but he's progressed so fast that he's now worth between 36 and 47. So we're going to have to look at that. Same goes for Vlad the Destroyer. When we first signed him for a measly one point something million, something like that, his contract details, his release clause is 32.5. Now he's comfortably worth more than that. So these need to be renewed. It's just picking the right time. Thankfully, we responded from the first defeat really, really well. In fact, the only other defeat was against Inter away in the Champions League. We then had back-to-back -back games against local rivals Porto. First off, a league game at home at the Salgueros Stadium. It's big and beautiful now. Mijini with a little through ball and there's our boy Mabasso. A big 1-0 win against the rivals. Same fixture, but this time in the Champions League. They were the one of the eight teams we had to play. They took the lead. 
But we came back really strong and the front three were causing havoc the entire match. And Billy Gilmore's been great. We sealed the win after an hour with Bong Musa slotting home. And that meant we copied last season's great start to the season and we're sitting top after 13 matches, losing just the one game. Left wing back Susano has started to cook. He's started to cook four assists coming in now. And do you remember what I said about the front three? They could just change all the time. Like now I've got Kim Hernandez and Bon Musa up front. All through the season, we just keep rotating them, rotating them around. But Billy Gilmore, the one really experienced player in the team. He's 33 years old. He's played pretty much every match. Five assists from that deep playmaker style kind of role. And slotting a centre-back into the right full-back spot and using him as inverted full-back has been genius. Mane is starting to look class. Despite being upgraded twice, I'm like a dog with a bone. I asked again and the youth facilities are going up again. This tactic is great because you play some lovely flowing football, but you can absolutely smash teams on counter-attacks. Take a little look at this goal against Sporting. It led to a thumping away win. And come January the 1st, four competitions that we're in are actually looking really good. We're in the semi-finals of the Lions Cup against Porto. We're in the Tassa di Portugal against Sintrense. The Champions League looks like we've got to qualify pretty well. Currently in fifth. And in the league, we are still top of the league with that one defeat. A problem came early in January with the Asian Cup. We lost midfielder Sarakam, goalkeeper Dylan, attacking midfielder Kim Min all till around early to mid-February. Despite that, the good form continued. This is Ben Fika at home. A 3-1 win against the biggest team in the league. A good effort against Real Madrid in Champions League. Then it was a League Cup semi-final against Porto. And what followed was our best performance of the season. Porto could just not handle us. And despite being without four key players, we absolutely bulldozed them. As comprehensive as a 4-0 win you will ever see. At this point, I'm starting to think that become bigger than Porto is actually a reality. If we can just finish in above them, we seem to have got their number in the league. So it's pretty clear we're playing really well at the minute. The schedule, the fixtures shows it. So how do you keep your momentum up when you're playing this well and avoid that dreaded drop-off? So one thing I like to do is go to training, then individual, all your players are down the side. Now you'll see training rating down there. Now any of them that have got eight or above, I like to focus on because that's like an extremely good effort in training. So we'll select all the ones that have got eight or above and it'll move them over to the right hand side so we can keep a track on who we're doing. And then when you've got them, you can praise them down there. Rather than having to click on each player, you can just praise them. So you've been training really well. It just keeps that morale up for the whole team. Whether this helps anything, I'm not sure. Some people say it does, but it certainly doesn't do any harm. So if you keep a track on that maybe once a month or so, and just keep that morale and the dynamics up. Speaking of dynamics, it's always a good idea to check your happiness level down here. You can see most of them, I would say 99% of them are happy. I've got one lad who's unhappy, it's Sam Bamba. And luckily for me, it's a training unhappiness level, which I don't really care about, but they're easy to fix. You can see his negatives are unhappy with training overall unhappy with learning a new position and that's a great reminder for me because two years ago two years ago I asked Bamba here to retrain as a wing back and I've totally forgot that I've still got him training as a wing back even though he's never played there so now I can just take that off and hopefully that'll sort out his unhappiness as they always seem to Ben Beaker got their revenge against us and beat us in the league to the devastation of Porto, they drew us again in the Tassa di Portugal and yet again, we obliterated them. Surely now we're nearly the kingpins in this city. This meant we had the final of the League Cup against Benfica coming up.
a booming win in our first domestic trophy. It's probably the smallest of the trophies, but still we'll take it. This also meant I was about to hit 500 games in charge of Salgueros. What a ride it's been. In the Champions League knockout phase, we drew Leon. First leg, a really good 2-0 win. And in the second leg, they got a bit of the Porto treatment and we absolutely battered them. That means we go through to the round of 16 and the draw is up now. And by the way, in the league, it's Salguero, Spedvika and Sporting. Three points between them. Seven games to go. So we crash out of the Champions League, but that's okay because we're still top of the league with only five games to go. By the way, the club are now super rich. £70 million in profit. So we're in the back end of the season now. Do you know, someone asked me about training and how I've gone about training this season. And the truth is, I've gone about training this season the same way I've gone about it for the previous 11 seasons. I haven't touched it. Nope, it's not something I enjoy. I don't like doing it and I don't really feel like it makes a big difference. A lot of people do train and swear by it and say it works. Fair play to them, it's just not something I enjoy. So I just leave it alone and let my assistant do it. But what I do do is I do individual training, such as here for the defensive midfielder. I make sure he's training the position that he's playing in and any key areas that he could do with improving. You can see here, I'm working on his defensive positioning. So every player I do this for, I just don't bother with the overall team training. Saying that, I do come to this screen quite a lot, the coach responsibilities, just to make sure that the coaches are doing the right thing so they're coaching their specialist areas and to make sure that the coach workload stays reasonable, average or light and doesn't get too heavy. Now we're doing really well at the minute, keeping up this momentum. We're on a good run of results, two four goal wins in a row recently. There's a fixture list. In fact, if I take away the other competitions, you can see there we've won seven in a row. So the pressure's on, but the boys are responding really well. We have a chance to do the unthinkable here. We're top of the league. Now, the two teams involved with us is Benfica and Sporting. But Benfica have slipped a little bit. They're on 67 points. And that's big news because if you look above my head there at the past winners, they've won it five years in a row. In fact, when you look at the past winners, you can see there's that Benfica streak of five in a row, only broken up by Porto. And these two teams share all the league titles other than one by Sporting since 2002 free season. That is nuts. Speaking of Porto, they're sick of being in our shadow and getting battered by us. They've sacked their manager, Andre Villas Boas. And we continue to grow. I've now left the youth facilities alone because they're great. And we're moving on to the training facilities and they're getting upgraded too. As we get bigger and better, tough decisions need to be made. We've got decent youth facilities now. Our youth intakes should be better than this. So... I need to take a bit of heart out of this decision, but Z Valante is my head of youth development. I purely gave him the job because he's a club legend. But as you can see by his managerial attributes and his coaching attributes, he's not very good. Now he's out of contract at the end of the season. Z Valante, you're a club legend. I absolutely love you, but there's no room for sentiment in this world. Here's 30 grand, go and buy yourself a car. You're out. We replace Zé Valente with Jorginho, formerly of Chelsea, Arsenal, Napoli. He's our new head of youth development and I quite like the way he looks. And working with youngsters, he's 17. Much better. He's an upgrade. He's an upgrade. So with Benfica kind of out of it, Sporting were our main rivals and they went to Boa Vista and lost. This could be a huge result for us. At the same time as that goal went in, we were 1-1 at 90 minutes until this happened. Yeah, that huge header from Gustavo in the 91st minute gave us the 2-1 win. That means now with three games to go, we are six points clear. 
and you could say our running is quite interesting. Porto away, our local rivals, and then Sporting at home. We have a chance here to do something pretty special. We're in the final as well of the Tassa de Portugal, where ironically we play Sporting. We're on for a treble, this is nuts. So we could either win the league now at Porto in their stadium. Failing that, if we beat Sporting, we can win the league that way. Or it can all go wrong and we can lose both and bottle it. So we both had tough games. This is Sporting at home to Benfica. 42 minutes gone, Benfica take the lead. However, Sporting go up the other end after 46 minutes and equalise. That's 1-1 at half-time. Meanwhile, at Porto, we've started really well and on the 16th minute, Silva founds our boy Gustavo and he puts us in the lead. But title celebrations were put on hold because Sporting took the lead against Benfica in the 48th minute. After 60 minutes, things got a bit funky though. Castillo fouled Zupac in the box. A penalty was given. And then he gave Castillo a second yellow card. Benfica scored the penalty. It's 2-2 in that one. That meant if we could hold on to this win, we would win the league in our rival's backyard. What? What has Gustavo Ferreira just done? That stunning overhead kick means we dominate Porto and somehow, somewhere, we have won the league title. If the Guard of Honour wasn't bad enough, we then absolutely smashed them at home. Taking a break from this potential trouble, I get Memphis Depay a job as a coach. So into the final with a chance for the treble. Let's take a look at this goal. I'm going to try and count these passes, by the way, because this goal is outrageous. Fifteen, beautiful. However, Sporting came right back into it. But the boys are thirsty for a treble. Look at that, a big loop over the top. Keeper misjudges it. Gustavo yet again with two on up. It's the 92nd minute. We're just about to lift this treble. Deflected 2-2. Two, two. Into extra time. It's the 98th minute. My boys are on their last legs here and Sporting break through. And they get it. That close to a domestic treble, but we've got to be happy with a double and that unexpected league title win. Let's have a little look at it in a bit more detail. It's quite stunning, you know. So there we are, 34 matches. We won 28, drawn four, lost only twice. We score 84 times and only concede 22. Best team in the league by a mile. And Benfica, who won the league five times in a row, finished down in third. But even better, even better, friends, FC Porto, finish in seventh they have sunk without a trace this is our city this would be a great way to end this save but we can't do that just yet can we now big thanks to this tactic i have not changed it at all we did talk about using this one a little bit but i have not even needed to touch it it's all been this one with those same set opposition instructions that i showed you a few videos back that team beautiful believe it or not i do think it can be improved for next season Gilmore's already leaving us. He's 33 now. He's on his way to Turkey for a bit of a last-ditch career move there. So we'll need someone in there. And the big worry we've got is down the left-hand side. So we've got him on loan, but it's about to run out. And the only problem is the future fee that they offered us is 49 million. We can't afford 49 million. So the only options left for us are to attempt to get him on loan again and hopefully knock that price down a bit or somehow, somewhere, find someone who is at least nearly as good as him because he's been superb all season but we have started planning for next season you can see we've got five moves in the works there two confirmed three 
nearly there, nearly there. They're all contracts, so it's going to be free transfers, free from the Premier League. These are good, good players that will should, should rip Portugal up. So we'll see. I mean, what's next for this club? What's next? As season 13 kicks off, Bayern came sniffing. It's another hard no. I'm a five-star manager now, by the way, and they've finally accepted me to go on a Continental A license. I've been winging it with a Continental B license for all this time, and they finally let me go on my course, so that should be upgraded soon. Now, the media have us down at fifth this season, and there's probably a good reason for that. See, this is a problem. Susano, who was the left-back last season, who was our best player, I cannot get him. Hoffenheim just won't have it. We want a stupid future fee. We can't afford it. It's going to blow our plans completely. A couple of days later, he ended up at Barcelona. Great. Billy Gilmore's left us. He's gone to Besiktas on a free. I probably should have kept him for another year, you know. That's because his midfield partner last season also left us. He went to Feyenoord for 12 million. However, out of that, the board gave us... Nothing. Which meant to spend money, we had to generate money. So we brought in 25 million and spent pretty much the same amount. Record signing at 10 million is this guy, Miroslav Tripsovsky. Tripsovsky. We'll get there. We've also signed Jao Pedro. Now, I think he's going to be our main striker, but he's on loan until December. So at Christmas time, he's back. Experience comes from Pepe Sa, formerly of Tottenham, amongst others. He's 33, central midfield, good cover. And the other big signing is Paul Wanner. A lot of you might have signed him as well. We got him for 2 million. He's only 29. And if you look at his career, he has barely kicked a football in the last five years. So as it stands, we have not been able to replace that left back, which means that this formation is a bit vulnerable because we don't really have the player to play down that side. He was an absolute world beater and the formation's built for that type of player. At the minute, with about a week left of the transfer window, I can't find a replacement. So an option may be to do this, is to invert the entire system, so mirror it, if you like, and that way, down this right hand side we could play the new player Miroslav as that complete wing back which is basically what Susano was he was a winger playing as a wing back so that is the last ditch option if we can't find someone to play on that left hand side but the reason I don't want to do it is because we don't really have the players to do it we've got a good right winger he'll be completely gone if we don't use him it's a bit of a conundrum we've used the loan market for Juan Amar from Chelsea he's a wonder kid he's Argentinian he's going to play in central midfield to replace Gilmore Back to this though, I don't know about you, but whenever I have a successful formation such as this one, when I just simply mirror it like this, it never seems to work as well. I don't know why. So for the next 10 days of the window, I'm going to try my best to find a player down here because the rest of the squad is built for that. Three days later. The transfer window slam shut. Daniel Infant Palmeiras on loan review to a permanent transfer who's going to be the replacement down the left. He's raw, but at 20, he can get better. However, we're in a bit of trouble here. We have not started the season well at all. We've lost two of our matches already. This is not good. And the first bit of silverware has gone as well because Sporting beat us in the Super Cup. That is not a great start. Not a good start for defending champions. Do you know, I was looking forward to defending the title this season, but this is a really tough start. It's a new type of challenge. I thought the same formation couple of minor tweaks we'll just bulldoze through them but that loss at left back has sent us off a bit player recruitment wasn't great but staff recruitment was fantastic we now have the best coaching team in the league in all areas we've built quite the staff now with some big names in there the latest staff signing was probably the best goalkeeping coach i've came across on fm so far to try and get some momentum back i changed pozo to a libero for the next game and it helped as he charged down the left hand side and laid on the assist for the goal. But we're struggling. We're not blasting through teams like last season. This game against Casapia, we needed an injury time winner. So, of course, I'm going to stick with the title winning formation. But just in case, just in case, I do have an alternative. And it is here. Potential 4-2-4 if we start getting stuck. Maybe the opposition have worked us out. Maybe they've worked this formation out. Maybe they understand what we're going to do. So we've got this in our back pocket just in case. Don't want to go to it, but we will if we need to. 
In reality, the squad is not as strong as last season. We've lost some key players in midfield and fullback, and we're not as strong. I'm quite looking forward to the battle though of trying to retain this title and the all-important Champions League. So early doors in the season, we're currently sitting seventh. We're having a right stinking campaign here, and we're below Porto. And someone did point out that you can't really call yourself bigger than Porto till you win the Champions League, right? And the pictures have been released. I don't think it's the worst bunch of games there. Atletico, Arsenal, Inter and Milan are tricky, but the others are pretty winnable. And we probably need to do something in that because the way we've started the league campaign, teams might have worked us out in Portugal, so hopefully in Europe we do a bit better. So let's see, hopefully the old faithful does as well with the added libero for home games. Otherwise, when you come back, it could be 4-2-4, assault, Right, okay team, the good news is we've started to fight back, leading to Manager of the Month award. You saw Mabasso scoring there and he's won the Copa Trophy. I think it's the second time he's won it, but I've got a question. What the hell is the Copa Trophy? So the better performances have meant that we've started to climb the league again and we're sitting all right. We're sitting in third, just behind Benfica and Braga. We had that sticky start, didn't we? So we made it... a tiny change a tiny change and i guess it's all down to the fact our left wing back change now daniel is going to be a great player he's not there yet so we can't put all of our attacking burden on him so to change it up a bit i did a simple team instruction i added in focus play through the middle and when you look at the team it kind of makes sense because our good players our creative players mabasso silva and amar the wonder kid on loan from chelsea are all in the middle so let's get them more of the ball now speaking of daniel Remember, we've got him on loan from Palmeiras with a view to a permanent move. Look at his progression. Arrows all flying up nearly every attribute, nearly every one, and a couple of standouts really shooting up. He's on a nice pathway at the minute, slowly, slowly progressing to get to that potential ability of four stars. Now, the Champions League has always been a goal this season to do decent in it, and we just did our best performance of the season against Monaco. You saw Daniel there with the assist. He's bedding in nicely. And on the other side, big trip off ski. He's starting to fire as well. Lovely assist. In fact, he repeated the dose again. Constant threat down the right-hand side. Linking up with Silva. And it led to a thumping 4-0 away win. We got this good win against Sporting. 1-0. Nothing spectacular, right? So to get results like that and lock games down... I took a bit of my own advice off a recent video and I just tweaked things. So when it's like 80 minutes or so, a few of these roles change, especially this guy down the left hand side. There's no point having a complete wing back on attack with 10 minutes to go. So he usually gets dropped down to a wing back on the support and occasionally Wanner, I will move him over there to make him a winger just so we're more symmetric, a little bit more solid to see the game out. And not to mention dropping that attacking mentality to go back down balanced. But there's loads of other tips on that video, so go check that one out. And I won't lie, the reason I brought that philosophy into it was this game against bottom of the league, Estoril. And if you look there, you can see, have a little look at the last 10 minutes. We were 1-0 up, and then with me sleeping on the tactic button, we conceded four times. So despite that defeat, we are sitting second, lodged in behind Benfica. We're not playing great, though. Look at the goal difference, only eight. The goals have dried up a bit. We've only scored 20 in 12 matches so far. And we've already lost three matches, which is more than the entirety of last season. It's the difficult second album this season. But the good news is we don't have to look for a striker in January because we do have João Pedro. We bought him from America in Brazil. Loaned him straight back to them, but he is due back on New Year's Day. And if you look at him, he looks like he could be a really nice player. His physicals are off the chain. And it's the bi yearly problem of the Africa Cup of Nations. There's six players being called up there, and five of those are in the first team squad. That's going to cause a few issues. It's for this reason we picked up free agent Charles de Kesselier. Yeah, I know I probably murdered his name, so let's call him Sir Charles. But he comes in till the end of the season. He's 34 years old now, but he can play everywhere, and he's a good bit of experience for the back end of the season. Now, on the other end of the scale is our boy Miroslav. Now, if you remember, Miroslav was bought from Sparta Prague for a club record 10 million. And I knew it was money well spent. He's gonna be a world beater and his attributes are all on the rise. In fact, a couple of key ones, his acceleration and agility in his physical section, 18 and 20, they are standing out and you can see it in match. This is a recent game against Braga. I'm going to pause it there. And this is where you can see a couple of attributes come into play. He's tightly marked, but he's going to use that acceleration 
and agility just to burst past this man like he wasn't there. I'll press play now. There you go. See you later. And I mean, come on, let's see that again. He's an exciting talent. He's already got 10 assists and the media description is fittingly a wonder kid. He's going to be hard to keep hold of, but a great signing. Now, speaking of our great signings, in the past, we've had some boomers. The goalkeeper and two centre-backs are fantastic. We've had them a good while now, all from like 18-19. Problem is, the better they get, the more teams want them. So to counter this, Dylan, our keeper, who is only 21, got a new contract with a release clause of 80 million. So if someone wants him, they're going to have to pay. Sergio Pozo joined him in that, and again, the release clause, 80 million. And Vlad the Terminator, same gig, new contract, 80 million to buy him out of it. So my friends, if these big teams do want them, they're going to have to pay, and you never know, we might get a little step closer to that goal of a net transfer profit of 1 billion. At the minute, looking at those figures of transfer value bought for 56 and transfer value brought in for 182, that's about 130, which means we're about 870 off. We're into January now, and it's Porto away in the big local derby. And we do what we do against Porto. We beat them. This means we're snuck in behind Benfica, four points behind, but we do have a game in hand. And the good news is the team are performing well. Daniel's progressed well, well enough for me to drop the focus play through the middle, so we're not as predictable. And Jao Pedro has returned from his loan spell, so he will be a big factor in the second half of the season. A dominant display against Benfica at home with former player Wana putting us in the lead. 85 minutes, a real smash and grab from Benfica as they level the match. Damn it, that could be crucial. Our central midfield problems continue because Chelsea recall Juan Roman Amar. So I went off to Barcelona and replaced him with Roberto Arribas. He's on loan for the rest of the season. The Champions League has gone really well. This was a big win away in the San Siro. We only just missed out on the top eight, finishing 10th. If you told me a few seasons ago we'd be comfortably beating Arsenal in the Champions League, I would have laughed at you. We won't be holding on to our League Cup though, because Benfica beat us in an epic in the semi-final. On the flip side though, we are still doing really well in the Taça de Portugal, and we find ourselves now in the semis of that. As we go into February, this is the state of play. We've been knocked out of the semis of that Alliance Cup. We are in the semi-finals in the Taça de Portugal against local rivals Porto. And the Champions League has thrown up a very interesting knockout game against Sporting. And in the league, we are behind Benfica still, like the whole season, clinging on to that game in hand. So Champions League against Sporting. And Mabasso comes on and scores the winner in the first leg in the 90th minute. In the second leg, however, this penalty from Sporting put them 2-0 up and 2-1 up on aggregate. That's when I called for my ball Mabasso again. 89 minutes have gone. We're desperate to score here. He doesn't let us down. It goes to extra time. In extra time, he's on it again. Mabasso. In what could go down as my greatest substitution in this entire save, Mabasso was there again two minutes later. And to stick a dagger in the heart of Sporting... 108 minutes he did it again there you see it we go through after extra time what an impact he had when he came on my boy Mabasso so that leads us into the round of 16 where we have unfortunately drew PSG that's going to be a brutal brutal game tough tough now in the league you can see over there we are two games behind Benfica now but worryingly 12 points that's going to be hard to claw back. There's not many games left. Remember, there's only 18 teams in this league. So they've got nine games left. We've got 11. But we do still need to play Benfica. So if we can win our games in hand and then beat Benfica, you never know. So it's shortly time for this PSG game. Now, home leg first. In fact, you want to have a look at their team. Wait till you see this. Here we have PSG's lineup, and it's enough to scare the living daylights out of you. Let's start at the top. Obviously, there's Kylian Mbappe. He's 37 now, but not much has left him. He's still pretty nippy. He hasn't got much strength, but other than that, scary. On one side, you've got Kavarat Kashelia. Savvy Simons. On the right-hand side, we've got Soz Balai. And how about midfield two of Ugarte and Javi? Pretty scary, right? But the eagle eye of you will have noticed, and it's probably our best chance here, is that every one of these players, Mbappe at 37, Kavrat Kashelia at 35, 
even Xavi at 31. All of them are in their mid to late 30s, other than a couple of younger players that are sitting in there. But there's not many. Even Nuno Mendes, who are the, they're playing at centre-back, he's 33. So I think our best bet is to crank up the intensity everywhere and just try and zap them with energy. First leg was at home, super tight affair. Jules Kunde, another player they've got, through to Kavarat Kashelia. I'm not sure what my keeper was doing. Disaster. The match finishes 1-0. Super tight match. Nothing in it. So the second leg's going to be in Paris, and it's going to be a big ask. We're 1-0 behind. So I had a look at the scout report, and the big one that shot out to me was this one here. You can see formations first. Vulnerable against playing 4-4-2 style formations. This is the big one here. Conceded an average of four clear-cut chances per 90 minutes. That's huge. That's huge. So seeing that, I am really tempted to start with the 4-2-4 that we've got lined up in case of emergencies. It might be the way to break them down. So here we are, Champions League time against PSG. We've got a goal down. Now Mabasso has to start. He plays it through to the trip. And then João Pedro, our new Brazilian sensation, puts us in the lead. Pretty much straight from kickoff, Sosbalai whips it across. They've got Rooney Bardi as well, by the way. And Daniel showing his inexperience gave away a penalty. Of course, it was Mbappe who stepped up. Cocky little beggar. The boys were reeling a bit after that. And on 32 minutes, here's Rooney Bardi again. He whips it across. Carnage in the box and it's an own goal. Into the second half and we do go for the 4-2-4 to try and go for it. Pretty much straight away, one minute into the second half, cross comes in, bang, we're back in it, it's 2-2. Momentum's on our side now, Silva into the box. Just saved by Tarati. We had 20 minutes to try and find this equaliser. Right, straight into a must-win game against local rivals Porto. Boys came out firing with a point to prove. Joe Pedro's been everywhere, more on him later. But a scintillating performance under pressure from the boys. Porto got a couple back, but we battered them. Right, so this means that we have Claude Benfica in now. It's only four points, and remember, our next game is against Benfica. To be fair to us, we put a hell of an effort in here trying to claw this back. It was 12 points at one point. But if we don't beat Benfica, that means they will lift the trophy at our expense. Are you ready? This now means the final of the Tassadi Portugal is the only chance of silverware this season and it's a trophy we haven't won. But luckily, the boys were at it. Braga couldn't handle us. And the guy we knew who was going to be a star, he just looks better and better. Yes indeed, Joe Pedro, I am convinced is the new Ronaldo, the original Ronaldo. Massive 4-0 win gets us the trophy. I'm not quite sure what to make of that season. On the one hand, it was a great season, but disappointment in the Champions League and the league. But we did win a trophy, so not all bad. I guess I'm getting a bit spoiled. Now, João Pedro, I am convinced he is the next Ronaldo. R9, not the Portuguese one. Look at the way he's progressed. He's dribbling, he's finishing, he's even got a bit of strength like R9 had. And his statistics for this season were 19 starts, 20 goals. We called it at the start of the season when he got back from loan. What a player, excited for what he can do next season. But it looks like we're going to have to use that dreaded rebuild word because as the season comes to a close, you can see down this side here, we have an absolute ton of players wanted and some of them are wanted by some seriously big players 
teams. Premier League teams looking at the goalkeeper. Defenders, Premier League teams. Vlad the Destroyer is wanting to buy every big team you can think of. Arsenal, Liverpool, Man City, Newcastle, Tottenham, Barca. It's going to be a miracle if we could keep hold of some of these players. It's got that stupid that Tottenham have stolen Alex Iwobi as their new assistant manager. I mean, what the hell? On the plus side, Porto are in absolute dire, dire straits. They've got a net debt now of 200 million and they are in administration. Wow. So I guess we better think about the rebuild. Now you'll see both defensive midfield positions I have left empty because those are the two positions I really want. The good news is we've permanently signed Daniel now to a contract. We had him on loan last season, but he signed full-time for 13 million and already his value is triple that. But I like the look at the team. The front three are set in stone. Mabasso ended up last season with 23 goals, so he's going to stay in that role. Silva's the experienced man at 29. And we've got the new Ronaldo up front with the trip man down the right-hand side. I'm going to move Pozo over to inverted fullback on the right-hand side. If you look at him, he's all set up for that. He can play anywhere across the back three and randomly on the wing. Let's not put him there. If we can keep hold of him because of all these teams after him, that back four looks really solid. The only problem... The only problem is the transfer budget is pathetic yet again. To try to generate funds, we said farewell to Bong Musa Sibaya, who we bought all them years ago from South African football. He's off for 20 million to the United Arab Emirates. But unfortunately, my board are so tight that from that 20 million, they only gave me 3 million. And I needed that to top up the money to get Danielle, the left back, in. So it's back to square one. We need two starting defensive midfielders, and we've got no money to get them. We might have to cash in on one of these players. But remember, all of them have pretty much got huge, huge release clauses. So I guess we'll wait and see in a few weeks. One of them could be this man, Daniel Adrisu. He's came in on a pre-transfer from Hill Vicente. Bit of a destroyer, not great on the ball, but he might do the job. I'm in July now, 1st of July, and you can see there's some bids coming in and for players that do not want to sell. Mabasso, Wolfsburger after Mabasso. But he's one player who does not have a release clause. And there is no way I'm taking 23 million for my boy Mabasso. And then I'm gripped by this from the agent of Paul Wanner. A Paul Wanner, a player that I rescued from Benfica's reserve team, just rejected a bid from Jeddah. And now he wants to go there to chase the money like Hugo Felix and Jordan Henderson. 20.5 million for a 30 year old. Have that. This is what happens when you get somewhat successful. Look at the next two things coming in Pozo from Tottenham. And Dortmund for Vlad the Destroyer. What are they trying to do? They're trying to rip my team to bits, man. So Tottenham, I know you've got a lot of money and there's absolutely no way you're getting Pozo for 43 million. He's 21, he's full of potential. And there's that release clause of 80 million. So we're going to drive this right up. Here we go. 120. Let's see what they say. Ta-ta. Dortmund came in throwing money, which will rise to 52 million. That is pretty big. But can I just show you something? Look at what the board are willing to give me from that 52. 3.1 million. What? I boy, I rejected it. I boy, this looks like being an incredibly long summer, just like deflecting bids from left, right and centre. Every time I get to this page, I'm panicking that there's going to be another one. At the minute, we're OK. At least Jao Ronaldo has signed a new deal. That is some good news. Damn it. Look at the number next to the transfer badge. I mean, who's that going to be? Okay, Wolfsburg are back for Mabasso. He doesn't want to join them, and they're offering 31 rising to 35. It's not enough. It's not enough. And here is El Itad for Paul Wanner, and they're offering 21 million. Now, he's 31. So I might do this. I might do this, because I do have a replacement in from Brazil, like the remit of the save, to replace him. If we were to do this, it'd be a huge, huge profit for one season. You can see we bought him for 2.8 million. He had a decent season, in honesty. He was decent. Accepted. Season preview has us second behind Benfica again. So Benfica have clawed their title back, but we're going to be in the shake-up. This season's all about getting that title back and going a step further in the Champs League. If I have any bloody players left, by the way, because everybody, everybody's wanted. Thing is, though, I don't want to accept any bids because I'm not getting any money. They're just, like, taking the money, and I don't know what they're doing with it. So this is the kid I've got who's going to replace Paul Wanner. I signed him last year and sent him straight on loan to Gremio back in Brazil. Attributes are on the rise because of that loan move. It's developed him really well. They want him again, but I'm going to keep him for this season. I want him playing in behind uh, our Ronaldo João Pedro in there. So those two, I want them to be like our Ronaldinho and... 
Ronaldo. That's what I've got in my head. So he can be the replacement, and that's why I'm going to let Wana leave. But yeah, he needs a new face. Let's work on that. Damn. I'm sorry this episode's mostly about my torture, but now here come Barcelona, and you know he's going to kick off if I reject Barcelona. They've came in with a non-negotiable um, 55 million, and the board have agreed to give us 3.5 million of that. Oh, thanks. Absolutely not. He's got an 80 million release clause. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't come back in. It's easy to get distracted by all these transfers getting deflected and rejecting bids when we still need two players in this zone here. So it could be time to look at the loan market because we obviously can't buy anyone yet again. But having looked at the loan market, there's nothing on there that was any better than what we've already got. So we're just going to abort that for now. So we rescued Paul Wanner's career and he's gone for 25 million, rising to that. Uh, you can see why. Greedy. Absolutely fine with it though. Ready raid replacement in Vegas. He's just got another couple for Grimeo and he's been upgrading now to media description. Wonder kid. Can't wait to get him back. Good riddance, Wanna. Right, I've jumped to this Mayini one, right. 40 million, rising to 50 million. 15 goes to his old club, so they're laughing. Cape Town City, you're welcome. The board again giving us 3.6 million. That is pathetic. And the thing is, I'm happy to sell him because I've got a better player in his position, but I'm just a bit annoyed. My in is gone, but I rejected the Pozo move, and of course, Pozo and his agent are kicking off. The good news is, as it stands, I do have a team to put on the field. I'm not overly excited by the central midfield pairing, but what can I do? I don't have enough money. So whether I can train someone to play in there or just go with them. Stop the clocks. I thought Porto was bad. Take a look at this. Benfica, 400 million in debt. They're in administration as well. Am I the only club that can run properly here? Wow. Right, so Mayini's left us for 40 million. He's off to wherever he's off to, and he's getting what he wanted, half a million a week. Another greedy little... But to be fair, we bought him for 500,000 six years ago. He's never been a regular. He's always done okay, so I'll take it. That's a record transfer income already of 61 million, and it's only the 22nd of July. Late in July... Still, all the big players are wanted. This is going to be up to the wire whether we can keep them or not. Okay, we're two days off the start of the season and nobody else has left. Big Vlad the Terminator. People have dropped out for him. I think we're going to be all right here. We've got to get through deadline day, but fingers crossed, I've got most of my team that I wanted to keep. Problem is, I haven't improved the midfield. I don't think I'm going to be able to. Despite all the upheaval of the transfer window, we did take the first trophy of the season. It's the Super Cup against Benfica. And that's our first one of those, so I'll take that one off the list. So I'm quite aware this episode's been a bit, a bit haphazard of me just crumbling under transfer pressure. But to be honest, I am quite happy with the team that I've got. But what I've noticed is, as I look down it, I've got a really thin squad now because I'm concentrating so much on deflecting transfer bids, I haven't really built my team. So as deadline day approaches, sometimes we get some good players on deadline day. So stay tuned. Oh, and by the way, I've added some faces to some of the new gens. Beautiful. This is our boy who I think is going to be like Ronaldinho. And I've had a few requests. At the end of today's video, I'm just going to play right through six or seven player profiles that are going to be big players for this season. So you can have a scan of them and maybe suggest what roles we could or retrain them to. So we'll do that at the end of the vid. So to bulk the squad out, I thought, let's get a bit of experience in. We've always had a young squad. Average age at the minute is 25. It's for that reason we made the shock signing of Rodrigo on a free transfer. He's been at Real Madrid his entire career, his entire glorious career. He joins us for a one-year deal to wind up his career. As an impact sub, his attributes are still there. Yes, he hasn't got the pace anymore, but are you telling me with those mentals and technicals, he can't have an impact and he can cover a lot of different positions. And one more bit of experience, Tangai Nianzu comes in who can play centre-back or in the midfield. He looks a real practical signing. Two-year deal for him, he costs us about two million. Now the squad looks that little bit bigger, but we've still got to get through deadline day with all our players intact. The Champs League fixtures have been released. It's pretty rough, that. Barcelona, Real Madrid and FC Bayern. So we better beat the rest of the teams if we want to get through that. With all this transfer news, it's easy to forget about the league, but we started really well. Beat Porto again. Much better start than last season. We've won four out of four, and it's again us and Benfica at the top. We've sporting. If you look down below, you might find Porto somewhere. Here it is then. This is deadline day. Now, I'm not going to bring anyone in if I don't need to. 
because I don't have any money. It's all about if these big clubs do a last minute hit on us. Didn't take long, did it? So Chelsea have came in non-negotiable for Pozo. 45 million rising to 50. Oh, I don't know what to do. Here's my conundrum. Since he started getting a bit arsey and unhappy, I left him out of the team and the team's actually all right without him. It's actually all right without him, so we could probably afford to cash in. Just above that, Tottenham have put a bid in for Vlad. They are not getting Vlad for 51 million. I know that for a fact. Back to Pozo. The other teams after him are Bournemouth, Brighton and Crystal Palace. Now, I don't think they'll have the money that Chelsea do. Ah, oh, what would you do? If I could ask you right now, I would ask you. We bought him for 5 million a little over two seasons ago. He's been decent without being spectacular, but he is only 21. He's one of those players that in about three, four years' time, he's probably going to be worth like 200 million. Right, there's 15 hours left in this transfer window. I'm going to play a hardball. He's got a release clause of 80. If they come back for 60, they'll get him. They'll get him. I've also got to bear in mind that we only get 6 million of that, which is pathetic, by the way. Rejected. So the agent's offers have come in. I can't emphasise enough. Have a good look at your agent's offers because they always throw some good ones up. Now, this club here, which I can't pronounce for the love of the money, I think they're from Chechnya, is Shavina's Avanza. I bought a couple of players from them, including Tripovsky. And this guy's just came up, Slobodan Marinkovic. He's 23, right? He can play centre back, left back, very much like Pozo. And he's six foot seven. He is an absolute giant. So, what I'm thinking is if they come back in for Pozo, we go in for him, but someone else is after him. Who is it? Premier League and. Yeah, so he's going to go. So, we need to make a decision here. There's another one here. Inza Fall. I've just added to the shortlist. Like, he's 19. He, he is probably as good as Pozo and he's going to be a dirt load cheaper so I kind of want them to come back in for Pozo now. Eight hours remaining. Eight. That's it. It's closed until January. We didn't lose anyone after all that but at least we've got some top top players on our shortlist in case to come back for them in January. So after all that we brought in 70 million losing a couple of big players but no Great, great first teamers, and we brought in 17 million worth of talent to replace those players. So we're about to play Benfica away, which is our toughest game of the season. So it's quite good to get it out of the way nice and early. So we'll leave you with that. And after that, I'll show you some of the key players, player profiles. So you can kind of tell me what you think of some of the starting 11. But Benfica away, both undefeated. If we can get a good win here, I can't see them stopping us, but it will be tough. Let's see. Starting lineup pretty much picks itself. Mane's in ahead of Pozo at the minute because he's been a diva. But other than that, that's pretty much the starting 11. Opposition instructions, we keep them the same as we always have. Set them up and bang, force them into that left-hand side. So they stay away from our left wing back. Looking at me now with the brown eyes, sipping on the clocks full of red wine. 
Right, so we have a Champions League match here against Real Madrid. And you know what? In the year 2036, they are still holding on to Jude Bellingham, Camavinga, and Vinicius. Which totals up a pretty scary team when you think about it. They've also got Antonio Silva, a highly regarded centre-back there. So this is Tiny Salgueros playing mighty Real Madrid at home. Now we fell behind after 20 minutes through Vinicius. But after 65 minutes, we got a deserved equaliser and I can't emphasise deserved enough from our Brazilian João Pedro. 72 minutes gone. Brian, Brazilian number three involved in this match with the giveaway, Madrid score. But check out these match stats, folks. We absolutely murdered them. I do believe that's what the kids called getting FM'd, right? Two shots from Madrid, two goals, we lose 2-1. At this early stage of the season, our three games have brought on two defeats because we also lost away to Barcelona, so we're stuck down in 19th in the Champions League. So we've zoomed forward now, we're into January. In fact, let me show you the league. There it is, we're sat top. We have not been defeated yet in January. 15 matches, 12 wins, three draws. We're not clear because there's still some teams doing well. But interestingly enough, it's not Benfica and it's not Porto. They're lagging a bit. Well, Porto, that's their new role, mid-table. So the team's going really well. Same same formation. Now, the problem we had with those defensive midfielders, it's kind of been solved by the players we had. I'm warming to them. I'm warming to them. So Idris is a beast. He's an absolute beast. He's 6'5", 88 kg, and just an absolute physical presence in there. And after a slow start, he's settled in. Our midfielder from Thailand, Sarakam, we've had him a while now. He used to play in the more defensive role, but flourishing in the more aggressive of the two DM roles. And what I mean by this, yes, they're both defensive midfielders on support, but if you look at Idrisu, the more defensive of the two, he holds his position and nothing else, whereas the other defensive midfield role takes more risks and gets further forward. So this is a more expressive role of the two. And since moving Sarakam over to this one, he's really flourished. If you look at his previous seasons here and here, they were in the more defensive role, whereas this season, seven points away. So he's enjoying it, he's enjoying it. Now in the Champs League, we've had a bit of a mixed time. We absolutely murdered Salzburg 5-0, but then got murdered ourselves by Villarreal. Then we had a game against Bayern at home, one of the big boys. Finished 3-4. Match stats tell us that we should have got something out that one as well. Bit of a recurring theme. Right, so overall going well. Super Cup's in the bag. Semis of the Alliance Cup. Fifth round of the Tassa di Portugal. Top of the league, but the slight concern is the Champions League. We need to sort that out because at the minute we're lagging off a bit. Now I'm going to show you this hidden advice button that was completely oblivious to me. I've never really took notice of it. So if we go to Trisovsky there and up here pops new advice available. So it's that little round dot with a number by it. I have never even looked at this, but I used it recently for João Pedro and it was quite, quite useful. Have a look at it here. I'll tell you little tips from your coaches what to do for each player. Click on them and honestly some of them you'll use, you will use. For example, they've recommended some individual training at the start. Could do with individual attacking movement training to help improve some minor off the ball movement, anticipation and decision weaknesses. And when you look at it, his ratings are 13, 12 and 12. And this is a wonder kid, so it's not a bad one to do that. So I will take that on board. Now you can see we've started the training, set up Player trait training, Fodris Polsky, strongly recommended. Bang, let's start doing it. So that's in. It'll do other ones as well. Some of them you can do, some of them you won't. Like, I don't like changing the squad status. I think you're just asking for trouble, so I'll leave that. But some of them are really good. Pozo here. Now, he used to be a centre-back, so I've got him doing different stuff for his individual training. And I've kind of forgot that I've, since moving him to full-back, I could probably refocus. And this has helped me remind myself. Set up individual training for ball control. So, yeah, we'll do that. So he starts doing that straight away. And if you're a bit unsure on traits and when to start them or what to look for, this is going to throw some up for you as well. It's asking me to chuck one in for Sarakem here to knock a ball past his opponent. Whether you take it or not, it's up to you, but it'll give you a little nudge to have a little look. So good news, after listening to your guys' comments in the last video and wondering why my transfer revenue was so pathetic, I went and moaned at the board and that they've now upped it from 25% to 40%. Not ideal, but a hell of a lot better. So we'll do that again in a couple of months' time and try and get it up. Like I said, we are in January and that's going to bring in some more of our beautiful, beautiful transfer problems. Pedro's been insanely good and now PSG are having a look at him. Now PSG, with all that money, it's not what you want to see. And they're in a long list of clubs that are after him. So the deadline is officially open and that's going to bring some problems here because... 
I would say 90% maybe of our starting 11 and then the first choice reserves are all wanted by various clubs from around the world. Didn't take long, did it? January's open and they're already after Vlad. Transfer offers coming in. We're going to reject those, but it's going to be a long month. Even worse, the Saudis are now coming in as well. Premier League are looking after Trusovski and Jurovic, our keeper, and here comes Leipzig in for João Pedro. Absolutely no chance. So remember what I said about wanting to make Vegas and João Pedro, our Ronaldinho and Ronaldo with that sort of link-up? How about this? They're picking each other out all the time. The Champs League went a little bit close for my comfort, but we did get through. We finished in 15th with 12 points. Won four, lost four. So work to do, but we're through. Transfer-wise, at the 28th of January, despite a load of bids, we've kept hold of everyone so far. No one's hit the asking price. But João Pedro has some big teams after him now. Man United, PSG, Dortmund and Brentford. But so many clubs after our players. The goalkeeper wanted by Villa, Newcastle, Real Madrid. Pozo now wanted by Bayern Munich. Vlad, Villa, Brighton, Chelsea, Tottenham. It's ridiculous. In the league, it was time to play Porto. I know what you're thinking, but this time they actually beat us. That was our first defeat of the season in the league. I was getting a bit worried, but thankfully, in the biggest game of the season against Benfica, we got the job done in a classic. So how about that Champions League? In the first game, we won 2-0, pretty comfy away from home. In the home game, it was plain sailing. Team played really well, and there's this link up with them front three again. Joao Pedro just doing Pedro things. This could be a mixed blessing though, because the more he scores in the Champions League, the more big teams are going to want him. His hat trick gave us a 3 0 win and 5 0 overall win to the last 16. This is the state of play as we go into March. We got knocked out of the Alliance Cup by Benfica. Bit disappointing, but we're playing too many matches and now our squad size is so small. It's not the worst thing in the world. We're in the semi-finals of the TASA, trying to retain that against Boa Vista. We've got the Real Madrid game coming up next. And we're still top of the league with that one defeat. And we do have a game in hand. And Benfica and Porto, the way out of it, it's now for Malasio and Braga, our main rivals. So the first game is at home and we need to get a lead here to take to the Bernabeu. If you look at their team, Camavinga, Vinicius, Bellingham, like the game we played against them last time, are still there. They play 4-3-3 with two inverted wing backs, but I'm not going to stray from what I've been doing with opposition instructions. I'm doing that. The one thing I might do though, if you look at Peter O'Driscoll, their centre-back, I mean he's really good, but first touch of nine, technique of nine. So for this home game, we're going to trigger a press on his ass because he might be the one who gives the ball away. We have got a massive blow because Tripovsky here is injured for three weeks, so he misses the match. We don't have a direct replacement for him. Rodrigo can't last a full match. So for this game, we will push that position up to there and Gabriel Silva can go in there like that. It's even more aggressive than a more aggressive tactic anyway. It's worth the risk. We need a lead. We need a lead from this home game. So 1-1 against Madrid, slightly disappointing, but we're not out of it yet. But I do want to show you this assist from Rodrigo and just to focus on him a little bit. Remember, he's 36, so he's down the right-hand side here and he's going to pick out Joao Pedro in the box there. But, I mean, just look how he does it. Ready? Bring that back. How sweet was that? Now, this is why he shouldn't be put off by players of an age. He's 36, but he can do things like that. And if you look at his contribution this season, we've used him a rake off the bench, but 10 appearances, 16 off the bench, three goals, 10 assists. 10. Nice. Right, Real Madrid, leg two. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, 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 yes. 
frustrated. Sorry for leaving you hanging on the last episode with that. But yes, we lost on penalties to Real Madrid. You've got to say it's progress in the Champions League though, isn't it? So we move on and this is the state of play. We are in the semi-finals of the Tassidy Portugal. And if you look at the league, we are absolutely flying. We're seven clear now. We've only six games left, so surely that's in the bag, right? So in that penalty shootout, Vargas missed one of the penalties, and he is only young, bless his heart. He's only 20, our Brazilian, but look at the progress on that. I put this picture without his profile on Twitter, and everyone was like, wait a minute, and that is what you call progress. You can see his progress chart from when he joined. Now, there's a few ups and downs, but that's natural when you're dealing with such a young player, but the escalation here is the key point, because now, as he gets older, more experienced, he's absolutely flying. Current value is 51 million to 57 million. I wouldn't even take 100 million at this point. He is a game breaker. And the good news is he does not have a release clause, although he's on pretty poxy wages, so I'll expect his agent to come ringing soon. How did we get him? I've permanently got someone stationed in Brazil now, along with Argentina and a few other places, but I'm always checking the Brazil one to see what comes up. So a lot of things are rosy about this club at the minute. From when we started to now, it's fantastic. The one thing I'd say we haven't got going is our... Youth team, we, I don't think we've had one player that's come through, not one, and that's pathetic, especially the amount of money we've put into the facilities. And if you look here at the staff, so there's the under-19 squad, below average, but look at the staff here, and this is something I'm going to focus on, I think. This is the coaching team comparison compared to everybody else in the league. I mean, it's not bad, but it could be better. So looking at these coaches down this side, I'm going to have a good look at them, probably in the off-season, and I'm going to get the axe out. And I'm going to focus on getting some quality coaches in to try and see if that will help. I've done it again, you see. I've gone again to the board and asked for an improvement to the youth facilities. And they've agreed. So this is going to take us to superb facilities at a cost of £5 million. And at the same time, I asked for training facilities upgraded as well. So every box is getting ticked here. In the semi-finals of the Tassa de Portugal, the trophy we are looking to hold on to. It was pretty comfy stuff against Boa Vista. Into the final, 3-0. Jao Pedro scored again in that one. He's now wanted by 12 clubs. And there you see them, ranging from Leipzig, Madrid, right through to Villa, Dortmund, PSG. Ay, ay, ay. Our form in the league has been, quite frankly, ridiculous. Ridiculous. They have been so good this season. There's also been a bit of a resurgence for Kim Min. He's been at the club quite a while, but are we finally seeing his potential? Again, wanted by a raft of clubs, but he scored eight goals in his last five matches with an average rating of 8.52. This great run in the league, we've won game after game after game, meant that if we beat Estoril at home, we would be champions again. So great stuff. We have won the league. That's two out of the last three seasons. We are firmly established now as one of the big boys in Portuguese Football, we've got the Tassidy Portugal final coming up. Now look at that tab there. Can you see it? This has completely thrown me. FIFA Club World Cup draw today. We what what? So what's confused me is not only the time of year it's at, apparently it's the end of the season in June, which is bizarre, but also why am I in it? <laughs> because we didn't win anything last year in European wise. Here are the teams above my head. That appear to be qualified for this. Benfica have got in there as well. Brazilian team, Saudi. I mean, it is very much a Club World Cup. My question to you, if anybody knows, is this the new format that's brought in and why is it now that we're in it and not prior when we won the league and the Europa Conference League? I am very confused about this. Anyway, we've done the draw and we're in Group A with Arsenal, Junior of Colombia and Monte Herrera from Mexico. You can see the amount of teams that are in it. It's very, very vast. I'm very confused, but... Quite cool. So that was the domestic double in the bag, which is great. And then we ran into the FIFA Club World Cup, which was randomly in June. We started pretty well. In the group stages, we were really good. We got a draw against Arsenal. And the other two games, we won. So we finished top of Group A. This meant we drew Milan. It goes into a straight knockout. And to be perfectly honest, Milan absolutely battered us. It was the end of a long season. And you can see Bamba there who took the corner. Right winger, he's about 33. I had no players for the left-hand side. So he had to play a left wing back, which didn't really help. We did draw it up level, but Milan were too good. They ended up battering us. And once they took the lead from here, there was no way back. 
So my question to you guys is, the Club World Cup at the end of the season, is that a thing from this point in the game? So that was season 14 wrapped. We add to our league titles on our Tassa de Portugal and we also add to the fact that I'm now a club legend and rightly so I think so, don't you? So it's time for season 15 and for season 15 we're going to have to find a viable alternative to this tactic to play away from home in the Champions League because that is our big stumbling block. We're also going to have a very busy pre-season dealing with all these wanted players. We do need to stay true to the save however. So we are ticking off these achievements really well. Now, the become bigger than Porto is up in the air. Domestically, yes, but people will say I need to win a Champions League to double underline that. So we'll see on that one. But the net transfer profit of £1 billion, if people come in for these players that are good bids that would be considered in real life, we must take them. It's for this reason that I'm going to get ready for it by creating some recruitment focuses. So I'm all ready to go in the transfer market. And then this happened. Now, this is my staff transfer out. Can you see this? Barcelona have stolen Gundogan. They paid 1.5 million for him. They've appointed him as a coach. He was my assistant manager, so we've lost our assistant manager, Ilkay. So it's time to use that as an opportunity to refresh the staff. In came Enzo Maresca, one of Pep Guardiola's students. He's a coach. Yanam Viers came in as well. I've also brought in Marcel Sabitzer. And don't forget, we've still got Jorginho in there as our head of youth development. Robin Van Persie. We've got some decent coaches here. New assistant manager was Pep Linders. If you have a look at his attributes, he is wildly, wildly good. So he should make a bit of a difference. We've now got a 20-man coaching staff. And in the league, we are the best in Portugal by a mile. We've also added to the recruitment team. And we are the best in the league in that. So this was a busy period for staffing. And this is the most time I've took on this as well. If you look at the under-19 staff, I've upgraded that. We are now the best in the league for coaching. Even medical is the best. But we're the best coaching team in the league for the under-19s as I try and try to get at least one decent player this year. After a manic pre-season, the Super Cup got underway. After 90 minutes, we were tied with our biggest new rivals for Malasio. But our penalty shootout heartache continued and we lost the Super Cup. Okay, fast forward a little bit and it has been a very interesting time this summer. That's all I'll say. I don't even know where to start. So you remember those recruitment focuses we set up? You'll notice the transfer window is now closed because it's been pretty hectic. Transfers out 172 million. It's a record, record time. The first man out the door was Dylan, our goalkeeper. He's gone to Real Madrid. 72 million up front, rising to 86 million. Remember, we bought Dylan for 1.6 million. Real Madrid had not finished yet. Vlad the Destroyer, the triggered his release clause, 80 million. Bought for 2.4 million, sold for 80. Alongside that, a few fringe players left, meaning the 172 million. Now, we replace them with 42.5 million worth of talent. Rodrigo goes, but I like to have somebody who's got a bit of experience. I brought in Gabriel Martinelli on a free transfer. Juan Lucas has came in from Barcelona on loan for the season. We might sign him. He looks like a bit of an upgrade. I plan to play him in central midfield. Now, the rest of these guys are all youth players, and you can see the South American influence. Let's have a look at them. Gabriel Santos is a winger. I bought him because I expect Trapovsky to leave at some point. He's very, very good. He's a wounded kid, 19 years old. 4.5 million from Hadjik Split. Anal Rodas. Now, he could play either centre-back, but I'm going to play him at inverted full-back, and he could be the replacement for Pozo, who continues to attract attention. 3.2 million signing. Possibly the pick of the bunch, Gonzalo Irusta. He's an Argentinian. He's only 18. He's six foot four. His attributes are fantastic. The scouts did a worldie here. 6.5 million. Jonathan Duarte is the replacement for Dylan in goals. Now he's only 18, so we're taking a risk, but that's what we did with Dylan. I like him. 6.5 million. How about Leo Zeno? 19 year old. I plan to play him as an attacking midfielder. Great attributes, but the little hidden one there, 6 foot 6, 90 kilograms. What a player. He's like an absolute unit, but he's got beautiful, beautiful technical ability as well. Keep an eye on him. He's our club record, 17 million, but I think he'll be worth it. That meant we spent 42.5 million. Brought in 172, spent 42. I guess it could be that time, as requested. The calculator is back, so we'll stick in 1 billion. Here we go. That's 10. That's, that's right, isn't it? Is that right? So if we go to my overview, I have spent 124, so we'll add that on, 124 million. See, I'm being fair. I could have took that off, so it made it look better. That's 124 billion, right? Which means 
overall we are 1 billion 100 etc etc now we have raised 457 million so we're going to take that off 457 million going in i think that's right is that right oh, take two let's try that again so we'll take 457 million this is hard i mean how often do you have to think about these figures in daily life oh that's right so we'll take that off and that leaves us with 667 million to go. I mean, that's the best it's looked. That's as, that's the best I can say. I forgot one player. This is George Horry Angel. And the reason I forgot about him is I bought him last season and loaned him back out to his team for 3.1 million. But he is also another centre back. So I am well covered. They're all just really young. So it's a risk. And the sheer amount of new players that we've got coming in means that it's going to be a take a while to get them used to each other. So the floor this season hasn't quite been there yet. It hasn't quite been there. And you can see that by the fixtures there. It's all a bit stop and start, stop and start. The Champions League's been a bit hit and miss. We've won our home games, but we got battered by Leipzig. We've got a draw against Dortmund, so that's good. But Porto drew against us. We're definitely not flowing as well. And I'm putting that down to all the new players and the fact that all of them are young. Super young. It's my youngest team I've ever had now. And that leads me to a big question. So if you're watching this entire episode, thank you very much. And this is the big question. Are you ready? We've been doing this save for three months now. We've rose from the absolute pits of Portuguese football down, down, down. And now we're up here. Probably the best team in Portugal over the last four or five seasons. We've got a beautiful new stadium. The facilities are beautiful. Is this the last season? Is this the last go at it? Normally when I do a save, 15 years is probably my limit. We're at 15 seasons now, I think. Is this the end? I think I know what I'm going to do, but I'd like to hear your thoughts down in the comments. It's been a great ride either way. Do we carry on till we win the Champions League? Or do we finish this season out and say ta to Salgueros and go on to our next journey? C plus, a C plus from the board. Really? So you could say it's been a bit of a struggle this season, but it's because of players like this that I'm keeping a bit of faith. This is our 19-year-old centre-back, Gonzalo Arusta. Have you seen better attributes on a player that age for a centre-back? So we've been knocked out of both cups, but we have started to do quite well in the league and the Champions League's gone really well. So my young, young team are actually top of the league, despite that C-plus from the board. They've turned things around and they're starting to cook. In the Champions League league phase, we missed out on the top eight just by a point, and we only lost that one match to Leipzig, where we got battered, but we recovered really well. So we weren't playing well. It's a young team with a lot of new players in it. So I wanted to have a little look into the tactic and see if we could improve things. And Daniel has fell off a cliff. This is Daniel, our... Left wing back, he's 22 years old, he's been capped by Brazil since he's been with us, but this season he hasn't been very good, so I was looking at him and I thought, what's gone wrong? So I went to his personal data hub, his player analytics, and had a little look around. Now, the defending one looks really bad, but if you look at it a bit closer, you can see it's just headers, he's not winning, everything else is pretty much pretty good. Not giving away fouls, no problem with that, so he's doing pretty well. Now, this is the one I wanted to look at, this is creativity, and bear in mind, he is the main creative force down that left-hand side. You can see he's doing loads of dribbles, He's getting interceptions in. His key passes are okay, but his assists per 90 minutes is garbage. And more worryingly was his cross-completion rate of 6.1. That's awful. Add to that the movement, you can see here that he gets lots of dribbles, like we've seen, but he's very, very loose in possession, giving the ball away, more than any other left-back or right-back in the league. He does have his positives. Physically, he's fantastic. He's got massive distance covered because he's operating down that left flank with loads of sprints, so that's not the problem. So looking at it a bit closer, the complete wing back player instruction wise, it does a lot, it gets further forward, stays wider, roams from position, and we had PIs on, so I've changed a few now to help him with the areas he was struggling. So I've added take fewer risks, which means less passing risks, so he won't try and do anything crazy, especially when he's got those creative players ahead of him, he doesn't need to. And I've asked him to cross on the byline in the hope that that will improve his cross ratio, because it looked like 
watching him match when he was getting the ball in these areas. He was just pinging it, pinging it, and it wasn't, it wasn't doing it. And with these players up front, I think he'd be better served waiting to cross till he gets to the byline. Since we brought that in, there's been a bit of an improvement. Club-wise, there's been some good news. Jao Pedro signed a new contract. £100,000 a week. I can't believe we're paying that sort of money, but he is worth it. Not only him, but Mabasso as well. He stays with £45,000 a week. And also, Sarakam stays as well on £60,000. So that's three players all locked in with no release clauses. So we got through the Champions League. And interestingly, in the knockout playoff round, it's threw up our domestic rivals, Famalasio. I'm sure the game's doing this just so I have to pronounce that team's name over and over. So we drew the first game 1-1, brought them back to our spot, and we got the job done just. 2-1, so we beat them 3-2 on aggregate and through to the last 16. Leo Zeno scored the goal, by the way, and he has started to cook as well. You can see his progression, his attributes are starting to rise. He is only 20 years old, our record signing at 17 million, but 14 goals this season in 28 matches from that attacking midfielder position. So here we are, Champions League last 16. Bayern at home. We've got to get a good win in this home leg, right? Four minutes gone. Damn it. But the boys, the boys responded really well. Leo Zinho down the right-hand side, whipped it across, and there was our boy Vigas. And after 78 minutes, what could prove to be a crucial goal, Santos down the right, one of the wonder kids, and Kim Min bagged it. 2-1 in the first leg. We could have done with a bigger lead, but we'll take it. Yeah, so in the second leg, I don't think we can afford to go attacking. That's been our big problem. Every time we've gone away to a team in the Champions League, a big team, we've lost. We beat them at home, we can't get the job done. So we're going to have to change elements of this tactic for the away game. I wanted to drill down a bit before we went into this big match and I noticed this. This is a tab that I haven't used for a couple of seasons and I should be using it all the time, so fool me. Conceding, this shows the assists from the last 25 matches and look at the big outlier there. Ten assists from the opposition have came from crosses. Crosses. So we need to cut that out. So very simply for the next Bayern match, what we had locked in was trap inside. So we're going to bring the opposition into us where we've got those four bodies in midfield and hopefully not expose our left back as much. We'll also drop the mentality down to balance, but we're going to go back to attacking in periods of the match just so we don't sit back too deep. Are you ready? So here we are, Bayern away. One minute gone, if you can believe it. One minute gone and Bayern already on the attack for Musiala. Pozo brings him down. Penalty given. So it's Musiala, a worldwide star who spent his entire career at Bayern against Duarte, our teenage goalkeeper in his first season with us that we bought from Argentina. One minute into the last 16. Wow. One of the best penalty saves I've seen. With that, we kept it tight. And on 79 minutes, that combination struck gold. Stunning. We're 1-0 up. But straight away, straight from the kickoff, here come Bayern. It's 1-1. 2-3 one, one, on aggregate. Bayern couldn't break us down. And we've only got to knock them out. The big change was in the second half when we completely flipped the match momentum thanks to a couple of tweaks. And here are the tweaks. The first one is the striker position. Advance forward now for João Pedro instead of a complete forward. I want him higher up and not worrying about assisting as much, especially when he's got these guys in behind him. Also, Vegas, because he's so good as an advanced playmaker, little reminder, I mean, that's ridiculously good. We added in just a couple of player instructions more direct passing and roaming from position so he can go wherever he wants with a little eye on staying wide. You'll also notice that the right wing has moved up higher. It's Santos or Tripovsky, just depending on which one's going to play. And I've moved my central midfielder up from the DM spot and covering that DM spot now, we've got a bit more adventurous with our fullback who will be an inverted wing back instead of fullback. So instead of coming across there like that, he sits in there more often, which means Brian, our boy Brian, get further forward, get into that gap there. Team instruction wise for that last match, I dropped the counter press because I wanted them to get back into shape quicker because we're a bit more aggressive. So if we have counter press on, these guys will be all committed. So taking it off means they'll get back a bit faster and we left counter on. 
because I knew we were going to be under loads of pressure. I dropped the defensive line to lower as well. And there's that trap inside. So forcing them in, but nice and low and compact. So we get into the Champions League quarterfinals where we will play RB Leipzig. Now Leipzig are elite and you will recognise their captain there. That's Susano. Susano, who was our left wing back that we had on loan that season, who was fantastic. Absolutely love him. He went to Barca. Now he's at Leipzig. We're coming up against him. Coached by Unai Emery, and he likes to play a 4-2-4, so this is going to be a very attacking match, this. Could be scary. But what does give me hope is here, when you look at his 10s too, the way he sets his team up, use player marking, so he's going to ask his players to get tight. And if you think of my team, with all the off-the-ball movement, the acceleration, the agility, that could play into our hands. But still, it's going to be a hell of a challenge, because if you go down the side here, just to any random player, you can see the value of each player, 94 million to 132. We're playing them home first, so we're going to use a variation of the away tactic by dropping Brian to a Volante instead of a box-to-box -box midfielder. Believe it or not, I think he'll be a bit more aggressive from that position, starting deep and then bombing on. We're also going to bring the defensive line higher for this match. Because we're at home, we're going to start with a higher defensive line. Away from home, we might drop that down, but we need to get the win in this first match. Hopes were lifted when pretty much straight from kickoff. Just over a minute gone. João Pedro did that. boys played great time and time again we split Leipzig open but it ended 1-0 if you look at the match stats that's really frustrating considering we hit the woodwork and had five clear cut chances this could be an opportunity missed so for the second leg after a lot of thought I set up like this I used a box to box rather than a Segunda on attack I also brought in the counter with a lower defensive line So that defensive setup done the trick. I'm so proud of these boys. And that means in the semi finals, I mean, would you believe it? Right, this is the conundrum we've got now. We've got this massive game coming up against Real Madrid for the holy grail of the Champions League. And I feel like the quiet bit has been the league. We've just been chugging along in the league. And if I show you it, well, I'll give you a glimpse of it. There's four games left and we are neck and neck with Benfica. And the conundrum is this next run of games could make or break our season. So we've got this league game, which should be straightforward, but then we've got Real Madrid first leg, and then Benfica, and then Real Madrid. Those three matches are separated by six days. So do we start resting players for the league to prioritise the Champions League? I mean, they're in great health at the minute. You can see the condition down the side, and the morale's amazing. Everything's right in the club, but they can't all play three games in six days. So for the next game, which should be straightforward, I'm going to rest basically the entire squad. So everyone you see there, I'm going to go straight up here and I'm going to press clear, entire team selection. I'm going to start from scratch and just put basically a full reserve team in and risk it. So that's what we did. And the front three was Mbasso, Kim Min and Martinelli. And Santos coming as well. I'm fortunate that my backup attacking players are really good and they probably could start. So that was pretty straightforward. Now it's time for Real Madrid. We've got to attack them at home. We played out from the back and it cost us... The 
Early in the second half, we are 1-0 behind and it got a little bit worse here. Pedro to Abrams, it's 2-0 in the first leg at home. We did our best, but we couldn't break through. Next, it was time for the big championship potential decider against Benfica. So that Madrid game deflated us a bit, so I put my full strength team out against Benfica. And yet again, it was a mistake at the back playing out. We go behind. After a couple of tweaks in the second half, we came back at Benfica. Somehow that went in. And we'll take a draw, to be honest. We probably didn't deserve it. That meant the league situation is we're three points clear with two games to go now. Now it's time for this second leg against Real Madrid. I'm not sure what to do here. I was thinking back to last season when we played really well and got that draw and lost on penalties. But we're 2-0 behind, so we can't go negative. We're going to have to go at them. So we're going to play the home formation and see how we go. 20 blooming seconds into the match. 20 seconds. We need a hot start. Jude Bellingham. Why is he even still there? So he put it away. That was 1-0. Proud of the boys, though. Leo Zeno through, and now Joe Pedro does what he does. We're back in it. 20 minutes gone. But in honesty, we were outclassed in this one. It feels like we've gone a little bit backwards. And there was Jude Bellingham yet again. Our dreams are over. We're out in the semi-final to Real Madrid. I used to like Jude Bellingham. Now that great run in the Champions League, alongside the sales of players have meant the balance of the club now is a, a astonishing 114 million. In the league, there's one game to go. We are three points clear as we look to claim our third title in four years. I'll tell you what, we were kept waiting all up until the 46th minute. We got a penalty and Vegas dispatched and 82 minutes a set piece in it goes champions again so another great season the third title in the bag i really should be buzzing with this i'm just still gutted about that champions league defeat and my mind is thinking do we need to change anything and then i flip back to thinking we got to the semis don't change anything just upgrade the personnel it's a conundrum but like I say, the finances are now ridiculous. And for those of you who've been through this entire journey, you'll remember what they used to look like. All the finances have meant that unbelievably, we are deciding to build ourselves a brand new stadium. That is right, costing 51 million. So that's going to leave a big chunk in the finances. The board are going to build us a new stadium with a 28,600 capacity, which is more than double what we've got now. This club continues to grow. We should be really proud of the way we've grown this club and the rankings have came out for the teams in UEFA and we are ranked 8th, 8th now overall, ahead of such teams as Real Madrid, our new nemesis, Liverpool, Bayern and Manchester United. So that is season 15 done, we move on to season 16 and you can see there's already a raft of players wanted, I feel like it's going to be one of those pre-seasons where we're deflecting bids left, right and centre, but remember, if the bids are big, we've got to take them. Straight away a bid comes in and it's Real Madrid again. They've already took our two best players and now they're after Joao Pedro. They offer 60 million. For me, that's not enough. Rejected. Arsenal came in with a 52 million bid for Tripovsky. Rejected that. Just not enough. And now Barcelona are starting to creep around Vegas. This is going to be a long summer. So all my players are wanted, but look at that down that side. One, two, three, four, five international clubs all want a slice of me. That's nice. In transfer news, Sergio Pozo finally left us. He's joined Southampton for a fee of 48.5 million. It rises to 52 million, but I can't help but think we could have got more. But a signing I'm really happy with is Alvaro Pexoto here. We signed him from Portuguese league team Vitor Gamares. I was a bit concerned I didn't have many Portuguese players. He's only 18, definitely one for the future. And he only cost 3.6 million. We are deep into pre-season now. Uh, just a couple of them signings, a few more to come hopefully. Still a rake of players wanted. I'm going to try and build a new tactic to try in pre-season and to see if it flies because I just can't help getting that Champions League game out of my mind. I really feel like a variation of a 4-4-2. I probably don't have the players for it at the minute, especially with the need for two inverted wing-backs. But the fall of Danielle has just made me think that I need a different system that doesn't rely on this position here bombing down the flank. So here we go, we tried it against Famalico. That's right, Famalico in the Super Cup. And we got absolutely murdered 5-1. But at least I can say Famalico now. So late in the transfer window, we managed to sign Martin Porowski. He's another 18-year-old. He's 6'6", six six, not sure on where I'm going to play him yet. Let me know what you think. Centre-back, defensive midfield? 
Now, we also broke our transfer record with a fee that will rise to 20 million for Isaac Boateng. I wanted a bit more experience. He's in his peak years at 26, but what a bizarre player. He's a natural at striker. He's a natural at centre-back. He can also play right-back. What would you do with this guy? And have you seen better mental attributes than that? I had to buy him. So I didn't really give the chance to a 4 4 2. I abandoned it after that 5 1 shocker. I've just tweaked our tried and trusted, really. I've got a register back in the team, thanks to Dennis, because he's that good of a player. Look at him. It's probably not his favoured position, but we're trying him there. And in version two, the big change is on the right hand side. I've got a wing back on attack with an inverted winger, because that's me trying to find a way to get Santos, the Brazilian winger wonder kid in the team, alongside Tripovsky when he's not blooming injured, because he's also elite, but he can play as an attacking wing back. So that's what I'm thinking of bringing in to go alongside the tried and trusted. Since that absolute whopping by for Malacau, we've actually been pretty good, you know. Pretty steady away in the Liga Portugal. And also the Champions League has started pretty well as well. A really good draw there against Man City, in which we probably should have won. A nice, nice win away at Roma. And this is key because away has been our problem. But we dominated that one. So we didn't lose any more players in the transfer window, so we're good to go until January, and then they'll all come back in for them. But we're doing all right so far, deflecting those bids. Now, look at the league table. Something's shifted here. We're doing all right with third with only one defeat away to Benfica. But look who's creeping back into the fray. As we know, Porto have been out of the equation for years. I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that Dimitri Payet's now their director of football. So Porto back in the equation, alongside Benfica, we're tucked in at third. This could be a tricky season, this one. Now, we've got a massive game in the Champions League. We're currently undefeated in 11th, two wins, two draws, but we're about to play Liverpool away. We've had actually a pretty tough draw in this league stage of the Champions League. I'm going to try a slightly different tactic for this Liverpool game. Here is said tactic, I'll go for it properly on next episode. Same setup, but team instructions a lot different, including a mentality switch. It led to the Liverpool match. And this might blow your socks off, because it blew mine off. Over the last few seasons, this has been a regular occurrence for Sal Garrosh. League wins, cup wins, league cup wins. We've been really successful. Major news coming out of Sal Garrosh today. Is manager Davidson's time finally up? So what has happened this season that's brought this on? League Cup semi-final, Porto. Casa de Portugal, 6th round, Benfica. Champions League then, round of 16, Bayern Munich, first leg. Champions League, second leg. But we can always rely on the league, right? So just like that, I'm going to tell you the sad, sad tale of season 20, 38, 39. Started with that thrashing in the Super Cup. Maybe that was a sign of things to come. We were knocked out in the League Cup, the Alliance Cup, by Porto. Sixth round knocked out by Benfica. Champions League pretty comfortable by Bayern Munich. And have a little look at the league table. Here's the league. We finished third. It's our lowest place finish in years and years. 
Look at the other two teams. Porto back in it. Benfica. We only lost four matches overall. But the other two teams, just too good. There's the league campaign. We scored 82 times. Conceded 29, 75 points, but could not catch those other two teams. We have dropped right off. So the reason this episode has started this way is this season has just been a complete washout. We haven't got going at all. Although we only lost four matches in the league, it never felt, it never felt quite there. So we're going to take this opportunity to revitalise things, reset, rebuild, if you like, and completely change the way we play. Now, we've been playing this system pretty much since season 12. We're in season 16 now, probably season 11, if I think back. Just tiny tweaks on this system. I press, I line, in your face football, attacking. We're going to completely bin it. And for season 17, we're going to completely change the way we play. Take a look deeper. The free tactic slots. I always advise having free versions of your tactic, but my versions are literally minimal changes there you can see. It's been this way for season on season. You can see the formation now in my manager profile. It's locked in. That is the formation that is linked to my career. So we're going to take this opportunity to not only revitalise the way the team plays as we hunt that Champions League trophy and try and get our title back, we're going to revitalise the squad as well. You can see all the wanted players down there. And if any of those players don't fit into the new way we're going to play, they are out of here. We're going to expect some big bids in the summer for the superstars you know who i have no idea how we're going to hold on to jao pedro who scored another 30 goals this season and obviously vigas who's wanted by everyone he wants a big move as well but look down there he's wanted by absolutely everybody and believe it or not this is the one i'm most worried about leo zinho has been the best player this season by a mile 26 goals 14 assists from attacking midfield with an average rating through the roof and now liverpool and real madrid of course are after him and one more to throw in there is a rooster who's developed into probably the best centre-back you will see on the game. Probably better than Vlad the Destroyer. All those teams after him. So I would expect at least two of those players to leave us. But look, all is not lost. The 50 best wonder kids in football list, we've got four in there, including goalkeeper Duarte and Pixotto in the top 10. Our cracking scouting team came up trunks in the transfer window as well in January. We ended up bringing a few more players in. Michael Mellon comes in from Malmo, central midfielder, can play attacking midfielder. He's got a big part to play. He's only 18, already capped five times by Sweden. 1.9 million, absolute snip. What a find. Marcello D'Souza comes in from Fluminense. 8 million pounds for this kid. He's only 20, again, red in South American football. Also in January, we managed to tie this guy down to a contract, El Oilson. He got released by Sao Paulo. I think his contract ran out. He's a little bit more experienced at 30 years old, but central midfield wise, great addition. So what are the thoughts for this new tactic next season? Well, if any of you saw the Man City video I did recently, I'm quite tempted to go down that route, which will mean a big change. It will mean going from really high tempo, dropping down to low tempo, try to dominate teams through possession rather than pace and direct football, which is what we do now. For starters, the mentality would change. Attacking players more linked to more direct stuff, so we probably have to drop that down to positive or balanced. In possession, we'll change a lot as well if we go down that route. Passing to space will probably go... Passing will drop to short and tempo, that'll get right down. How we set the team up will depend really on what sort of players we have at the start of the season. If I manage to keep hold of the defenders I've got now, I've got no problem playing a high line next season because if you look at the centre-backs, acceleration and pace and positioning of this guy, he's elite, he's elite. And next to him, Angel is no slouch over acceleration and pace of 13, 14. Positioning's good as well, so if we keep them two, we can keep that high line up, no problem. But it's a big if, it's a big if. So when I decided that the league was pretty much a write-off, I decided to play loads of the youth players. And in this game, we played Melin and we played Pexotto, just to give them a trial ready for next season. They linked up really nicely here to lay on a goal for Jao Pedro. Here's Melin floating her out, Pexotto, and a lovely little ball through to Pedro, who at 24 is now an elder statesman of the team. So this man could turn into a really important player for us, especially his adaptability there across the front four positions. Out wide, where we've never played a player for the last four seasons, that could be where he starts next season. At the minute, they seem happy. The supporters aren't happy, but these lots seem relatively happy. And that led to this. They finally got the fingers out and gave me a new contract. And not just a contract, four more years. Whether we see that out, I don't know, but they finally, finally got there. So listen, a big summer ahead. I'm going to go ahead right now. I'm going to take these slots out, look. I'm going to clear these slots, ready to build ourselves a brand new one this new season it's a hell of a risk we might have to take a step back to go forward so next season could be a bust 
big summer coming ahead. Before I go, I will leave you with two signings that I've got locked in for next season. They're about to come in in July. See what you think. Coming in on a free transfer is Hesum Cortijo from Wolverhampton Wanderers. He's already got 23 caps for Brazil. That is a defensive midfielder that I think a few of you thought that I was crying out for. And here's a man I'm excited about. 19-year-old coming in from Mexico, Jose Mora. You will have a look at the position I've highlighted on the screen there. Wide target forward next year, anybody? So here is my all-time best 11. Do you know what? If we had that team now all playing at their peak, I think we would win the Champions League. So I promised us a new way of playing. Take your eyes off the actual formation. And if you look at the team instructions, you'll see there has been a bit of a change. We're going slightly lower tempo instead of high tempo. It's a positive mentality and we're holding our shape. Now on the actual formation, there's some key role changes that have helped this happen. The anchor man has been key. And if you notice, we now have two inverted wing backs, both on defend. If we take Daniel, for example, if you remember a couple of videos back, I noticed his crossing was absolutely abysmal. Percentage down in the 3%. Now, because we've changed him to an inverted wing back on attack, you will now notice his cross completion percent is a whopping 30%. So he's not wasting crosses because in that role, he doesn't cross as much. But when he does, it's a lot better. He's picking his moments. So because we have two guys in the DM slots here, the inverted wing back on defend can't go into there as much as he normally would. So he still acts as a normal wing back staying wide but he uses the other attributes of the inverted wing back, meaning that he won't bomb to the byline and look for crosses and act like a winger. He will actually sit and play a ball a bit safer, more sensible. It just ties in better with what we're trying to do. Now, having said that, we still do have an alternative version of this, but teams like weaker teams that we're usually battering, to be honest, and it's here in slot one. It's the attack version, pretty much the same as last season, just with them two role changes that we've brought in, the anchor man and the inverted wing back. That combination, has been surprisingly key to all this. However, I will say this before we go on, if you look at the very top there, average possession, we are top of that by a mile now. 61%, so we're dominating the ball, which is what we wanted when we flipped all this. Early days, it took us a little while to get going and settled into the system. There's a few draws in there, we weren't really firing, hit and miss here and there. But as the time went on, we started to get going. They started to find the feet. This is a way to AC Milan in the Champions League. Nice away performance. In fact, the only defeat this season so far has been against Inter Milan at home, and you can see the state of the match there. You can imagine what I was doing to my computer screen. Overall, the Champions League phase was a huge, huge success. We only lost that one match. We finished in the glorious top eight, winning five out of eight. At one stage in the league, it looked like we weren't going to get defeated. We were flying. In fact, it took this. It was the only thing that stopped us. A moment of madness from El Oilson. That led to our first defeat of the season to Sporting. Two more defeats there to Benfica and for Malakau. But we have a reason for this. Now, folks, we've only lost three matches. We are top of the league, but it's super tight. It's like a free horse race with Porto and Benfica. 25 matches gone. But I'm really happy with it. Mostly because you won't believe the churn of the squad. You ready? As we sit in February, so both transfer windows are finished. Transfers out now equal 318 million. We brought in 64 million worth of players to try and replace that. But 318 million is gigantic. Which is why my squad is as small as it is. Okay, where do we start? Kim Min went to Leicester. 40 million rising to 42. Miroslav gone to Liverpool. 47 million. Isaac Boateng, I didn't know what to do with him, I won't lie to you. Got our money back, 20 million. Sarakan, been with us for ages, started to moan, out to Galatasaray for 15 million. Gabriel Santos, now he's gone to Crystal Palace for 64 million, which gave me a problem because he was there to replace Miroslav down the right hand side. The offer was too huge though. And the biggest of the lot, Vigas goes to Tottenham for 94 million, rising to 114 million. But in the safe stipulations where you must sell players when clauses are hit, oh, it's a bit realistic. That's what we had to do. What it does do, though, it does mean that net transfer profit of £1 billion is now getting ever closer. So, how the hell do you replace all those players? So, we had a free transfer in. We showed you him last time. Here's his Cortijo. We'll play defensive midfield. Along with Jose Moura, who we also showed you, but he's been playing pretty much at centre-back this season. Oliver Vidal came in from PSG for 11 million. 
He will play down the right hand side after we lost those other two. And more cover down the right hand side is Marcus Paolo. He's only 19. He's probably going to end up pretty elite, to be honest. He cost us 16 million. Robin Alpers Stoll comes in and he's going to play either wing back, decent cover, 12 million. Federico Gomez will supply cover on left back for that inverted wing back role. 19 years old, 2.5 million. And Vladimir Dokic comes in from Harmaby. I'm not sure where to play him yet. It looks like he could be a decent defensive midfielder. He cost us 1.8 million. But as you can see, no jaw dropping talent that I've brought in to replace the others because I'm relying on what I've already got to replace what I've sent. And this is why the formation change hasn't been massive because we've lost too many players. So to lose that many players and then to bring in a completely new system, I thought I was asking for trouble. So at least by keeping the same system with some different team instructions, we've kept it up in our performance levels. Next season might be the one where we completely change the actual setup when we've got a gist of what sort of squad we're going to have because at the minute, I've lost so many players. So after all that, all that upheaval, I'm pretty happy with the way they've been playing. £320 million worth of players, you'd expect this to be lower. With a new tactic, a new style of play, I think they're doing all right. We're out of the Alliance Cup in the semi-finals by Benfica, but we are in the semi-finals of the Tassa de Portugal. We've got Sporting coming up. And in the round of 16, we've drawn Bayer Leverkusen, who are top of the Bundesliga. So that's a pretty tricky one. But looking at those teams that are in the Champions League now, there is no easy game anymore. That is... Yeah, it's rough. But the league is where it's at. We need to get that title back. We've had a couple of defeats, but we are still the strongest team in the league. Now, look at our defensive record. So, in 25 matches, we've scored 51. So, we're going two a match. But we've only conceded 12, which is fantastic for a new system. And I put all that down to those two new player roles. The inverted wing back on defend on the left and the anchor man. It's super, super solid now. And we're still scoring a decent amount of goals. In other news, Bo Vista appointed Kylian Mbappe in late November. And in February, they sacked him. So should we have a little look at the running total? Because after that season of transfers, I think we're getting up there now. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the calculator. So how do we go about this? So we've got a billion pounds, right? This is always fun. 100,000, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million, 1 billion, right? We'll add to 1 billion what we've spent, which looks to be 236 million. So let's pop that in there and that'll equal 1.2 billion next we'll take off what we've redeemed which is 916 million pounds which is absolutely nuts when you think about it i didn't realize it was that big so that's 9.1 91 that's 916 which gives our grand total towards this 1 billion pound transfer profit of 320 million to go what once seemed like an impossible task is now nearly there, isn't it? We just need a couple of players that will bring as much money as the likes of Vegas did. And that part of the challenge is almost there. Champions League, another big match. And yet again, a stupid red card. An already tricky task was made harder. We lost to the best team in the Bundesliga, 2-0 away. We needed a big performance in the return leg and we got it. We played really well. Leo Zeno gave us a chance. Pushing forward though, we got caught on the break after 81 minutes. Leverkusen level it up on the night. And the knockers out 3-1 on aggregate. The Champions League, we just can't get there. In fact, we're now hitting a blip, a big time blip. One win in our last seven and we've dropped to second. Even worse, it's Porto who go top. But I'll try not to be too downhearted because the sheer volume of players that left and came in means to be anywhere near the top is a bit of a decent result. There is still work to do on this tactic, especially for next season, but for now we'll see if we can get us over the line, get us a domestic double. With Vegas leaving, Peck Soto has stepped up fantastically well. In 30 games this season, he scored 12 times with 7 assists and he's still only 19. And remember, he only cost us 3.7 million from Vito Gamares. And our biggest hope this season is the front three of Pexotto, Leo Zeno and João Pedro. Those three together are dynamite.
Okay, the good news, the good news is we're in the Tassa de Portugal final. And in the league, we caught and overtook Porto. The bad news is Benfica caught us both and overtook us. There's two games left. Our next game is against local rivals Porto. They can potentially stop us winning the league. The suspicious side of me thinks they came to do just that. They showed little to no attacking intent. Look how many players they have behind the ball. And this was a constant thing throughout this match. It ended nil-nil, no good to us. And meanwhile, Benfica got the 1-0 win, which meant for the second straight season, Benfica are champions. Potentially, we could go our second season in a row, trophyless. It's the Tassidy Portugal final. So thankfully we don't go trophyless and Marcus Paolo has started to come into the team. I'm getting ready for more transfers leaving us to be honest. He started seven times, five assists, we'll keep an eye on him for next season. And then bang, just like that, the toughest job offer I've had to turn down yet. Man City finally come calling, but it's a no. That was actually quite tough to turn down, that. that's quite tough, that's my team, but here we go. It's all about Salgueros and that tactic. We're going to park it for now. We're going to keep it in tactic slot one, but we're going to build that new tactic in tactic slot two for season 18 coming up. I'm dreading the transfer window after last year. I'm tired of being nice. I've got brutal. I've got brutal. Diego Valente, our club legend from day one. I have sacked him as director of football. In his place comes Fernandinho. It's not just a choice because it's a cool choice, but with our reliance on South America, I think he's a better fit for our club. He's our new director of football, which means our staff levels are again the highest in the league, both coaching team, that's pretty good, and the recruitment team as well. So we had the whole preseason to try our new tactic and first up was a Super Cup against Benfica. As always, we had quite a few players to bed in here, but it's really promising. So we managed to keep Leo Zeno after another hectic transfer window. We're going to get to that shortly. We've built a new tactic, which we're working with. He's playing a little bit deeper than last season. Before we get to the tactic, I'll talk you through that. Let's have another look at another transfer window. Before we get to this year's transfer window, last year's transfer window ended up maxing out at 342 million. That's when all the other additional bonus fees and things came through. So yeah, 342 for last season. For this season, it's another huge one. Another £214 million worth of players has left the club. We've brought in £54 million to try and get a bit of a squad together. But let's have a look at who's left us. The first one, which we're pretty gutted about, is our anchorman, Hearsum Cortijo. We only had him for one year. Signed on a free transfer, he leaves the club for £63 million, rising to £78. Daniel joins Newcastle for £42 million. Left back. I never really got the best out of him, so I'm not too worried about that one. However, now there's some big ones. Jonathan Duarte was our young goalkeeper. He's 21 now. He's gone to Bayer Leverkusen for 60 million, rising to 70 plus. And finally, Gonzalo Arusta, the best centre back I think I've had in this game, has joined Tottenham. They've raided us yet again for 60 million, rising to 78. So to replace that, I've got another clutch of young players into the club. To replace Daniel, I think we've got a better player here in Miguel Angel Sanchez. He only cost us 8 million to replace our Brazilian anchor man. This is Peter Vazinja. He cost us 11 million from Dinamo. Attacking midfielder Sandro Rogerio comes in for 15 million, our biggest outlay of the summer. Also, signed with a clutch of young players that we've sent out on loan immediately. So, somehow, some way, we've managed to cobble together a team for season 18. You can see the amount of players we've got on loan there. We might have to recall a few if we get a few injuries. Because it's pretty light. It's a pretty light squad. The average age of this squad is just 22. And that's bulked out massively by El Olsen, who's 31. The elder statesman of the team. We turned down bids for Pedro, Leo Zeno. It could have been a lot worse. So this is what we're left with. And we've got ourselves a 4 3 3 I'll go through it now. I guess we'll start with the team instructions. You can see it's a positive mentality. We're going short of passing. Just a slightly higher tempo. Nothing too outrageous in transition. We're actually holding our shape when we win the ball back so we can build attacks again. And down here, we're going quite aggressive with a high line. 
and a step up more to try and squash the play a bit. As far as the team goes, we've got this complete wing back, which I think Sanchez will do a better job than Daniel did. These are the two centre-backs that we'll see out the season. Now we lost Gonzalo. No problem with that. And in goals, we've got Garcia. We brought him in last season as a backup to Duarte. He's six foot six. I've got no issue with him. I think he'll be absolutely fine. Now, in build-up play, the inverted wing-back will sit in here alongside Ella Olsen to give us a two in there, which means Leo Zeno can push on and Melling can push on as well to link up with Marcus Paolo down there. Not forgetting that Sanchez will spend most of his time up here. So it's still a really attacking, aggressive tactic. It's just a bit more patient than the other one. Saying that, though, that still will be there if we need it. So if we need to drop back to that, if things aren't working with this one, we will do that. After all that upheaval, we're down in second for the odds for the season. 3-1, to one, Benfica pretty strong favourites. But we have started the season pretty solid. We've won every match other than one against Bovista. So the team are getting to know the new formation. Now, off the pitch stuff, have a little look at this. This is the balance of the club at the minute. 323, nearly 324 million in profit. They must be loving life. And that's down to this. I've never seen this in FM, but here we are. The transfer value of our 121 players we have sold is now 1.16 billion pounds. So the initial goal of getting a 1 billion pound profit is very close now. We'll do the maths, I think, on the next episode after the next January transfer window. More stuff behind the scenes. Some beautiful new kits there from Talis. Look at those. Kappa for you old school Serie A fans. I'm actually liking them that much. I'm considering getting concept kits made for us to wear. Thoughts? Also... Have a look above my head. I've been working so hard on the board. Facilities now. 16 for training facilities. 17 for youth facilities. The academy coaching up to 14. The youth recruitment up to 15. Surely this is the year we get at least one player that isn't absolutely awful in the youth recruitment. Right? So on to season 18 we go. We've got five trophies to go for. We've got one in the bag. And the big one, obviously, as always, is the Champions League. But I won't lie, I want that league title back. It's been two years now. We need to get that back. Let's see. Welcome back to Salgueros. We are in season 18. It's Christmas time, but I'm not feeling the festive cheer. That's right, our talisman has been ruled out for two to four months. That is brutal. With the new 4 3 3, things have been going well in the league. We're sitting top five points clear at the minute, despite that huge transfer turnover. So I am expecting a blip at some point, and January transfer window is on the way. But overall, results really good. Champions League's been a bit hit and miss. We seem to be losing our away games, but winning at home. With a couple of games left, we're sat in 12th, so it's going to be a struggle to get into that top eight. I said we should keep an eye on Marcos Paolo, and he has been electric. Seven goals, nine assists. His attributes are going crazy. He's only 20. He looks like being our next superstar player. So far, so good in season 18 with this 4-3-3. We're not blowing teams away, conceding a few, but it's a completely new squad. So happy so far. Just finished the January transfer window. Some of you might recall this clip. If it doesn't work, you know, I know what the implications are. Yes, that was a clip of Kevin Keegan and the infamous sale of Andy Cole in January to Manchester United many years ago. You might notice our transfers out now reads at 295. Joe Pedro has signed for Manchester City. That's right, Joe Pedro leaves us for 80 million, rising to 100 million. I had to cash in. He had one year left of his contract, but it hurts. Oh, it hurts. He leaves us as the record goal scorer in Salgueros history. Now, like we always do, we have someone lined up to replace him. Welcome to the club, Evandro Nasesian. Now, he's another striker from Flamengo. He's a little bit older at 26. He cost me 18 million. I got him straight away. He made his debut against Benfica, and after five minutes, he did that. After 27 minutes, the boys are absolutely flying now. He scores again, and on 82 minutes, a dream debut was complete as he bags his hat-trick. A stunning victory, probably the best victory we've had in the league since we started at Salgueros. 
And what a start he's had since he joined us. That's 10 appearances, 10 goals. And after making the decision to sell João Pedro, boy, did I need that to happen. And he started superbly. So this is the state of play at the minute. We're in the final of the Alliance Cup. We haven't won that for a few years. We're up against Sporting. In the Tassa di Portugal, we've got Porto coming up. In the Champions League, we've been drawn against Dortmund, which is going to be a toughie. Now, the league, you'll notice we have dropped. We have dropped big time. We're down to fourth. A combination of, I think, all the games we're playing and the sheer volume of players coming in, going out. The familiarity is not really there. They're just not clicking. So we are still persistent with the 4-3-3. Now, we've got some players to show you that have came back from loans and some new players we brought in in January. This is Fabio De Silva, an 18-year-old left wing back. We paid hardly anything for him. Six million in from Brazilian football. Keep an eye. Jakob Johansson in from Copenhagen. Already valued between 42 and 55 million. We spent 11 million on him. Can play in behind the striker as a striker or central midfield. And he's only 20 years old. New centre-back from Brazilian football is Daniel Nunes. He cost me £9 million. Potential. Now, returning to the club is Nahol Morales. We bought him last season, if you look here, for £2 million and loaned him straight back to his club. But he's got super potential for us. He's going to be a big player in the second half of the season. So that wasn't ideal, but back to the Champions League, away to Dortmund in this tricky, tricky tie. This is the elimination playoff before the last 16. Necessian puts us in front. Only 34 minutes gone. Watch this. Watch this finish. Beautiful turn. Bang. We've got a player here. After 55 minutes, we unbelievably went 3-0 up away at Dortmund. They came back at us a little bit, but a 4-2 win away from home. Great first leg. It was time for the second leg now. Shocking back pass. Dortmund flying out the gates. Shortly after, it was two, all level. But the boys came back at them, and despite the close scoreline, this was a great, great performance. Look at that goal. We eliminate Dortmund 7-4 on aggregate, and the overall performance in that game was great. Unfortunately for us, in the last 16, we drew Liverpool, who are just ridiculous on this game. In the league, we're still way behind Sporting, but we do have a game in hand. The first leg against Liverpool, we couldn't break them down. We really, really needed to get something out of this first leg. Go to Anfield at 0-0. Bit of a transition season, this one. We've had that many players gone out and coming in. I think I make it now. £650 million worth of players have gone out in the last season and a half, which is ridiculous. But we're on a decent run in the league. We haven't lost since the 2nd of February. But look at all the games and the different competitions. That's what's killing us. I'm about to play the second leg against Liverpool. Not sure what to do. It's 0-0. We're going to need to score, aren't we? Because they're bound to score against us. We've got a second version of this 4-3-3. It turns into more of a 4-5-1. Mentality drops down a little bit. Just little tweaks here and there. I think we'll start with this. And then if we need to transition to the normal 4-3-3, we might go with that. I've also got a league formation now to attack the league, which I'll show you after this one. We might even break into that if we need to. Now, as expected, we are getting a bit of a batter in here. Our keeper, Garcia, is having the game of his life. But after 35 minutes, they finally broke us down and took the lead. But stop the clocks. Now, it didn't look like we had any chance. But on 90 minutes, Pexoto dives in. 1-1. One, one, let's go. It's extra time. We're on the attack here, but let me show you the formation I'm using in this extra time period. And there it is. This is how much we've been up against it. I've gone to a back five, which I haven't used at all. I've got a mentality of defensive. I'm counter-attacking. I'm just hoofing it over the opposition defense. You could say it's backs to the walls kind of stuff, right? But where was I? Back to the match. 94 minutes gone. Here's Dokic down the right. The makeshift wing back. Necessian absolutely cracks the crossbar, comes back in, and Melin gets us in front. It's 108 minutes gone now. Liverpool are desperate. I'm not saying that's a penalty. I am raging. Penalty given. That's 2-2. Two, two. Right, before we start this penalty shootout, I'm very well aware of my awful record at penalty shootouts. I'm speeding this up.
Now, granted, we got battered, but still, to concede that late, and another penalty shootout. But following this, we made the decision we need to attack this league because we need something from this season. So, we went back to the tried and trusted, the Salgueros Season 17 attack. We're going to use that in the league from now on, and the 4-3-3 will be our European formation. But that is what we're taking on with the league as we hunt down Sporting. And the signs were good in the Tassidy Portugal semi-final first leg against local rivals Porto. Wait for these match stats. That is what you call a one-sided match. Wow. The decision to go back to this tactic was proven to be the right one. You could say this tactic is our DNA and it was starting to show. We'd rose up to second now, only four points behind Sporting with seven matches to go. So yeah, that's our league tactic going forward. And that is Europe. Sporting started to feel the pressure, only three wins out of the last eight matches. Meanwhile, we kept the pressure on and Leo Zeno was back from his injury. This meant with three games to go, we are one point behind Sporting now and Benfica have also shot up. Our old rivals Benfica, there's two points between the top three teams. Quickly stepping away from this action, you'll notice our facilities have moved up again. The academy coaching up to 17, the youth recruitment up to 17 as well. Which brings me to this, it's the end of an era for the Salgueros Stadium. It was built in 2027 if you remember, but next season we move into our new, even bigger stadium and the last match that we play in this stadium will be against Porto and it's huge. We warmed up for that Porto game with a 7-1 away win. It's definitely good to have Leo Zeno back as he bags a hat-trick. Porto's mini revival last season looks like being short-lived as we do what we always do to Porto. We battered them in the huge match. With Sporting continuing to struggle, this meant with one game to go, we are top of the league. One point ahead of Benfica. Interestingly, Benfica's last match is Sporting. Now Benfica did in fact beat Sporting 2-1, which meant we had to win. Now that is a right result. With the amount of players that have came and gone, I am buzzing that we've won the league. Now, the sixth goal, you might notice, was a penalty. So I was absolutely sick of us losing penalty shootouts constantly. We missed about five penalties through the season as well. So I put keeper Garcia on it. Dig that out. So we get our title back. That's our fourth league title, our first for two years, but we're back in the winner's chair now. Once we flipped back to the Salgueros DNA tactic, which is what I'm calling it now, and I'll put that tactic down in the description so you can have a go with it. We scored 91 times there, only conceding 28. Absolute fire. I switched to it later on and you can see the results. We absolutely plundered the goals in. 7-1, 3-0, 6-0, 4-0. Unbelievable. I've still got one game to go, by the way, and it's in the Tassidy Portugal final against Benfica. We're going to cover that in the next episode because below that is yet again the FIFA World Cup. We're back in that thing again. So the club overall, right? Facilities, superb now. We're getting a new stadium next season. Let me take you over to the finances, by the way. This is big. We're now 393 million in profit. And this is where it gets funky, above my head. So let's have a look at this. Transfer value, players bought in 344 million. We've spent, we brought in 1.33 billion, which means we are only approximately 11 million off breaking the target that target have a net transfer profit of one billion pounds is now very much on everything else i think we're pretty much done it is subjective whether we're bigger than porto or not maybe the champions league is the one thing that's going to stop us achieving that goal so next time when we come back we'll go for the club world cup we'll go for the tassie portugal and it will be season 19 now we're at the back end of this video if you're still watching this is the big news. This is season 19 coming up. 
I'm going to cap this save at 20 seasons, which means we've got two more years left. Two more years to achieve the Champions League, perhaps, and two more years to get that net transfer profit to £1 billion. I think the second one's very achievable. But we've got two years left, team. Two years left. Yes, yeah, so here we are in the FIFA Club World Cup, absolutely flying like you've seen, and we're in the quarterfinals against Leipzig. By half time, we were 4 0 up and crushing them. They came back, but what a performance. We got through to the semi finals where we played Internacional from Argentina. But we blew it. A nothing match, really, but. Uh. But on the positives, we played PSG in the third place playoff and absolutely crushed them. Does this board well for this season's Champions League campaign? So I'm quite excited about this season because we played RB Leipzig, who are probably the best team in Germany in this save at the minute, and PSG, and we battered them both with four goals. So hopefully the Champions League goes well. So the strategy for this season. The transfer window is still open. We're only in July, but I'm hopeful that we won't see as much comings and goings because I want a bit more of a settled team now to have a go at the various competitions because there's been too much going. Look at this. So this is last season. Ends up being 351 million out. Season before that, 342 million. So in two seasons, transfers out is nearly, nearly 700 million. We've replaced that with 64 million there, 99. So we've replaced 700 million with about 150 million. There's just too much going on. This season's tactic will be that in the league. And I've got a new version of a 4 3 3, which we'll get to later on. And that's going to be the version that we play in Europe away from home and games where I need a bit more possession. And it's going to be utilising a key role in the game. However, it's happened again. Leo Zeno, our latest superstar, has left the club. He's gone to PSG. Yet another player who was in the last year of his contract. So I had to let him go and get the most money I possibly could. He joins PSG for 61 million. That will rise to about 80 million, I think, with a few appearances. So it's a big, big transfer profit. But oh, he was the linchpin of the team. But he was injured a lot last season, so I know we can deal without him. But to lose that physical presence of 91 kilograms, 6 foot 6, all those attributes, that's uh, that's tough. And the same scenario was with Ana Rodas. He was our inverted fullback, stroke wingback. Again, last year the contract, the Premier League came in. I had to accept a bid of 48 million that will rise to around 60 million for a player in his last year of his contract, bought for 3.2 million. It's pretty good business. There's a clutch of other players that have gone mostly on loan with some big loan fees. We managed to get a big loan fee off Valencia and a big loan fee off Nuremberg, so that's a bit of a bonus, that. As for transfers in, we've only spent 15.5 million. I don't think I'll spend much more. Says Almeida is to provide competition up front with Nassessian. He's a little bit different. He's only 5'8", so he's like a Michael Owen type of player on raw pace and off-the-ball movement. Max Kendis has also came in, 5 million from Hadrug Split, but I have sent him back out on loan, so he's probably one for next season. Both of those boys are 20 years old. The rest of them, young players that will probably loan out for the season, including the likes of Innocent, Madon Seller, back to our old haunt of South Africa. It's been a few years, hasn't it? He's only cost us 400,000, but we've sent him back out on loan to Sundowns. Which brought me to this. This is the current squad average age across all the teams in Europe, and we are top of that because the average age of our squad is just 23. And that brings me to the club infrastructure. You'll now see that we have a new stadium. I'm yet to get a nice picture for it, but that will come hopefully very soon. But the stadium is now 28,663 capacity. And above that, the facilities. Now, we have been on a journey here, but right now we've got exceptional academy coaching at 20 and exceptional youth recruitment at 20. We finally got there. And that leads us to our first hot prospect, homegrown. So I say a hot prospect, he is only 15 years old. This is Nico Bauer. At the minute, he's not exceptional, but the fact he's only 15 and some of his key attributes for a striker are already very good, such as finishing, composure, he's off the ball movement. 
and he's a pacey lad as well with 15 for acceleration and pace. It's the first batch of what we hope is a bit of a factory coming. So the first trophy of the season was the Super Cup against Benfica. We took an early lead into the second half. I can't really emphasise how much we absolutely dominated this match. However, Benfica did level to take it to extra time. And from a corner, they only went and beat us. I mean, look at those match stats. So I was confident there was no need to panic because we were played really well. Now, the first game against Firenze, we gave a debut to Almeida. If you recall, he's the new pacey Mexican striker that we've brought in to provide a bit of a competition up front. There's his second, and he followed in Nasesian's footsteps by scoring a hat-trick on his debut. And in his next match, he capitalised on a mistake and scores again. And as you can see from the match stats in this one, the tactic is working well at creating chances. We followed that up with a big 5-2 away win. And in the most impressive performance yet, newly promoted Vianense got absolutely butchered. I know it doesn't mean much, but that XG is one of the highest that we've done yet. And the amount of shots we're taking, I mean, wow. It could have been 15-0. So that's the formation we've used so far in the league. And he does some serious damage in terms of creating chances. And Benfica couldn't deal with it, despite us losing that Super Cup final. So the signs are good, and that's the team we're going with. We've got a smaller squad this time. I haven't gone too crazy in the transfer window. Transfer window is about to shut. I'd be amazed if we get anybody else in. I'm happy, unless we lose somebody. But all those transfers out in the summer, I think that's another 100 million or so. Yeah, 65 million plus the Leo Zeno deal at the end of last season. Takes the overall transfer value to 1.46 billion. Now, if you add in the fact we've spent 359 million... Ladies and gents, we have done it. We have surpassed it. I am staggered we've managed to do it. But it has took us the best part of 18 plus seasons. That is a weird achievement. That is definitely one I've never done in any version of Football Manager before. I'll get the proper total and what have you for the next episode. Then I can really see how much we've done. Especially after two transfer windows are out the way. But we're going to stick with this tactic for the home matches. Now, I talked about the new 4 3 3. This is the 4 3 3 we're using in European away games. It really is possession heavy. It's lovely. It's called Stinger Quarterback because we use a halfback, but we make him the linchpin of the team with more direct passes, take more risks. And the close down less means he doesn't have to bust the gut to move out of position. He's there to start moves off from this position. We'll see how that goes in the European campaign this season. But the main tactic will, of course, be this. Dalgeros DNA tactic which has started so well. There is the start to league campaign. We've won four out of four. We've scored 16 in those four matches so we're averaging four goals a match. We're not going to keep that up but we'll try our best. Benfica have already lost a match which is always a good sign. Let's see what goes on in season 19. Okay, as you saw, Champions League started really well. But as for the league, another demolition job of Porto. That's ridiculous, that one. So I thought we couldn't get better than that. But then we played Braga away from home and just let rip. 8-1 away from home. It's a landmark performance. The Salgueros DNA tactic is suiting these players down to the ground. However, away from home, this one has been doing the job and you saw a couple of those away results in the Champions League against PSG and Leipzig. So I would like to talk about two key players. The first one is Nasesian. Remember, he replaced João Pedro. Now, this season so far, 23 goals in 21 matches. He's gone better than a goal a match. And he's been assisted by Marcus Paulo, the right winger. Assists-wise, 14 assists in 16 matches. He's going to break a record. This was never more evident than against Arsenal in the Champions League at home. Another great result this season. There's Nasesian. Look at the pace and the power. A 4-1 win in the Champions League against one of the favourites. Since the Super Cup defeat, the season's been electric. We have been fantastic. On New Year's Eve, we sit top of the league, having won 14 out of 15 with one draw. Our first defeat of the season came at home to Tottenham, which hurts a bit considering most of our players play for them now. That was 2-0. First defeat. It was at this point I thought, are my team going to crumble like so often happens in FM because in the Tassidy Portugal, Sporting knocked us out 
and they absolutely stole it. Shameful. But yeah, like I said, the Salgueros DNA tactic has been ridiculous. We have scored so many goals this season in the league and in the Champions League, it's been tempting to use it. And we have done at home, undefeated, other than that Tottenham game. This has also done a good duty though. If we get in front and it's a little bit close, we drop to this and we gain possession back. It's a nice, nice alternative. So everything was going great. And then in January, it was transfer window time. And you know what happens whenever there's a transfer window, transfers out. 232 million. We joked about it, but Tottenham came back in for another player, triggered the release clause of Jose the penalty taker, Mora. He goes to Tottenham for 80 million. We bought him three seasons back for 7.5 million, so it's a big bump up, but it is a big blow because he was having his best season for us. Now, arguably even worse was Alvaro Pexotto, who's gone to Barcelona. They again triggered his release clause. 80 million pounds, that might raise up to 100 million, I think. That was the deal. We bought him for 3.5 million. Off he goes a few seasons later after we did all the hard work developing him. I acted quickly. I had this guy on my shortlist for a good while. Robson Dutra. He's from Brazil. He's from Palmeiras. He cost me about 16 million. He'll replace Pegzotto in that role, but he can also play up front if we need him to. I did bring another centre back in, in Nemanja Dimic, not Nemanja Vidic. This is his younger brother, Nemanja Dimic. He only cost me like 3.5 million. Very much cover because I'm quite happy with the two I've got in there. Nunes has developed fantastically, and Angel's always been there. Now it's his time to be the main starter. A necessity update, by the way, now in February, 20 goals in 19 league matches, 31 overall for the season. After 21 matches, we are still undefeated. We've only drew two matches, and we sit on 59 points. Potentially more exciting, though, is where we finished in the Champions League league phase. We finished second just behind Barcelona on 19 points. So that infamous January transfer window hits again, but I did make a sign-in that I think some of you might have a little smile at. Welcome back to the club, Antonio Capellas. This is his third stint at the club. I brought him in, he's 33 now. He's cost me the mighty sum of 170,000. Obviously, he's very much going to be a squad player. I couldn't resist though. He is in. Let's see what he can do for us. On Capellas' re-debut, he did that and got sent off. And that was one of only two draws this season, so cheers, Antonio. However, he did redeem himself in the League Cup final, banging in the fourth. In the league, we had now gone 35 matches, stretching back to last season, unbeaten. So thanks to our performance in the league section of the Champions League, we went into the draw as one of the seeded teams which is hilarious when you consider that Man City, Liverpool, PSG and Inter are unseeded. And we pulled one of the big guns out, it's Inter, and we don't have a good record against them. They've won the last three times we've played against them. But they are struggling in Serie A at the minute, so maybe it's not the worst draw. And here we are against Inter away from home. I've gone against the grain here and we're playing the DNA tactic in the away leg. This is a risk. A risk worth taking as we completely dominate and get a massive result at the San Siro. In the home leg, I felt the worst when Inter took an early lead. But again, we got to grips with it and started dominating ball. Inter couldn't deal with the pace and movement of the front three or four. Necessian bullied them. An aggregate win of 4-1 against Inter. So things were going pretty well at this point and this is a bit of a crazy thing. If you look up here, the awards this season, we've won Manager of the Month now five times since the start of the season. That is a truckload. It's quite nice, that. The league campaign just continued to be jaw-dropping. 23 wins out of 25, we've already got 71 points. If we look at it in a bit more detail, we've now scored 86 times in the 25 matches, only conceding 14. This has the potential to be our best season ever. Onto the quarterfinals and we draw Villarreal from La Liga. This is a tricky tie. At this stage of the save, Villarreal are probably the best team in La Liga. The top of La Liga as it stands and in our four games against them, we haven't won yet. Okay, are you staying with me? As the season chugs on, we've got that massive game, tricky game against Villarreal coming up. Now in the league, second place for Malaga, one of the teams trying to stop us going invincible. They were up next. Are you ready?
Well, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, you take them, don't you? 9-1 against the team second in the league. And the results throughout the season now were just exceptional. It's a season of our lives. What a pleasure this season's been. They've just clicked. They've just clicked. You can see we're top of the league now. 26 wins out of 28. We've got six games to keep this up and go undefeated in the league. I haven't done that this year. I don't think I did it last year. So that'd be cool. And that 9 one -er also meant we hit 100 goals for the season in just 28 matches. Conceding only 16. Oh. But now it's the biggie. It's Villarreal. The thing is, right, we're away to Villarreal. And as we saw by the record, we don't have a good record against them. So now I'm torn. I'm torn whether to go at them like we do with Inter Milan or if we revert to the basically the tactic I built for the away legs in the Champions League. I probably should do that. But I just think we're playing that well. I'll regret it if we don't try this. So we're going to try this. So the third goal goes in after 43 minutes and I am raging and obviously most of the goals are coming down that left hand side, we're getting abused so I changed the 4-3-3 for the second half. We were the much better team in the second half and that goal there gives us a sliver of a chance. 3-1, damage was done in the first half, if you look at the match momentum, we literally battered them second half, one more goal would have been superb. 3-1, tough, we're not out of it yet but it's tough. I got that one so wrong dudes, I got that one so wrong, I went at them with this tactic and I should have gone with that and trusting my thinking from the start of the season. But we live and learn, we've still got a sliver of a chance. 14 minutes gone, Marcos Paulo down the right hand side, he's gonna be key, whips it across, Melin puts it in, we're back in it. 22 minutes, the boys are absolutely flying, this is the start I wanted, down that right hand side again, here's Marcos Paulo again, and Weisinger puts it in, we're dead level. However, Villarreal attacking down that left hand side again, go back in front. 40 minutes gone, this happens. Savage tackle leads to a red card. So thanks to this moment, we've got the entire second half to get this done and get to the semis. For the record, it's 82 minutes now. I'm absolutely losing hope. So we've got this corner off that shot. De Silva takes. Nunes with a booming header. Back level, come on. You know how it is in FM when a team goes down to 10 men, sometimes you just can't break them down. It's the 90th minute now, Necessian's in. The tie has been turned round. That was unreal. Those are the type of games you love FM for. My God, I did not think we we're going to get through. 82 minutes, 90 minutes, we are through. And we draw Atletico Madrid in the semi-final. The other semi-final is... Liverpool and Barcelona. This is a tough ride, but we're in. Back to the league. If we beat Braga at home, we would be champions again. So that win means we finally top the Portuguese Hall of Fame. I know a few of you said, wait, what's the story with that? And this is the story with it. If you want to look at the Hall of Fame, now we are top with seven domestic division titles, five cups, a total score of 1238. We've just gone above Vitor Pereira, Eddie Howe's randomly up there, and Roger Schmidt. So I'm quite glad we've above Eddie Howe. We're the top performing Englishman in Portuguese history. That was blooming lovely of Vizela to give us a guard of honour and we rewarded them with Robson Dutra getting on the score sheet twice. He's starting to look good. He's only young, but he's going to be good. Next, it was Atletico at home. Now, Simone's not there, but he might as well have been with a five-man defence. But after 20 minutes, we found a way through. A mistaken defence and there's our lethal marksman, Necessian. Things got a little bit complicated after 80 minutes, however. I was pushing for a second goal. But then Nunes literally crippled the man and got sent off so we settled for one nil i'm not sure if that's going to be enough for the second leg now in the league we're still undefeated it's porto away we are not losing this record to porto yes they go one nil up but we get back into it with vidal but then on 90 minutes porto go up field 
I do not believe what I'm seeing. Anyone but them. We'll stop the clocks. It's 92 minutes. My boys are made of sterner stuff. And we are the biggest team in Portugal now. The undefeated record is still there. 2-2 in an epic, but look at the match stats. That should have been over ages ago. So we're covering an awful lot here. We're covering an awful lot, but we are still top. We're undefeated after that draw. We've got 90 points. We've got two games left to go invincible. Now the problem is, do we rest players for the Champions League? But if we do that, we might not get invincible. Oh. Next up, though, is the semi-final second leg away to Atletico Madrid. The big question is this. Do we learn from the Villarreal experience? and lock it up with a 4-3-3? Or do we go at them? Learn, learn. And learn we did. We started off with the 4-3-3. We started really comfortably. Then that happened. Steinland sent off after 28 minutes. 28. So after 70 minutes, it's still 0-0. We are defending like beavers. Here's the formation I'm using. Now we're down to 10 men. But Atletico can't break us down. 90 minutes gone. The only scare was here. Garcia with a save. Boys and girls, we've only gone and made the Champions League final. So we're in the Champions League final, but we've got this invincible thing in the league as well. We disposed of Tondela. It was 1-0, but it's pretty comfy. There's the match stats. Comfy. We've got one game to go. And the game is against Hill Vicente, who are sitting mid-table. So I didn't wait for this one because we're away from home. I decided to rest everyone for the Barca game. No, no, come on now. Hill Vicente beat us 1-0. In the last game of the season to stop us going invincible. I mean, I am low-key raging. If I didn't have that game coming up against Barcelona now... I, I would be raging. I'm still raging. So it's Barcelona up next, and unbelievably, Xavi is still the manager. He has had some stint. What's that, 24, 25 years? Now, obviously, 19 years into the save, there's not going to be any players you recognise in this squad. Other than one. Other than one. Alvaro, our player that we sold them in January for 80 million, looks like we're going to be coming up against him because apparently he's not cup-tied, which is an interesting rule. Hmm. Now, research tells me they will not be playing a 4-3-3 because he plays two formations, and I don't know where these 4-3-3s came from. Manager profile of Xavi shows you what he's going to be playing. It's a 4-2-2 box. 4-4-2 box, if you like. And I think that might play into our hands quite well because our home tactic, if we go that way, is pretty similar to that, but we're going to have a bit of width down that right-hand side. There's our tactic, and we've got the X factor of Marcus Paolo. We're basically sacrificing a strike in Javi's Barca tactic for the width and the explosiveness of Marcus Paolo. So I'm thinking we probably go for this tactic, but we've also got this to go really wide if we need to. Okay. As expected, Barca started with the box system and they did start better than us, to be fair. Early days, I was questioning whether to switch to the 4-3-3 because we could not get hold of the ball at all and they were just pinging it around us in proper Barca fashion. I guess we should have expected it with Xavi still in charge. It led to a few more chances and Garcia was on form. However, half-time was 0-0 and we came back into it, Nassessian going close. Free kick, extra time, Dutra, the youngster deflected and somehow kept out. Boys keep the pressure on, they're keeping the pressure on. That's the centre back down the right hand side, by the way. Here's Tony Almeida, Angel whips it across, Weisinger, what's he doing up there? He hits.
Folks, I do not know what to say. I played this today, right today, in my room here with my assistant manager, Kofi. It's probably the best experience I've had on FM. I think it was a three hour session. It was a big session. And yeah, we've guided Salgiros to the Champions League. What? So there's the Hall of Fame. And do you know what? I thought I'd have a little look at the Hall of Fame for nationality. See if we made it. There we go. Eventually, there we go. And we're second. We're tucked in behind Bob Paisley, just above Brian Clough, of course. Now, I know this was a very match-heavy video. It's not usually my style, but there was a lot going on. But I wanted you to see this. The finances of Salgueros right now is a £573.5 million profit. They are rich. So the Salgueros DNA tactic comes up trumps. We tweaked it as we went, but we used that an awful long way through the save. Went back to it for this season, and it's just smashed this season up, season 19. Necessian ends the season with 42 goals. He's now wanted by Barcelona, ironically. But I think the player of the season was Marcus Paolo on that right wing with 29 assists. He's now the captain as well. Now, as far as the club goes, we are in our brand new Salgueros Stadium. We now have a beautiful photo of it, thanks to JD and Steve. Look at that. That's the Salgueros Stadium. And they are on about actually increasing the capacity now because we are champions of Europe, you know. Above my head, facilities. Superb training facilities. Superb youth facilities. And you can't get any better than our academy coaching and youth recruitment. They are in a good spot now, Salgueros. Next season, I've lined up some good moves for them. I've got a keeper, Galte, coming in who's an 18-year-old Brazilian. I've got Jonathan Ferreira, who's a centre-back coming in from Uruguay. We love our South American area for scouting. And Diego Espino is another Mexican. I mean, look at that for a striker. He's there in case someone does take Necessian away from Salgueros. And I say all that because I wanted to leave Salgueros in the best possible place. Now, I did say there's a 20-season cap, but after season 19, I think you'll all agree, what is there else to achieve? What is there else to achieve? We've won everything now we can. Last year, we just dominated. We got the Champions League. And by the way, for you naysayers, now we've won the Champions League, our worldwide reputation is now four and a half stars. Our friends across the city, Porto, who finished a lovely eighth place, by the way. Club reputation, four stars. Four stars. Salgueros are the biggest team in Porto. So that is the end of the save, folks. I'm going to include the save file if anyone wants to pick it up from now in the Patreon. So if you want to take it on from season 19 and maybe see what the youth development comes through, I'm going to stick that in the Patreon. I might do a retrospective episode so we have a little look back at where we've came to where we are, best 11s, things like that. But this is the right time to finish the save. It's been beautiful, Sargeros. It's been beautiful. Ironically, a lot of the staff which is the best coaching and recruitment team in Portuguese football, a lot of them are out of contract. It feels like fate. So I hope you enjoyed the journey. I am going to put every episode together for one long super episode for people who want to watch it right through. It's going to end up being about seven hours long, I won't lie. But I'm going to do that because this has been my favourite ever football manager save. No doubt it's been fantastic. I've loved every step of the journey. Overall value, by the way, was $1.67 billion. We spent 391 million. So yeah, we smashed it. But that's where we leave Salgueros for Football Manager 2024. All that's left to do is go up to that horrible button up here. And instead of resign, it's going to be retire. Because I'm 61. I think I deserved it.